Good morning. Welcome back. Um, we are having a slight delay waiting for a special guest uh, to deliver an opening address. So just talk amongst yourself for a couple more minutes, and when everybody has arrived, then we'll begin. Okay? Just a couple more minutes. We still have about a year away from, or no, more than that, right? Sort of like, yeah. He's doing it in 2000. Please be seated. So 
for those in person and online, welcome back to the second day of uh, this conference, Ron Williams at Cambridge Celebration. My name is Puy Him Ip, I'm one of the co-organizers of this conference, uh, along with my colleague Joshua Heath and Isidoros Katsos. I'll keep my comments very brief as we're having a delayed start. Just for those who weren't here yesterday, if you have any issues during the day, please get me or Joshua, Isidoros, and we'll try to uh, help. Um, and for, um, uh, uh, if the fire alarm does go off, then we will gather at the forecourt of St. John's College. Just go down uh, where you come up uh, of this building. And that's all the housekeeping I have to do. Um, okay. So this morning, um, we are um, delighted to begin with our address from the pa Patriarch of Constantinople, Bartholomew. Um, he is not going to be with us today. Um, Archbishop Nikitas of Great Britain uh, will be here delivering his address to Rowan. It needs little introduction to say that the encounter with Eastern Orthodoxy uh, is a constant theme in Rowan's life. He has returned again and again since his initial studies of Vladimir Lossky during his um, uh, doctoral studies at Oxford uh, to the figures, sources, and spiritual practice of Orthodoxy. We'll learn more, of course, about this in our two panels today, uh, later on. So it's fitting to begin the day with this address. So without further ado, I'll invite Archbishop Nikitas to come address us. Thank you. Good morning to all. And first, please forgive the tardiness in my being here. Some might say it was because of traffic, Others might say, you have to make an entrance and be noticed. I prefer to say it was because of the traffic. To the honorable organizers, speakers, and participants at the conference, Rowan Williams, a Cambridge celebration. We are joining you today from the Fanar at Europe's farthest east to celebrate the retirement of our beloved brother in Christ, the Right Reverend and Right Honorable Lord Rowan Williams of Oystermouth. We want to congratulate the organizers of this conference for their initiative and all the speakers and participants for their contributions. May God the Father inspire your conversations through the grace of his Logos, the Son, in the fellowship of his Paraclete, the Holy Spirit. As we share this address, the East is looking West in Eucharistic and exological praise of the theologian, the pastor, and the person who has loved Orthodox Christianity as if he were Orthodox himself. And yet, he has always remained a most loyal and humble son of his mother church in the West. In the East, we are blessed to have known Rowan Williams as Archbishop of Canterbury, as a renowned theologian and as a dear friend. As the inheritor of the throne of St. Augustine of Canterbury, Rowan Williams has visited the Apostolic See of St. Andrew multiple times. He has attended the Divine Liturgy at the Venerable Patriarchal Church of St. George, and he has also visited the Theological School of Chalki. It is a sign of great ecumenical importance that the first visit of Rowan Williams to the Fanar was organized during the first year as Archbishop of Canterbury. During this and subsequent visits, we were able to affirm the deep historical bonds between our churches, to exchange views about our shared Christian past, and to renew our mutual commitment to the goal of full unity of Christ's church. Coming from a church whose roots go back to the Christian missions of the days of Constantine, he has repeatedly supported the role of the ecumenical patriarchate, of which we continue to bear witness as the end of the unbroken line of the living martyrs of the new Rome. We are also deeply acquainted with the work of Rowan Williams as a theologian, who has worked and continues to work at the forefront of ecumenical discussions between East and West. Since his doctoral studies, he has meticulously reflected on the Eastern traditions, engaging closely with the thought 
of key Orthodox theologians of the 20th century, such as Vladimir Lossky, Saint Sophronia of Essex, Metropolitan Kagisos of the Oklia, Christos Yanaras, and particularly the late Elder Metropolitan of Pergamon, John Zizilgas, who are our common connection and our most dear friend. As a personal anecdote, we remember Metropolitan John recounting to us the vivid but always good-hearted theological arguments that he had in the exchange with Rowan Williams in some famously long sessions in the International Commission for Anglican Orthodox Theological Dialogue. In return, we are delighted to observe that his theological work over the years is marked by profound respect for the liturgical and theological traditions of orthodoxy. The deep personal connections of friendship that were formed during those years of a theological encounter testify that Christians in the East and the West can and indeed deserve to grow together in love and fellowship. And now to our spiritual companion and cherished friend in Christ. As you celebrate this milestone, please know that you have the prayers and the support of the Church of Constantinople, her hierarchs, clergy, theologians, and all the faithful. May the Lord grant you many more years of health, happiness, and spiritual joy. Therefore, commending you for this special anniversary and wishing you many years of peace, safety, honor, and health unto length of days. We embrace you with a sacred kiss and with much Christian love. Is polaeti ad multos annos, many years, alad noga yaleta. At the Ecumenical Patriarchate, on the 11th of September, 2023, fraternally, fraternally yours in Christ, Bartholomew of Archbishop, Archbishop of Constantinople, New Rome, and Ecumenical Patriarch. These words express the heartfelt love and gratitude of the Eastern Church, especially the Ecumenical Patriarchate, for you not only as a theologian and archbishop, but as a human being, becoming what we are called to be, the fullness of our humanity. And you have embraced us in love, and I hope we can return the love which you so much deserve with the same kindness, the same blessings and grace that you have given us. As a younger hierarch, maybe by a day or two, <laughs> but having joined you on a trip to Ukraine and your visits to the Theater House are indeed a blessing for us. And may you, and may we learn through you how to grow in the unity of faith so that with one mouth and one heart, we may proclaim the one God. Many years filled with happiness, joy, and blessings. Good morning, um, everyone. Your Eminence, thank you for your wonderful address. Um, my name is Father Dragos Sharesko. I'm the principal of the Institute for Orthodox Christian Studies here in Cambridge. Um, it's my great pleasure to chair this um, uh, session this morning, this panel on Orth um, Eastern Orthodox uh, theology. Um, I'll very briefly introduce the, the three uh, speakers this morning, um, uh, simply because the most important part is when they start to talk, um, <clears throat> but um, and some of you may know them very well. Um, nevertheless, um, I'll just start in the order um, that's actually on the program, um, and I'll um, say that um, the first speaker is Father Isidoros Katsos, um, a former PhD uh, student of, of, um, of Rowan's, um, currently um, an associate um, professor of the theological epistemology and ancient philosophy at the Faculty of Theology in Athens. Um, and also um, 
a research fellow and um, at uh, Campion Hall, um, Oxford University. Um, Father Isidoros will uh, um, speak um, on the topic of could there be an Eastern Orthodox philosophy of religion and what might it look like? Um, our second speaker is Father Andrew Louth, um, whom um, everyone knows um, in part at least uh, through his writings or um, uh, personally. Um, he is uh, Professor Emeritus of Patristics and Byzantine Studies at Durham University. He retired some 13 years ago, but he continues to be as active as ever, possibly more active than uh, when he was um, um, a professor there. Um, his, um, I, I learned just this morning that um, his um, next book, um, which is due to come uh, at Oxford University, uh, to come out at Oxford University Press in uh, well next month, I suppose. Well, last month, um, well, the website the website needs updated uh, and updating. Uh, it's um, his selected essays, two volumes. Uh, it contains uh, some 75 articles, edited by Father John Bear and uh, Louis Ayres, and um, save some some money for for it if uh, if you haven't bought it. Excellent. <laughs> And uh, last but not least, um, Aristotle uh, Papanicolaou. Um, he is um, the Archbishop Demetrios Chair in Orthodox Theology and Culture and co-director of the Orthodox Christian Studies Center at Fordham University in the United States. Um, he is, again, very well known, uh, very active in publishing and in, uh, in writing um, and in um, addressing contemporary issues, but also um, issues that pertain to the essence of Orthodox theology. You might know him best, in a sense, or might remember him for his book, The Mystical as a Political, which um, has been translated into three languages by now. Hopefully more will follow. Um, so I look forward to hearing what they um, have to say. Uh, Father Andrew will um, speak on Rowan Williams's engagement with Orthodox theology, Vladimir Lossky and Olivier Clement. And um, Aristotle uh, Papa Nicola will speak on avoiding the avalanche while looking east in winter. Uh, Father Isidoros, I think over to you now. Could there be an orthodox philosophy of religion, an orthodox philosophy of religion? And if so, what might it look like? This is the question that I here want to pursue. But I want to pursue it in an interesting way. In the written longer version of my paper, I discuss ways in which the question of philosophy of religion is trivially posed by orthodox theologians. Thus, in the oral version of my paper, I want <clears throat> to focus only on interesting ways in which the question of an orthodox philosophy of religion might be asked. By interesting, I mean philosophically interesting, that is, fundamental. From the outset, I want to claim that the most fundamental question a religious person could ever ask is the question of identity and its meaning. What does it mean to be Christian? is the most fundamental question a Christian philosopher may ask, and in doing so, let an object and a method of philosophically, philosophical inquiry emerge. What does it mean to be orthodox? Is then the most fundamental question an orthodox philosopher may ask. Implicit in my claim is that all contemporary musics, musings about the differences of terms, such as Christian philosophy, philosophy of religion, or philosophical theology, are philosophically not interesting. It may appear that I define my object and method of inquiry quasi-axiomatically. All, all I can answer to that is just think about it. Having thus defined my object and method of inquiry, I want to begin with a commonly held view about what it might mean to be orthodox. In an insightful paper on natural theology and the Eastern Orthodox tradition, Christopher Knight begins like this, quote, 
The theology of the Orthodox Church is based on a self-consciously conservative stress on the writings of the fathers of the early centuries of the Christian era, especially those of the Greek-speaking East, and on the later Byzantine expansion of this patristic thinking. More recent perspectives do exist, but are accepted only because they are seen as a valid extrapolation from this heritage and thus as part of the authentic living tradition of the church." End quote. On this view, tradition is the key that unlocks the meaning of orthodox identity. Tradition in the sense of a self-conscious conservatism. In what follows, I want to hold on to the first claim, but distance myself from the second. I will namely to argue that a certain engagement with tradition is indeed what it means to be orthodox. At the same time, I want to push back the claim that a conservative approach to tradition is the only possible option for an orthodox Christian. I want to show that neither the conservative interpretation of tradition is philosophically interesting, nor its opposite interpretation, name it as you wish, radical, liberal, or modernist. And I want to substantiate my claim in conversation with the work of a certain Ron Williams. Let me begin with the provocative claim, with two provocative claims. First, a terminological clarification, and secondly, a scientific fact. From the point of view of terminology, I want to put aside various theologically loaded notions of tradition and understand the term in its plain, ordinary sense, as a certain set of, set of past customs and beliefs that are handed down to the present. Now, I want to contest the coherence of the ordinary meaning of tradition because I want to claim there is no such thing as present, at least not in the ordinary sense of the word. There is tradition, indeed, but this involves merely a transition, a handing down, from a more remote past to a less remote past. Present, in the ordinary sense, is an illusion. There might be a present and a tradition that reaches it, but not in the ordinary sense of the words. Yet, precisely this non-ordinary sense of present and tradition is the only philosophically interesting sense of the words, or so I want to argue. I want to explain my paradoxical claim about the illusionary sense of the present by appealing to contemporary science. Einstein's theory of special relativity tells us that light travels with a certain speed. Since we need light to see, and since light travels, we never see anything as it is now, in the moment that we see it. Take the picture of the heaven at night, for example, the universe as we see it with the naked eye. Astronomers tell us that the nearest star lies approximately 4.24 light years away, while the most distant visible star is 3.14 million light years away. That means that everything we see in the night sky belongs to the past. We never see the universe as it is. We see it as it was 4.24 to 3.14 million light years ago, because this is the time that the light of the stars needs in order to reach us on Earth. A star may no longer exist, and yet we may see it still shining during our whole life. The universe as we know it is not the universe as it is now. Our perception of the world at large is a picture of the cosmos as it was in the distant past. The same applies to our perception of the world on Earth, even though the time that light needs to travel from objects to our eyes is so small that it creates the illusion of contemporaneity. Scientifically speaking, however, we only see things as they were in the past. We see the sun as it was eight and one-third minutes ago, the moon, 1.3 seconds ago, 
an object a mile away 5.3 microseconds ago, and so on. Now add to this that sound travels much slower than light. Thus, everything we see, hear, smell, the world of our senses is a world of the past. The light of a star that reaches Earth may belong to the very distant past. Other things, like a handshake or a kiss, belong to the very recent past, as long it takes for the stimulus to be transmitted from the skin to the brain. But the simple fact remains that as biological creatures, we live in the past. There is nothing in the world of the senses that is happening at the moment that it is perceived. There is no present in the physical world. We can only know the physical world as it was in the past. Science thus tells us two things about tradition and the past. First, if tradition is the handing down of beliefs and customs of the past, tradition happens through the mediation, and tradition happens through the mediation of visible and audible signs texts, voices, gestures, works of art. But our perception of all visible and audible signs happens in the past. As a result, tradition only happens in the past. Secondly, if you now ask the question, why engage with tradition? Why study the past? The best scientifically grounded answer we can imagine is this. We study the past simply because there is literally nothing else to study. Why study the past is the title of a book by Ron Williams written about 20 years ago. Ron Williams started working on the meaning of the past while writing a PhD dissertation on the theology of Vladimir Lossky. For Lossky, the patristic tradition acquires a certain normative value but it must not be confined in categories of the past. Rowan Williams was able to flesh out how Lossky tried to move beyond tensions in 19th century Russian reflection on the meaning of tradition. The danger of dwelling too long in the past is not to be able to come back. This seems to be the insight that allowed Lossky to emerge as a creative thinker in his engagement with the patristic tradition. It is perhaps not entirely unfair to say that Ron Williams' early magnus opus on Arius is a sustained reflection on the patristic tradition that shaped Lossky's thought. Ron Williams argues that, quote, Arius was at once a radical and a figurehead of conservatism, end quote, indicating two opposite ways in which one can study the past. Thus, in his next little, but for my purposes, extremely significant book with the telling title, Why Study the Past, these two modes are thoroughly discussed, but also superseded by a third, the only legitimate way in which, according to Ron Williams, it makes sense for a Christian to study the past. The first of Ron Williams' three modes is that of conservatism, which treats the past as it were really the same as the present, the present in a fancy dress, as its author eloquently put it. The problem with conservatism, Ron Williams argues, is its denial for change. The past must be faithfully repeated in the present. What has happened has a normative value, as if it were something self-evidently right and final. There is no acknowledgement that the past has come to be contingently, that it could have been different. The past thus becomes a thoughtless idolatry of both the traditional and the contemporary. The opposite, second mode of engagement with the past is to treat it entirely as an archeological exercise, Ron Williams continues. This is the perspective of radical liber liberalism, which thinks of the past as a foreign environment, as if it had nothing to offer to contemporary debates. It is not just COVID, AI, and the internet that were not known to early Christians. It is also that we do not and cannot know 
what earlier ages thought and felt. On this view, there is an unbridgeable gap between present and past. The third mode of engagement with the past, Ron Williams understands dialectically. On the one hand, we have to acknowledge in Ron Williams' words that we are not our own authors, that we have not just discovered what it is to be human, let alone what it is to be Christian, end quote. That is to say that we owe our identity and understanding of who and what we are to the past. On the other hand, we also need to come to terms with the fact that the past never repeats itself, nor does the life of the church. Christian history, Ron Williams writes, shows how believers have constantly, if not reinvented the church, then at least rediscovered and redefined its essence, end quote. What emerges in the middle of the two dialectical moves is a tertiary quid, namely an awareness of how strange the past is, an awareness, however, which is a wake-up call to the present. Ron Williams writes, a long quotation, if we are free to listen to the strange and recognizable otherness of the past, this may help us in dealing with what is strange to us now, an attitude of mind that is not capable of engaging in recognition with the past of the church is also one that is likely to be closed off from what is different or challenging in the present." End quote. The lesson that we learn, and which Ron William brings out suggestively in his latest book, Looking East in, the Winter, in Winter, is that the only theologically healthy way of looking back at the Christian tradition is as a constant source of inspiration, a continuous ressourcement. Ressourcement here means a repetition of theological beliefs and liturgical customs. But this repetition cannot be identical, since the visible and audible signs of the past can never be repeated meaningfully in exactly the same way. It was the Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard who famously introduced to modern philosophy the concept of non-identical repetition as modern equivalent to ancient Platonic recollection with one key difference, however, the difference of the direction of attention. As Kierkegaard writes, quote, repetition and recollection are the same movement only in the opposite direction. For that which is remembered has been and is repeated backwards, while the real repetition is remembered forwards, end quote. But what is to be remembered in the case of a Christian? What is to be repeated? The answer is given to every Orthodox at the time of their baptism through the words of St. Paul to the Romans. Or, did you, or, did, didn't, or don't you know that all of us who were baptized in Christ Jesus were baptized unto his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life." End quote. What is to be repeated in Kierkegaard's sense is the very passion of Christ, so that we may become Christ-like. We first learn about the passion of Christ looking backwards. Reading the gospel as a biographical narrative, recollecting the life of Jesus as a historical event. But from the moment of our baptism and onwards, we are called to remember the life of Jesus forwards by repeating his example and taking up the cross in our own life. Recollecting the life of Jesus and repeating the life of Christ are two very different things. One may remember everything about Jesus and yet do nothing to make Christ present. Nothing that would allow one to live in Christ. Learning, reading, remembering are modes of recollection. They occur at the level of visible and audible signs, texts, images, songs, sounds, gestures that happened in the past and abide in the past. They constitute the illusion of being present. 
but we will never truly be present, Kierkegaard tells us, until we actually repeat Christ. Repetition is the moment that we exit the past and enter into the realm of the present. Repetition is to become contemporaneous with Christ. In contemporaneity, the present is born and we come for the first time as ourselves into existence. Going back to Rowan Williams, there is a striking silence about Kierkegaard in his works on orthodoxy and tradition. That is, until one reaches the fourth and final chapter of the book, Why Study the Past, where the Danish philosopher figures prominently as the hermeneutical lens through which to read Karl Barth on the one hand, and as the corrective to the eternal quest of traditionalism for a privileged era for being a Christian on the other. There is no such thing as a privileged moment in time, both Ron Williams and Kierkegaard stress, because being contemporary to Christ means to live a life according to Christ, not having lived in the same time as Christ and yet having never really lived. Repetition thus becomes the unspoken but omnipotent key through which Ron Williams unlocks the meaning of tradition. Compare, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards, writes famously Kierkegaard in his diaries, summarizing the, memory, the, the meaning of repetition. To engage with the church's past is to see something of the church's future, writes tellingly Ron Williams. Elsewhere, he adds, for the Christian church, the inherited habits are a way of bringing believers truthfully and effectively into the presence of a specific past, the incarnate reality of Jesus. What the church conserves is seen as important because of this concept of becoming contemporary with Jesus, end quote. Becoming contemporary passes for own Williams <coughs> through inhabited signs of charismatic remembering, namely the Bible and the liturgy, which are generative through repetition of new layers of meaning. He indicates that charismatic remembering simply means non-identical repetition by describing the experience of reading a book for the first time at the age of 18 and returning to it some 20 years later. Quote, we read it perhaps with a sense of never having read it before, and at the same time as being more familiar than we had realized. The early reading has made things possible, including the second reading. The person who first read it is not there any longer and cannot read a second time as if it were the first. But the person reading it the second time is one who has been changed, imperceptibly it may be, by that first reading." End quote. We engage with tradition and we study the past, Ron Williams tells from the outstart to his readers, in order to understand better who we are and the world we are now in. But there is no now outside of repetition. As sensory creatures, we cannot escape living constantly in the past. The present is not of the world of sensory experience. It transcends this world. And yet repetition requires looking back at the past, even if only to ultimately leave the past behind. In order to become aware of who we are now, writes Ron Williams, we must become aware of our hidden debts of the past. But one might here detect a hidden premise, namely that in order to become aware of who we are now, we must first become aware that we now are. And that in order to become aware that we now are, we must first become aware of our hidden debts of the past. To reveal non-identical repetition as the hidden premise of what it means to be orthodox is, I submit, all that an orthodox philosophy of religion could be about and how it should look like. In recollecting the meaning of tradition, in relocating the meaning of tradition from the past to the present, philosophy of religion would also repeat itself as a living theology. 
no Orthodox, I submit and conclude, would be the poorer for that. Thank you. It is a great honor to be here. Um, I'm neither a former colleague nor a former pupil of, of Rowan's. Um, and indeed, we, though we've studied in this, we've been in the same places, not usually at the same time. Um, but Rowan has been a great, very important for my own thinking. Um, and I'm very, I'm very, very honored to be able to make, pay some tribute to him now. I've decided to talk in this context about Rowan's engagement with orthodox theology and, and in particular Vladimir Lossky and Olivier Clément. One of the aspects of, of Rowan Williams' theology that gives it a certain distinctiveness is what it owes to the Eastern Orthodox tradition, or better characterized, the extent to which in his theology we find a profound engagement with some Eastern Orthodox theologians, many Eastern Orthodox theologians. The engagement is extensive and is something he acknowledged and developed in the 20th annual Hellenic lecture at Royal Holloway, which he gave last year in May, which had the title, um, Looking East in Winter, Contemporary Thought in the Eastern Orthodox Tradition. But as far as I can see, the content had no, no contact whatever with the book. It was a lecture which borrows from the, from the title of the book, but as otherwise is quite different. In that lecture, if my memory serves me right, Rowan mentioned and briefly commented on and acknowledged his indebtedness to a roster of Eastern Orthodox theologians, among them Russians such as Swarovski, Bulgakov, Lossky, Evdokimov, Greeks such as Dizulas, Yanaras, and Nicholas Ludovikos, and naturally the Romanian father Dumitru Stanilai. Rowan's engagement with Orthodox theology is long standing and extensive. Reviews of books by Paul Evdokimov appeared by, by Rowan appeared in Sobornost in the early 1970s, but by that time Rowan was working on a thesis of Vladimir Lossky under the supervision of Donald Olchin. Through Olchin, I guess, Rowan came to know Olivia Clément, the other orthodox theologian I've chosen to consider alongside Lossky in this communication. Other orthodox theologians might have seen more obvious but I was given the impression that the Russians have been assigned a separate section in this conference. Nevertheless, nevertheless, though it is Ondosky and Clément, I have managed to slip in some of the Russians. There is nevertheless there's a certain logic in discussing Lossky and Clément when thinking about Rowan's engagement with Orthodox theology. A prolonged period of doctoral research leading to a dissertation must have a formative effect on one's thought. For myself, I have no experience of this, as I never did a PhD, but I'm sure it must be true. And Rowan's study of Lossky must have taken him deeply, not just into Lossky's thought, but into the world which he inhabited, a complicated, a complex world, um, including the, the, the various strands of the Russian diaspora, and also, um, and, and also his intellectual engagement with um, the Latin Middle Ages. In relation to the Russian diaspora, Lossky played, a, how can I put it, played a very clear role in, 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 in supplying evidence for the condemnation of the sophiology of Zegi Bulgakov. But in other ways, Lossky was unusual among the émigrés, in that he found himself more easily at home in the intellectual environment of the West, for he was fascinated by the later Middle Ages, and Meister Eckhart became the subject of his doctoral studies under the supervision of Etienne Gilson, which bore fruit in the posthumous publication of Théologie Négative et Connaissance de Dieu chez Maître Eckhart. 
Virtually all Lossky's works were written in French. Lossky was not writing for his fellow emigres, but for the French intellectual world to which he now belonged. He wanted orthodoxy to speak to the Western environment that he made his own, and this extended to the, pra the practice of the liturgy. The book on Eckhart was edited for publication by Maurice de Gondiac with the help of Olivia Clément. Olivia Clément became, I think, something of a mentor to Rowan Williams while he was working on Lossky. Clément made available to him transcripts of lectures by Lossky, not then published, now available as Theology Orthodox, edited by Clément and his son-in-law, Michel Stavrou, as well as sharing with Rowan his memories of Vladimir Lossky. Clément was a historian, Acquiring, acquiring his aggregation at an, ex at an exceptionally young age and teaching for most of his life in the Lycée Louis, Louis, Louis Le Grand in Paris. His background was laïque, and he came to orthodoxy after some years of searching, drawn by the writings of Bejaev and Lotlowski himself, and he was immensely prolific, 41 books and countless, countless articles, making his work very difficult to summarize. While it's not too difficult to trace some themes from Lossky to Rowan, it is really very hard to do the same with Clément and with Clément or Rowan. And nevertheless, there seems to be to be a real and deep affinity between the two, which is nevertheless difficult to delineate. But I'm not going to try today. Um, this is a 20-minute extract from a yet-to-be-written uh, full hour <laughs> collection. <laughs> And it seemed, and it, I, and I've already spent, I, I've only 20 minutes, I've only spent too, too many of them on what Henry Chadwick used to call throat clearing. So instead of giving two brief and unsatisfactory accounts of Rowan's engagement with both Lossky and Clément, I'm going to the rest of this communication to engage with the relationship between Lossky and Rowan inevitably briefly, but I hope less unsatisfactorily. For my thoughts on Clément, you will have to wait for the expanded published paper, which is yet to be written. In comparing Lossky and Rowan, I also, I also want to take two short pieces, in which Rowan's piece is in some way inspired by Lossky's, and to, explore, and to explore what it is that Rowan is borrowing from Lossky, and how he makes it his own. The two pieces are Lossky's famous essay, Tradition and Traditions and some of Rowan's lectures based on his Lydon lectures given in the Jerusalem Chamber at Westminster Abbey in 1998 and on other occasions, and given in Quebec and published there both in English and in French with the title, A Margin of Silence, Une Marge de Silence. Rowan's taken his title from Lossky's Tradition and Traditions, which first appeared in German in 1952 and then in English in a volume by Leonid Uspensky and Vladimir Lossky called The Meaning of Icons. The English translation from Uspensky's Russian and Lossky's French was made by G. H. Palmer and E. Gad Lubovsky, names that were already then familiar from the English translation of the Russian Philokalier of Dobrot Lubia. The book's importance has been widely recognized and it seems to have received attention early on, outside its natural audience of those interested in icons per se, as Alois Grillmeier made use of it in his little book, Der Logos am Kreuz, published in 1956. So, four years after um, the meaning of icons, and actually five years after his long seminal essay that opened the, the three-volume commemoration of the 150th anniversary of the Council of Chalcedon, out of which grew his massive work, synonymous with his name, known in English as Christ in Christian Tradition. Lossky's essay prefaces the whole work, The Meaning of Icons. It contains, however, scarcely a mention of icons. There is a mention of the Seventh Ecumenical Council on page 23, but there's no mention of what that council decided, though I imagine Vladimir expected, uh, Lossky expected you to know. Um, and on the last page, the next page, page 24, 
there's a brief mention of, of the same veneration received by the scriptures and by icons, and a parallel between dogmas addressed to the intellect, to the intelligence, as intelligible expressions of a reality which surpasses our mode of understanding, and icons which impinge on our consciousness by means of the outer senses, presenting to us the same supersensible world in aesthetic expressions. In both cases, reflecting the kind of language used by 8th and 9th century defenders of the icons. The treatment of tradition and traditions by Lossky runs along familiar lines, save for one point. When he suggests that if we are to seek to distinguish tradition from scripture, we must say that tradition is silence. Quoting from St. Ignatius of Antioch, who says in, the, in his letter to the Ephesians, he who possesses in truth the word of Jesus can hear even its silence, its Ezekiah. And he goes on, this faculty of hearing Jesus' silence echoes the reiterated appeal of Jesus to his, disciples, to his hearers. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And then he goes on to refer to a margin of silence, the title that Rowan took for his lectures. The margin of silence that surrounds the words of revelation which cannot be picked up by the ears of those who are on the outside. And cites in further support words from St. Basil in his De Spiritu Sancto, who says, there is also a form of silence, namely the obscurity used by scripture in order to make it difficult to obtain understanding of the teachings for the profit of the re of readers. Tradition as silence is the unique mode of receiving the truth, and Lossky comments, we can say specific, we say specifically unique mode, not uniform mode, for to tradition in its pure notion, there belongs nothing formal. And why might one might say in this essay, pre prefacing a book on the meaning of icons, so why is this essay prefacing a book on the meaning of icons given that it has so little to say about icons? An immediate answer might be simply that it, tradition needs to be justified since the veneration of icons can hardly be justified from scripture. But I wonder if the reason may not lie deeper. Lossky's essay is followed by two essays by Uspensky, a long one on the meaning and language of icons, and a brief one on iconographical techniques. And the bulk of the book, three quarters of it, is, divided, is devoted to commentaries by one or other of the authors on 61 individual icons or groups of icons, such as the iconostasis. These are valuable essays, particularly for the way in which they illuminate icons from liturgical texts. The icons illustrated are virtually all Russian, and they belong mostly to the, seventh, the, fifth, sorry, the 15th and 16th century. There are a few later ones and a few earlier ones, but the bulk, 17th, 15th, 16th century. The book then could be thought to celebrate a tradition no longer alive. And in the person of Uspensky, celebrates the recovery of the icon tradition. But can a tradition be recovered once it is lost? Lossky does, in a number of places, speak of renewal of tradition, but with little development, and it mostly refers to the renewal that is ent entailed by the reception of tradition. It can't simply be received, it has to, in some sense, to be renewed or relived. But maybe, however, Lossky draws out the idea, the, the, draws out the notion of tradition as silence, a silence one can hear, presumably in prayer, to suggest how one might restore contact with an apparently lost tradition. But this essay is not meant to be on Lossky, it's meant to be on Rowan. Rowan takes the title of his published lectures from Lossky's essay, which encourages us, I think, to read the lectures with the notion of tradition as silence, as perhaps a hidden undercurrent. The subject of the lectures is given in the subtitle, The Holy Spirit in Russian Orthodox theology. In presenting his subject, Rowan comments on the way in which his early engagement with Russian Orthodox thought made him realize that he had never actually been made to think about theology 
of, of the Holy Spirit before. After a brief look at Florensky, he moves on to the Russian theologian on whom he has written most expensively and quite brilliantly, Father Sergei Bulgakov. From Florensky, he takes the idea of relating the spirit to the kingdom and doing this in a way that sees the kingdom of God less in terms of a human endeavor to be fulfilled by establishing the rule of God in church and the world, but rather in a mode closer to what we find in the New Testament, as the kingdom as something imminent, something that is, as it were, completed by the Holy Spirit, but completed not in the sense of being finished off, but rather as a realm in which we find ourselves on the threshold where liberty and creativity come in, come in their fullness in human beings. Expectation of the kingdom is a matter of prayer and asceticism and discipline which is precisely where patristic language of the Holy Spirit begins to take off. And he quotes Ferensky, the spirit is known only negatively outside asceticism and discipline. What Rowan draws attention to in Florensky leads him into a dense discussion of Bulgakov, central to which is, an, well, at the beginning of it rather, but central, um, is an amazingly lucid presentation of the way Bulgakov finds intimations of the Trinity in German idealist thought concerning understanding and human consciousness. It's only about half a page long, and it is, it is, it is unbelievably clear, given the subject. Then, then he moves on, in, on, on to, as it were, more, well, looking backwards, as it were, um, onto, 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 onto themes that we are familiar with from Rome. He moves directly to an exposition of Bulgakov's still controversial idea of kenosis, self-emptying, to characterize the mutual relationships within the Trinity. And here, Rowan notes the place of silence. Do I miss the page? I can't see properly, that's the trouble. Um, Kenosis, self-emptying, or to use Dean Ng's phrase, introduced by Rowan, absolute self-abnegation, to characterize the mutual relationships within the Trinity. And here, Rowan notes the place of silence, which I think is a sort of foreecho of where we're going to get to towards the end of the, of the series. The Spirit silenced witness to the Father and the Son, who are silent before each other, that witness in whose silence the Son and the Father come into speech, into vision, tells us something about the creativity of our own silence. And there is this constant interplay, which is again characteristic of Rowan, between looking, trying to unravel um, doctrinal expressions and seeing them as making sense in our own lives. He develops this in several various ways, using metaphors that suggest mutual engagement, prescinding from speech, the image of interweaving in relation to the different roles of the word and the spirit, interweaving constantly, and, in our, and, and to our relation to the Holy Spirit, present in self-emptying and in patience, in self-forgetting, being, by being there alongside our fallibility, not overcoming it, not taking it over, or ironing, ironing, ironing it out. And he comments on Vulgarkov's aversion to a certain advocacy of humility. Finding life together in that communion is what human, human, Christian humility is all about. This leads into a chapter on Loski and the margin of silence, which seems to sum up in, different, in a different mode what has gone before. There he finds confirmation in Loski for some of Bulkarkov's images of the silence of the spirit, who does not appear to us in a clear personal shape like the father and the son, for the spirit has no face, or rather, as Losky, as Losky puts it, the face of the Holy Spirit is the faces of all the saints, an idea that leads to mention of Emmanuel Levinas. Under the guiding metaphor of, margin, of Losky's margin of silence, Rowan, I suggest, draws together a compelling and in some ways surprising doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your patience.
So Rowan, if there's one thing you're going to take away from this conference, it's going to be that even the Brits are powerless to stop the Greeks from starting on Greek time. <laughs> and it's probably minor payback for the marbles. So if you just gave back the marbles, maybe we'd change our ways a little bit. Um, I want to begin, my, begin by expressing my deep gratitude to Joshua Pui, Father Isidoros, everybody who worked really, really hard on this conference. It's, uh, I think, you know, my only disappointment, really, if I may say so, is it's probably the first time I'm going to leave England without having bread pudding. So uh, next time, maybe have that on the menu at some point. Um, I'm really deeply honored to be here in the company of so many whose works have both nurtured and challenged me, not least, of course, uh, those of our honoree, Rowan Williams. Uh, I've been asked to discuss uh, Rowan's engagement with Greek theologians, uh, such as Christos Yanaraz, Zeulas, Nikos Nisiotis, Panayotos Nelas, and so many others. And I will do so by highlighting broad general themes that I've noticed in Rowan's writings. Uh, but before I do, I, I'm afraid I, I have to use a few of my 20 minutes, and I won't go over 20. I want to share a personal story. I grew up in Chicago. And in the 1990s, there was a very popular mantra. And the mantra was, be like Mike. And of course, the mantra was referring to the great basketball player, Michael Jordan. As I was progressing through my own academic career, I had a different aspiration, being the nerd that I was, the theological nerd that I was. I wanted to be like Rowan. And this was especially the case after I found his essay, Eastern Orthodox Theology, in the volume of collected essays entitled The Modern Theologians, which is edited by David F. Ford. In addition to what I learned from the content of the essay, which always happens whenever I read anything by Rowan, I must explain why finding this essay was so important to me at this point in my career. Now, I discovered this essay when I was in the midst of my doctoral studies, where I was forced to learn from none other than Brian Gerrish the theologies of such eminent thinkers as Friedrich Schleiermacher, Ferdinand Christian Bauer, David Fred Friedrich Strauss, Eloise Emanuel Biedermann, Albrecht Ritschel, and of course, last but not least, Adolf von Harnack. And like the good, aspiring, orthodox theologian that I was at the time, I, of course, never heard of any of them at any time. <laughs> the exception probably is David, who's not here, because David, of course, knows everything. And like any industrious graduate student would do when faced with the work of thinkers that he or she is encountering for the first time, I scrambled for secondary sources to make heads or tails of what I was reading in the primary sources. And all I have to say is thank God for Claude Welsh or I might not be here today. So please do not misunderstand, I am very, very grateful for this experience because I knew that to survive in the Western theological scene at the time, I needed to be familiar with this trajectory of thought. I was especially drawn to Schleiermacher whose notions of God consciousness and feeling of absolute dependence, I believe, had theotic overtones. All the more reason I was deflated to read in his magisterial Christian faith the following. Yet precisely on account of this purely negative character of the Eastern Church with respect to doctrine, here too there is all the less to be said about that church, as it is also not possible to determine whether it will have the strength as it takes more steps to resume an interconnection with the world's intellectual conversation to call forth and give shape to a contrast within itself analogous to the Western Church. The quote was actually a bit longer, but because of time I have to cut it. I would have expected such pessimism from Harnack with his simplistic understanding of theosis as the infiltration of pagan thought into the core of the Christian gospel, but I must admit it was somewhat disheartening to reach Schleiermacher's pessimistic assessment when most of the Orthodox world was under the Ottoman oppression at the time when he wrote Christian faith. I guess no one could blame him for not being able to anticipate the surge of intellectual activity in Russia that was soon to follow his death. Now I mention all this because it's difficult to overstate the importance it was for me to discover a well-established theologian writing about and taking Orthodox theology seriously. I must admit though, Rowan, that after I read the essay I thought, there has to be more to it than this. And of course, I soon discovered that you also knew there was more to it, since as everyone knows, you wrote your dissertation on Vladimir Lasky with a part two that outlined the ethos of Russian philosophical and theological thought, being very much ahead of your time in recognizing the singular importance of Sergius Bulgakov. I remember calling from a landline, the Bodleian, 
getting that distinctive British ring over, uh, uh, ring over the phone, thinking that this is never going to work, I'm never going to get this dissertation, sending my unregistered letter with the check, and uh, you could not really imagine my excitement when the green-covered thesis arrived at my door. I was going to bring it, but I didn't have enough room in my luggage. I think most of the students are thinking, why didn't they just send you a PDF? <laughs> or what is a landline? <laughs> Those were the days. I mention all this, Rowan, because you need to know that you gave not just me, but a whole generation of Orthodox theologians the confidence to take their traditions seriously, to believe, unlike Schleiermacher, that it had something to offer to the wider intellectual conversation, and not just the patristic tradition, but the contemporary orthodox theologians who, re who were really only regaining their intellectual footing after the Ottoman and the communists. Your work on Lasky confirmed my insight that there was more secondary source work to be done on orthodox theologians. And after my first encounter with your work, I of course continued to read more of Rowan Williams, but I cannot claim to have read your entire corpus. In terms of orthodox theology, you often reference theologians who are not well known and Father uh, Andrew covered many of them, Bogakov, Lasky, Yanaraz, Zizioulas, Clement, Nisiotis, Nella, Sevdokimov, Afanasia, Florovsky, Father Sofroni, Saint Mother Maria Skopsova, and Elizabeth Bershegel, just to name a few. And it is clear that Theosis, which hasn't really been mentioned yet in this conference, it is clear that Theosis is at the heart of your theological project. And what has impressed me the most is the way in which your own approach, the approach to theology merges form with content. You evince a theological, I'm sorry, let me back up. You evince a theotic method, especially in your hermeneutics of generosity, which so much reminds me of my own mentors, David Tracy and Bernard McGinn, who very, very highly esteemed your work. And we're, very, we're much more Chalcedonian, I think, than given credit for. You don't shy away from critique, but it is always couched in generous retrieval, which frames the critique as an honest openness for reception of truth. I have been a recipient of that critically appreciative generosity, and I'm great, grateful to you for it. So as you know, of course, theosis is a hot topic again, but there are so many who seem to interpret theosis as a zero-sum game. You have never followed that route, and as a result, I believe your work points to the hope that theosis could provide a common theological perspective, a theotic imagination, within which our theological disagreements could be understood rather than a weapon for dividing and conquering. And of course, it was the, it was many of the Greek theologians, among others, who did weaponize theosis in the form of a virulent anti-Westernism that quite interestingly mirrors the critique against modernity that has re recently appeared in broader theological circles, but also in the non-theological arena of critical theorists. All these critiques are quite interesting in the sense that they all blame Christianity in one way or the other. The Greek theologians blame all of Western Christianity, the Western theological critique of modernity blames the nominalist trajectory, and the critical theorists, well, they just blame Christianity, with all of them seeming to offer different solutions. And yet, in your critically appreciative manner, you called out the Greek theologians on their simplistic diametrical opposition between Orthodox and Western forms of Christianity as early as your 1972 review of Yanaras's Person in Eros where you say that the charge of Hellenic Slavophilism against Yanaras is fair. Now, much could be said about Orthodox anti-Westernism, but in the Greek theologians, and particularly, especially John Romanides, Christos Yanaras, and to a certain extent, John Zizoulas, it all went wrong with Augustine. This critique gained steam like a runaway train, accusing Augustine of denying the divine energies, rejecting theosis, affirming only created grace, and unlike the Cappadocians, doing Trinitarian theology from the one essence of God. Throughout all of your work, you gently pushed back against these caricatures, especially in your article, Sapientia and the Trinity, Reflection on the De Trinitate, which is the best thing I've ever read on Augustine's De Trinitate. No offense, Lewis. And where Zizulus is quoted in the first uh, few footnotes. Here you show that the relational dimension of Augustine's trinity as well as how Augustine never abandoned the inherent link between theosis and trinity. It's as if you are pleading with the orthodox theologians to realize that they need not play this zero-sum anti-Westernism game to highlight the riches that are on offer by both the patristic tradition and the creatively imaginative constructive theology of the contemporary orthodox theologians. 
As always, you avoid generalizations and offer a model of generous and constructive nuance or a creative theological rendering of a theotic understanding of God, of the God-world relation in the hope of offering a theological vision that resonates across boundaries. Now, I'm hoping that you will agree with me, Rowan, that the two aspects of orthodox theology in Greece over the past 60 years that are evident in your own work are the theologies of personhood and Eucharistic ecclesiology. Of course, you noticed as far back as 1972 that Yanaras's understanding of personhood, its Heideggerian overtones notwithstanding, could be traced back to Lossky. And of course, we now know that the identification of person with freedom and irreducibility and nature with necessity actually has its roots in Bogakov. And as much as Lossky wanted to proclaim the patristic roots of his theological project, we now know that his, his was a very constructive, apophaticized use of Bogakovian themes. Insofar as the Greek translation of Lossky's The Mystical Theology of the, Eastern, of the Orthodox Church influenced directly Yanadas, he once said to me that, Yanadas did actually once said to me once in person that he started with Lossky, and indirectly Zizulus, Zizulus never admitted such an influence, since his own relation, relational understanding of personhood was inspired by Yanadas. One could argue that all of contemporary Orthodox theology is a footnote to Bogakov. And of course, Bogakov's wrestling with the freedom, necessity, and tinnomy is in response to the thought of the German idealist, which he thought simply to be an incorrect appropriation of a distinction with patristic roots. So the importance of the category of hypostasis or person and its irreducibility to nature is evident in your books, Looking East in Winter, Faith in Public Square, Christ the Heart of Creation, and Being Human. In the latter book, you reference Lossky and not the Greeks, but anyone who knows your work knows full well that in summoning the orthodox notion of person, you have in mind the broader orthodox theological discussion. As you wrote in your review of Zizulus's being as communion, quote, Zizulus is indebted, especially to Afanasiev, Lossky, and Yanaras, among 20th century orthodox writers, but manages to use them critically and to weave together in a new way their diverse philosophical and dogmatic insights, end quote. Many other passages stand out throughout your corpus, and I'll just mention a few. In Being Human, you reference Lossky's understanding of person as, quote, irreducibility, irreducibility to nature, which, of course, both Yanaras and Zizulus take up and cast in a more relational mode. In the same book, you write, quote, a person, in other words, is the point at which relationships intersect, where a difference may be made and new relations created, end quote. In Looking East, you reference Yanaras when you write, quote, each person is unique because position in the network of relating is unique, end quote. And what I found especially gratifying was how you buck the trend of denouncing the notion of human rights, but instead in your critically appreciative way, recast it theologically in being human when you argue, quote, when we claim our human rights, we're not just asserting that somewhere in us there is something making imperative demands. We're trying to affirm that we are embedded in relationship. I am and I have value because I am seen by and engaged with love, ideally the love we experience humanly and socially, but beyond and behind this, always and unconditionally, the love of God. And the service of others' rights or dignity is in this perspective simply the, the search to echo this permanent attitude of love, attention, respect, which the creator gives to what is made, end quote. One last comment on this orthodox theological notion of personhood, which we can discuss more fully if we have time during the Q&A. As most know, after Zizulus published Being as Communion, his casting of personhood in a relational mode was ecumenically impactful. It also received a barrage of criticism, mostly from patristic scholars, beginning with Andre de Halu. In your 1986 review of, this, of, of Zizulus's book, you rightly call out Zizulus and what you phrase historical weaknesses. But again, in a critically appreciative vein, this didn't stop you from asserting that the book, quote, illuminates, connects, and challenges. If it is at times overbold and schematic in its reading of patristic tradition, this ultimately matters less than its powerful imaginative consistency, its ability to show that the kind of church we commit ourselves to tell us more than we might suppose about the kind of God we believe in and the kind of spiritual universe we inhabit. This is a sobering warning to the managerial pragmatism that can so easily dominate ecclesiology these days." End quote. 
Now, I want to use my remaining few minutes to highlight what I would call Rowan's ascetical corrective to the Greek theologians, or at least Janodas and Tisizoulos' overemphasis on the Eucharist as an eschatological event. Now, of course, it's not that Rowan denies this claim, but he, as always, gently pushes back against Janodas' and Zizioulis' anxiety over the ascetical and its potential to veer into the individualistic. In this ascetical corrective, we not only see Rowan's Loskian roots still at play, but also, but, but also his drawing on the philokalic tradition and its importance in other Greek theologians, especially Panayotis Nellas. There is, of course, a reason why the first chapter in Looking East is on the philokalic tradition. This ascetical corrective is especially evident in chapter 11 of Looking East, a chapter on eschatology, but which was first given as an address in honor of, Saint, of John Zizioulis at Westcott House in, in June 2014. You write, it is, do, it is to do with the saint's work of presenting the coincidence of Trinitarian life, life in communion, and with this specific human location, so that this life becomes something offered to and made possible for other human beings. And those who have said of the monastic life that has an eschatological character have understood this point." End quote. So, Rather than liturgy or asceticism, the impression given by Zizulis, you affirm contemplation and liturgy. Elsewhere, you speak of a liturgical anthropology, a liturgical humanism, of Eucharistic beings. I read you as attempting to reassure Yanadas and Zizulis that the ascetical is not a threat to the personal, but in fact is the way toward living into the personal. I think your point is best summed up when you say in Looking East, quote, the profound theological affirmation of the uniqueness and dignity of the person, so characteristic of many orthodox theologies, is given by Father Sofroni, a further critical edge by being linked with the conviction that a theologically significant personal distinctness or uniqueness is the fruit of ascetical practice rather than some sort of given. It is arrived at when and only when our uniqueness, our singularity as irreducibly distinct images of God is understood as radical receptivity, as something that can transform our occupation of a unique place in the complex of created interaction into a single unrepeatable site for God's relational making liberty to occur." End quote. In recent writing, you amplify this personal and relational understanding of the ascetical by discussing the importance of contemplation, an epistemology of radical receptivity that images God's eternal act of knowing that attunes the soul to God's creation rather than attempts to control it, and that ultimately is realized as adopted children of God in Christ. You hint at a political theology when you call for, quote, contemplative political pedia and a contemplative political practice, which, quote, might be summed up as one that seeks to make room for the narrative of the other, one that does not begin by attempting to absorb this narrative into itself, and thus, uh, and thus is willing to learn how it is itself seen and understood. For me, it was gratifying to see this emphasis on the importance of the ascetical for politics, emphasizing the role of the Christian in creating a liturgical culture, which of course has rings of Shmemen. So my reflection has been more appreciative than critical, and if I were to raise a minor critical point, uh, it's, it's when I read your review of Being as Communion, I reread it, uh, how you mentioned that Wittgenstein might help Zizulis articulate his ecclesiology. And I can imagine Zizulis, Zizulis cringing a little bit after reading that. My only other thought has to do with what I see as an under, uh, underemphasized, uh, as, 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 as something that is underemphasized in your own work. Your emphasis on the contemplative also speaks to the active life, and you rightly point to us, you rightly point us to Saint Mother Maria Skopsova. But as you know, the active life received a great deal of attention from Saint Maximus the Confessor, and the active life, the, neither the active life nor the contemplative life could be understood without making sense of the affective terrain. What's fascinating in Maximus is the interrelation between Eros and Agape. Wrong eros leads to the lack of agape, since it enables fear, anger, and hatred. And right eros enables agape, which reinforces and enables eros for the divine, on which contemplation as wisdom depends. So very far from seeing agape as having nothing to do with eros, 
And I think you would agree that Maximus would have found Anders Nugren incomprehensible. Maximus sees Eros, Agape, and Sophia mutually implicated. Now, I know that you know all this, and these comments are somewhat of an extension of, of, of Sarah's point, but it, it did catch me a little bit by surprise yesterday when you, when you uh, admitted that somehow you have a hard time delinking arrows from lack. I, I'm not 100% sure what the problem is with the notion of an eros as wanting to always want God. And especially in, in Maximus where union with God, cognition tends to kind of drop off and all that's left is, something has to be left and all that's left is arrows. And of course Maximus, you know all this, I'm just, I'm just uh, sort of reminding you of it so just to, to see what you might have to say. Um, Maximus of course uh, would, thinks about union uh, or eros that is as that which is both satisfied and infinitely longing. So anyway, I'm just, hoping to see a little bit more of that as you amplify your own reflections on contemplation, it would allow you to re-engage the wonderful insights of Yanaras on the importance of Eros written more than 50 years ago. So Rowan, when you looked east in winter, you avoided the avalanche. The avalanche of anti-Westernism, mutual exclusivities, generalities, caricatures, and misrepresentations. Avalanches can blind and suffocate. But if you manage to dig out of them, you can once again see the beautifully renewed landscape caused by the avalanche. You have given orthodox theologians and the tradition the tools on how to dig out of their own avalanche and, and enjoy the beauty of its own tradition without defense and without reaction. And especially in relationship to a wider horizon, but even just as important, you have shown the wider Christian theological world the cost of ignoring the riches of the Eastern tradition. Thank you. Thank you very much to um, um, all of our speakers for um, such rich and wide-ranging um, presentations. Um, we have about, well, less than 10 minutes. Um, I was instructed that we cannot delay coffee for too long. Uh, so we're going to go five minutes over the um, advertised time. Um, so I think Rowan has the first uh, go. Thank you. I shall try to be brief. Um, but may I, first of all, Your Eminence, uh, thank you from my heart for being here this morning. It's meant a great deal. And to have His Old Holiness's message has been deeply moving for me. I hope you can convey to the Patriarch my gratitude. And I'm sure the gratitude of all here for his immensely generous words. Thank you. All kinds of things come to mind in listening to these wonderful presentations. I just begin with two little um, snippets of thought provoked and one theme to uh, draw just briefly. One is that I, Telly, picking up your kind of remarks about what I said about Augustine and deification. When I was doing my research, I can vividly remember coming across a passage in Aquinas. Um, which seemed to me to be deeply significant in dismantling a crude Eastern-Western polarity. And it's a passage where Aquinas, rather unusually, um, with a flair of metaphor, says, just as only fire can kindle, only God can deify. And I remember thinking anyone who can write that is not actually the caricature <laughs> that some of my Eastern friends seemed to believe was uh, the case. And the other is on the relationship of Zizoulis and Losky. Um, His Old Holiness's message earlier this morning uh, recalled those happy and energetic times when um, Metropolitan John of Pergamum and myself were together on the Anglican Orthodox Commission and the memorable morning when the rest of the Commission left us to it for a couple of hours. <laughs> and somebody was sent across to the Patriarchal Library in Bucharest to provide us with copies of Maximus the Confessor to argue about while everyone else was having a coffee break. Um, but I remember writing a paper for that meeting, which was precisely on, on the subject of Losky's Trinitarian theology and presenting it to Metropolitan John for, for comment and saying, you know, exactly where are we parting company 
or you part in company with Vlosky. So the, you know, the conversation was something around in the margins there. Um, a theme coming through. Isidros, in your brilliant paper, you wonderfully brought out the way in which tradition is not something we receive as an object, but something we receive as an invitation. If it comes from the past in the way you describe, what it is and what it does is to generate an act on our part, which in turn becomes part of what then further generates. And it seemed to me that that was very much in tune with um, what Andrew, you were saying about Losky's account of tradition also, that tradition appears as a charismatic memory because like all charismatic events, it provokes transfigured response. And I think there's, there's a theme to be sort of teased out there, which is in common. I also wondered um, how some of what um, Losky has to say about silence in that tradition essay might um, converge with some of what Father Simon was saying yesterday about silence and about silence not being that mysterious extra to speech which deals with the stuff we can't actually talk about, unfortunately, but becomes part of an integral rhythm of speaking and falling silent, which um, allows us to receive revelation in its, in its fullness rather than simply as a, a completed and sealed object which we can then put in our pockets. Um, and one last response, and there's so much I'd love to discuss here, one last response here is, Andrew, you um, wondered where my indebtedness to Olivier Clément might lie in more than just the personal sense. I think probably the, um, the chapter on liturgical humanism in Looking East in Winter expresses that most clearly, but I think what I got from Clément as I read him in the 70s, um, his autobiography and the remarkable little book, Question sur l'homme, and Transfigurer le temps, uh, was something of a further crystallization of Losky's anthropology, rather more explicitly in dialogue with some of the intellectual environment at that time in, in Paris. I can remember, um, I think it was Olivier who noted that Albert Camus had said after reading Losky's mystical theology, now there's a, an encounter, Camus and Losky, that after reading Losky's mystical theology, if he ever took Christianity seriously, that would be the Christianity he would take seriously. And Clément draws that out in a way which I think tells you something about Clément as well as something about Losky. Um, and that anthropological focus is actually part of the subtext, I think, of Losky's essay on tradition because I'd simply add, Andrew, to what you said about that brilliant and remarkable essay, that for me it, it was of a piece with Losky's own reflections on the relational character of a person. He gives a relational account of tradition, in effect, resting upon a relational anthropology. And that's, that's part of what holds together so many of Losky's shorter pieces, and what certainly, as I read him at the time, um, I found inspirational. But there we are, lots more I could say, but thank you so much, all of you. So um, I think we might have time for one or two questions or remarks. There's, um, there's a hand raised here at the front. Thank you, fathers, and thank you, Telly, for um, those papers, which are really stimulating. Um, I think I want to ask a question around, uh, which focuses on uh, the, the title of Owen's book, Why Study the Past, but also invoking people like E.H. Carr. Um, if the past is kind of all, all we have in a sense, and, and the present is not something that we can necessarily inhabit in the way in which we might imagine, um, is there an assumption that when, when you and I as Christians look east, that we are looking at the same thing? And do we perhaps need to tr trouble what we think of as the past um, and how we relate to it? And as theologians and as people who are engaging in history, um, do we need to ask broader questions about who's past and what the past looks like? Yes, I, I didn't work on the looking piece. Um, <laughs> my PhD dissertation with Ron Williams has perhaps a few things to say about 
the nature of looking. <coughs> um, yes, but um, what, what struck me reading the book Why Study the Past of Ron Williams was that it was an almost philosophical argument, but he didn't give me the philosophy of the argument. So everything was descriptive. Mm. And I missed the philosophy, the depth, the philosophic, you know, how does this become normative? Why should it, why ought it be this way? Is there something that grounds the argument of the book? So not conservatism, not liberalism, but uh, a way of engaging with the past that is constantly reviving us. And of course, one can say, um, or one can extend the same question to what's happening in Paris, uh, early 20th century, Florovsky, Lossky. One can say the same thing about theosis, about the person, about anything. I mean, why ought theosis or the person be normative? What is the value? I mean, clearly the Easterners want to cling on it, but does it have any intrinsic value by itself? Why couldn't one be a perfect Christian without theosis and without personhood? Aren't there other versions of Christianity? What is it that makes, so the wrong reason, the wrong way of phrasing this question is, what is so particular about the church fathers? What is so particular about Lossky? What is so particular about these Eulers? This is the wrong way, philosophically uninteresting way of putting the question. The interesting way is, what is so special that Lossky or Florovsky or the church fathers saw and wanted to talk about it in this way or that way, the, the language of theosis, the language of personhood or whatever? And that was what I was trying to, to, to think about. Uh, how to engage with, the, so ressourcement, I mean, we all talk about ressourcement, but it's a descriptive thing. Some people did it, and it's interesting. Why is it interesting? So a distinction that is, is I think, very important in modern contemporary philosophy between history as historiography, reading about the past, and having knowledge, acquire knowledge about the past, but as, as Kant was not favorite here, but I think everyone repeats after Kant, Kierkegaard, uh, Heidegger, everyone. Uh, you change one premise from the system of Thomas Aquinas, Cappadocians, or Plato, and the whole system collapses. What do you do after that? It's not philosophy, that's history. The same thing about theology. You change one premise from, from scripture, and the whole, the whole theology collapses. You change one premise from the, the, from the creed, and the whole theology collapses. Are we left without theology? What is the true source of theology? Where and when and how does theology happen? So I wanted to claim that the, uh, the insight behind the Western philosophical tradition is that the present is a, conve a, a convention with which we are brought up living, but unless we start really thinking about what it means to be present, we never really experience an awareness of the present. And the moment we do that, that's the moment of religious awakening, and that's the moment we start theologizing, the moment of a true encounter with Christ and God. And before that, or outside of that, we can say many things about God and Christ, but it will not, but it will be about something, you know, something historical, something that's descriptive. It's, it's not going to be present, in a way. So presence and tradition is, and I wanted to claim that presence is not of the same order as the way we do things every day. And therefore, theology, true theology of philosophy, and I understand theology as a repetition of philosophy in that sense, uh, cannot be of the ordinary sense of things. And I think that's, that's what actually is happening with Rowan. So the more I engage with his work, and I say, why, why is Kierkegaard not there? But he is doing it. And the more I engage with Rowan, and, and that's helped me see perhaps a vein there in Florovsky and Lossky as well. Okay. Thank you. Any other um, question? And you can always ask them your questions over coffee yeah. as well. It doesn't have to be here. <laughs> that's, not, that's not a suggestion in the sense of a... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> something you might want to think about. <laughs> um, thank you. So then let's um, give everyone another round of applause and uh, with our thanks, thank you very much.
Okay, everyone, if I can uh, bring our proceedings to a beginning. Uh, we're running a little bit, a little bit late, so uh, uh, if we, can, we can begin. So welcome to our panel on Rome Williams' work on theology, arts, and imagination. Simply giving a conspectus of Rome's engagements with poetry, prose fiction, drama, painting, and music would occupy most of the time all allotted for our panel. Um, as these are engagements that run throughout his work, um, but are treated most extensively in his monograph on Dostoevsky, about which we'll hear more uh, in our Russian panel, I suspect, uh, and his Trinity College Clark lectures, Grace and Necessity, which explored the analogies and indeed greater disanalogies between patterns of divine and human creativity. Here, the imaginative arts are tokens of the sacred both resisting reductive and functionalist understandings present in our contemporary intellectual culture, and also illuminating points at which divine creative and recreative grace becomes more readily transparent to us, a theme taken up in yet more depth uh, in the edge of words. More recently, of course, the tragic imagination explored the creative labor of dramatic tragedy as itself a token of the sacred, confronting suffering without being, as Rome puts it, immobilized by it. And of course, Rowan frequently turns to interpretation of literary and imaginative works in his theological writing more broadly, with themes of a given essay uh, often culminating in an illuminating reading of, for example, Iris Murdoch or Shakespeare. And in each of these engagements, the particularity of the art is integral, not serving as a mere embellishment to a greater purely conceptual truth, but as itself an irreducible mode of theological work. And we had, I think, a beautiful illustration of this yesterday in uh, Catherine Pickstock's reading of Rowan's own poetic work, an ekphrastic evocation uh, of the artistic domestic assemblage at Kettle's Yard that compresses and expresses a lifetime's engagement uh, with metaphysics. And so to our panel. Um, our first speaker today uh, is Lucy Gardner, who is tutor in Christian doctrine at St. Stephen's House in Oxford. She has published widely on feminist theology, metaphysics, and on Hans Urs von Balthasar, co-editing with David Moss, Ben Quash, and Graham Ward, the landmark volume, Balthasar at the End of Modernity. Her paper is entitled, Seeing the Word, Balthasar and the Theological Imagination. Our second speaker is Douglas Headley, who is the professor of the philosophy of religion here in Cambridge, where he has taught since uh, 1995. He's the author of a number of books and articles that touch uh, directly on our theme this morning, perhaps most notably uh, a trilogy on the religious imagination, beginning with Living Forms of the Imagination, uh, then Sacrifice Imagined, Violence, Atonement, and the Sacred, uh, and finally, The Iconic Imagination. Uh, and our third and final speaker this morning is Ben Quash who is Professor of Christianity and the Arts at King's College London, where he is also Director of the Visual Commentary on Scripture. Uh, he is the author of Theology and the Drama of History, engaging um, principally and significantly with uh, Balthazar, uh, and more recently, Found Theology, History, Imagination, and the Holy Spirit. And his paper is entitled, Sapiential Imagination, the Arts and the Expansion of Grace. So, you see. So first, I should add my thanks to the conference organizers and for the invitation to be here for all the hard work that's gone into making this such a celebration, such a joyful celebration of Rowan's work thus far. 
I feel extremely honoured and humbled to be in such exalted scholarly company. Thank you also for your over-generous introduction. Almost exactly 25 years ago, Rowan, you were generous enough to encourage those authors of Balthazar at the End of Modernity, that Hans Urs von Balthazar, and particularly his attempt to think difference differently was too important to be left to the Catholic institutions. <laughs> and that his work needed to be considered in a range of difficult debates about the character of human difference. This presentation then seeks to make a very small contribution to such debates by offering some brief reflections, far too brief, on Balthazar's very theological conception of the human imagination, a theme which seems to me to have been extremely important for so much of what we have already heard in the rich papers thus far. Balthazar's account of our appreciation of the beautiful and beyond that our capacity to sense and wonder at glory and holiness is well known and can be linked to a revived interest in theological aesthetics in recent years. His understanding of the human imagination itself was also vital to the vision and impact of the resourcement movement and particularly its encouragement of a confident deployment of the imagination in theological discourse, ranging from appreciation of the narrative drama of biblical texts as a basis for engaged and faithful preaching, to careful attention to the, own, to the Father's own creativity and audacity in patristic scholarship, to creative presentations of carefully argued accounts of doctrine and of God's engagement with the world in a fast-changing contemporary context, and audacious attempts to articulate a philosophical theology which engages with and critiques the forms and habits of thought to be found in a vast range of classical and contemporary literature, philosophy, and culture. Your own work, Father, shows careful consideration of Balthazar as a significant figure to be acknowledged in the tradition. But like that of many at this conference, it also bears the marks of a sustained and thoughtful response to Balthazar's work as a towering and challenging inspiration for those engaged in the tasks of theological exploration, theological education, and ecclesial ministry. My purpose here is not to rattle off a hasty sketch of Balthazar's rich account of the human imagination and its place in human maturity, in faithful Christian life, and in fruitful theology. Nor do I intend to present potential extracts from a comprehensive critique of Balthazar's resourceful deployment of his own undoubtedly forceful, expansive, and idiosyncratic imaginative power in his own life and theology. Rather, I aim to outline in very simple terms just a few aspects of my own grasp of Balthazar's very theological appreciation of the human imagination as part of his different perception of difference, and to articulate some of their connections to a few practical ecclesial questions which emerge from my own engagement with his work in the context of theological education and priestly formation. Here I shall cover just three headings, imagination and understanding, imagination and faith, imagination and worship. The planned, not written, longer paper will address others and particularly the place of imagination and speculation in theology itself. These, however, I think need to be discussed first. First then, imagination and human understanding and education. In Balthazar's powerful and impressive presentation of the human experience of revelation as coming to see the form that lies at the heart of the world, the human imagination has an important part to play on account of its contribution to our capacity to recognize receive and respond to beauty. It is, however, also fundamental to his understanding of our abilities to be lit up by the truth and to decide for the good 
which means it has a far-reaching role in all human understanding. For Balthazar and many of the writers he draws upon, our imagination is not an optional extra luxury in human existence, but an unavoidable and indispensable part of our mental life, essential to our coming to see or understand anything at all. For him, then, human imagination is not mere fancy or worse, sheer lies, but something that is necessary for us to arrive at any sense of meaning in the world. Any realization, however clouded, that the things of this world are disclosive not only of themselves, but also of meaning and form. For him, imagination then is deeply bound up in our perception of the world around us and in our reception, our imagining of its meanings. In order to understand the world, we have to build, retain and connect mental images of it. But before we can build those images for ourselves, the things of this world, the realities of existence, must present themselves to us as and in images, which make impressions upon us, upon our imaginations. Before our imaginations are creative and productive, that is, they are receptive and impressionable. Before I can begin to understand something, that something must present itself to me as something to be understood. And I must likewise imagine that something as a something to be understood. Indeed, I must also imagine myself as a something, a someone who can understand. On this account, as in Rowan's own beautiful description in On Being Human, the mature human person is not someone who has left childish imaginings behind in the favor of the supposedly cold, clear light of reason. The mature human person is someone upon whom the universe continues to make an awe-inspiring impression. Someone who has learnt both to exercise and to interrogate the imagination, always seeking new perspectives, deeper insights, more profound truths, greater good and more exquisite beauty. But this means, in turn, that our imagination needs to be trained. It is at once innate, instinctive, and yet also something that has to be learnt and cultivated if we are to be able to exercise it well. Moreover, our imaginations are never without a particular location in human existence and experience. Before I even begin to use it, my imagination has been formed and informed by the world, the people, and the imaginations around me. My personal situation will determine the limits, the sinews, the instincts of my particular imagination, predisposing me to see the things and people around me as something to be understood or not, pre-selecting for me the pre-understandings available and the understandings permissible for them. In lived human experience, moreover, my context includes the damaging and limiting effects of sin. Thinking about education in the light of this account of the place of imagination in human understanding, two among many practical questions emerge. First, in a world where education is ever more commercialized and insistent on usefulness and various other measures, how do we build patterns of education in schools, colleges, churches, and seminaries, which neither suppress the imagination nor merely seek aimlessly to feed it, but which strive instead to inform it and encourage its virtuous formation? And second, how do we learn and teach habits of imagination that are able to imagine the limits deformities and vices of our own imaginations and indeed of our education programs. Second, imagination, Christian faith, apologetics and mission. For Balthazar, the form, the meaning at the heart of the world is not some empty or abstract concept. 
It has definite shape and content. Christ and his gift of himself is the form, the word, God's meaning at the heart of the world. The Christian faith is acceptance of and commitment to Jesus Christ as God's revelation. Christ the word incarnate is to be recognized, received and responded to as the image of God through whom all things were made, in, by, and for whom we are saved. His incarnation and life for Balthazar are to be understood as the expression, or perhaps better, the instantiation or the concretion within creation of God's eternal beauty, truth, and goodness, God's glory and holiness, and above all, of God's love. Christ is the form of beauty, the fullness of truth, the bounty of goodness, and perhaps also their excess. Building on initial perceptions of this revelation, responding to this particular revelation, the growth of faith requires us to relearn what for Balthazar we instinctively and blessedly intuited as tiny babes in our mother's arms. That the universe is a marvelous thing, that our whole existence is gift, and that we are boundlessly and unconditionally loved. It requires us, as Christ patiently explains to Nicodemus, to be born again, anew, from above, or the spirit. A wonderful discussion about human imagination between Nicodemus and Christ in John's Gospel. This takes imagination. It requires us to see the world differently from how we have already learnt to see it requires us to imagine, for example, that we are a good gift from a good source, not inconsequential dross, freak accidents, or grotesque mistakes. Even though that same revelation also makes us painfully aware that through sin, we have become distorted images of what we should be. It requires us, moreover, to imagine that we remain both lovable and loved despite our sin and its consequences, and thus forces us to delineate difference differently, learning that we can no longer divide the world and its occupants into lovable and unlovable, loved and unloved. Thinking about the place of the imagination in coming to faith suggests, again, many practical questions. Here, again, I outline just two. First, for Christian apologetics. In our attempts to present the reasonableness of Christian faith in a self-consciously mature and insistently logical world, how might we resist temptations to restrict and accommodate truth to that world's limited imagination of reasonableness? And second, for Christian mission and evangelism, how might we imagine invitations to faith which do not merely proclaim that we have seen the light and then shallowly insist that our conversation partners should accept our different and better account of how things are, but instead encourage and assist them to see the light of Christ for themselves and so begin to imagine and draw conclusions yeah. about God the world, human being, truth, beauty, and, good, yeah. diff and goodness differently. Third, imagination, prayer, worship, and liturgy. Since the imagination has such an important part to play in his understanding of our, all our mental processes and interior life, it should come as no surprise that it is also critical to Balthazar's account of prayer both in receptive contemplation and in creative meditation and indeed intercession, the human imagination is at work, seeking always to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, seeking always the better to see, hear, smell, touch, taste the incarnate word, the image of God. As we gaze and dwell upon and with Christ, the image of God, we learn to see how he points to the Father. But we also learn to see the whole world in his light, in God's love. Moreover, far from all being irrelevant distractions, graven images, or even idols, 
at least some of the physical products of our imagination, our creations in word and stone, oil paint, wood, cloth and music, all these can have a profound and important part to play in worshipping God. Indeed, they also have the potential to become icons, images which direct others towards God's love. For Balthazar, all Christian worship, perhaps even all human attempt to worship, is our spirit-led participation in the Son's lived thanksgiving to the Father. It is in learning to pray his prayers and become part of his offering of himself to the Father for the world. In the church, this takes the form of our recitation of his prayers, our attention to his words, our joyful and repentant response to him as the incarnate word. It happens in our repetition of his cultic acts. It is presented as our representation of his sacrifice. It is received in receiving the gifts of his body and blood and all other benefits of his passion. It is discovered in our sharing with one another the peace and the fellowship he bestows upon his followers. It is heard, encountered, and found in our attempts to listen to, visualize, and taste the word. Both Christian prayer and Christian worship, then, are in some sense scripted. Like the revelation to which they respond, they have a fixed and given form. They are, however, also expected to be our own joyful, creative, imaginative response, our free answers to God's word. For our recitation of the Psalms, for example, to become our own prayer, requires us imaginatively to enter their world, to connect their words to our lives, to trace their connections to Christ, to intend their meaning for ourselves and for others. For us to pray the Lord's Prayer requires us to imagine how we might contribute to the fulfillment of its demands. For the church to sing God's praises involves her accepting the creative and imaginative works of her hymn writers. For our buildings and their art to direct worshippers to God requires the designers, the builders, the creators, and their beholders to use their imaginations. At the same time, for Balthazar, it is in the end always Christ who is active in us, in our prayer and worship. Indeed, whenever our imaginations are faithful in prayer or worship, as in the rest of life, they are for him expressions of Christ. For in one of his idiosyncratic, imaginative word plays, Balthazar explains that Christ is the image, the built, of God, but also the power, the craft of God, and thus able to be our truest imagination, Einbildungskraft. Such an account of the importance of imagination in prayer and worship, again, raises many questions about how we go about, lead, or teach these important activities. Again, just two that I find particularly interesting in our present ecclesial context. First, to do with our participation in communal worship. How might Balthazar's appreciation of the profound importance of the human imagination facilitate a renewed view of the church's liturgy as a framework for a God-given, God-enacted, infinite variety of creative, spontaneous expression? in a renewed, solemn, and creative understanding of that spirit-led, full, conscious, active participation which the church wishes to encourage for the participants in the liturgy. And second, on how that worship should be led and conducted. How might work of this kind, in turn, enable the churches to move beyond a very wearisome conflict between visions of the liturgy as fixed, which can lead to stale and perfunctory performances of ritual on the one hand, 
and on the other, equally problematic views which insist on all being new, fresh, spontaneous and different, leading to liturgy which is mere performance of individuality. In conclusion, you will have spotted my questions are not particularly original, for they are, of course, perennial problems for the church to be prayed over, worked at and lived through, not dealt with in brief conference debates or resolved in snappy exam answers. My brief descriptions here of Balthazar's account are woefully simple, and there is, of course, much more to be argued and covered in a longer form of this paper, including thoughts about human maturity, the place of art in human society, vocation, metaphysics, questions of theological method. I won't get it all in the paper. But I hope these reflections present something worth considering together today in our discussion of theology, imagination, and the arts. They are, of course, also offered, and I hope they will be accepted, as my personal contribution to this celebration of your life and work, Rowan. From your inspiring introduction to theology lectures, I attended them three times, to your welcoming Wednesday evening drop-ins, from your patient attention to detail in the book on Arius, and your lucid, concise presentations in tokens of trust and on being human, from your arresting poetry to encouraging private conversations, from your thoughtful contributions to civic occasions and your inspiring homilies, from your imaginative engagement with Muslim scholars in building bridges and to your wise spiritual direction. In all this and in so much more, you have been, like Father Balthazar, a lived example of tireless efforts of audacious, imaginative, theological creativity, of faithful service to the church, and above all, of intimate reflection on the mystery of Christ. You have never ceased to show others what it means to live and struggle with practical theological questions, a life of witness for what, which I, like so many, will be eternally grateful. So can you hear me at the back? Good, good. Well, I first met Rowan about 40 years ago when I was an undergraduate reading philosophy and theology in Geoffrey Rowell's rooms in Keeble. And Rowan was a visiting preacher. Uh, I think he was the Dean of Clare at the time. And it's been, of course, a great privilege ever since to have had Rowan uh, as a colleague and as a friend. Others have spoken of the playful and the poetic side of Rowan's work, and of course of Rowan as a great theologian. And I think in Cambridge, we can take pride in a great theological tradition. So forgive me for a bit of self-advertising. I've just produced a book, <laughs> an anthology of the Cambridge Platonists, sources and commentaries uh, with Routledge at any good bookshop. Um, now, there's an interesting background to this, because some of you will know from this building the wonderful statue of uh, Benjamin Whichcote uh, here as the, you know, the representative of the Cambridge Platonists as part of this Cambridge theological tradition. And this book emerged out of what the Germans call a Streit der Fakultäten, as a kind of conflict of the faculties, where the history faculty had decided that the Cambridge Platonists didn't exist. In fact, they were a construction, a bogus construction by those well-meaning broad churchmen uh, like uh, uh, F.D. Morris and Kingsley and Tulloch and the others, uh, and uh, this was all a fabrication. Uh, now, uh, this was evidently false, uh, and, and I, I think we've uh, shown it to be the case, but 
of course, the error was based, I think, on a, on a deep complexity, and that is, you know, what on earth do we mean by the music of the spheres? Uh, by, <laughs> by Christian Platonism, that highly problematic and uh, contested uh, issue. And one might say that, in fact, the Russians are very interesting in this perspective. So think of Solovyov uh, and, indeed, Bulgakov uh, seeing himself in a tradition of Christian Platonism that included German idealism and Jakob Burma. Uh, in his splendid book, uh, Wisdom in the Christian Tradition, Marcus Plested uh, plays down the idealist influence, which he uh, somewhat dismisses as functional pantheism. Now, this is somewhat ironic, since the uh, German idealism uh, emerged out of controversies surrounding Spinoza and pantheism. A pantheism is a key to what, in many ways, Hegel and Schelling were trying to avoid. And, by the way, the battle cry of German idealism, Hen Kai Pan, came from Cudworth, it's from Mosheim's translation of the true intellectual system of the universe, which was a set text in Tübingen and Jena. Remember, those German idealists were trained as theologians. And indeed, Henry Moore is explicitly referred to, albeit as Heinrich Moore, by uh, Lessing in his uh, letters about Spinoza, in, in Jacobi's uh, publication, uh, The Letters on Spinoza. So, um, in fact, Henry Moore was a pivotal figure in the 18th century debates about Spinoza, and he links up Burma and Kabbalah to Spinoza, and of course, this is this tradition in the 18th century that we find being picked up uh, so enthusiastically by the Russians. In many ways, you could say one of those issues for both Hegel and Schelling is how to reconcile Exodus 3.14 as absolute self-consciousness with the All-Einheit, with the All-Unity. How do you combine this notion of the personality of God with the idea of God as absolute unity. And uh, this is, you find this in Schelling's late philosophy of the unprethinkable Herr des Seins as the Lord of Being, and indeed the centrality of that concept of the Einbildungskraft that Balthasar, of course, is picking up from that German idealist tradition. Of course, Coleridge loved the Einbildungskraft with its uh, explicit links to the image, to the build, um, and the idea that the imagination is linked to that key doctrine of the image of God. And um, this, this link between German idealism and Platonism was actually not just in Coleridge, but you find it in Jowett, A.E. Taylor, and indeed the great William Temple. Now, at that point, I want to... Uh, conclude that little introductory discussion with a quotation from Hegel about the Trinitarian divine life as ein Spielen der Liebe mit sich selbst, ein Spielen der Liebe mit sich selbst, a play of love with itself. So for the rest of my time, I want to discuss this notion of play and play in a theological context, and particularly as developed by the philosophers. So this is for Chino. He says of Plato, our Plato often discusses in a hidden manner the duty of belonging to mankind, and it sometimes seems as though he's joking and playing. But platonic games and jokes are much more serious than the serious things of the Stoics. For he does not disdain to wander occasionally through certain humble matters, if only gradually to guide his listeners who grasp humble things more easily to more elevated matters. And then he goes on to say, well, Plato often composes his fables, uh, and he sometimes raves and wanders as Avates, all the while paying no attention to human order, but to one prophetic and divine. And this was a very important theme for the Renaissance, the idea of the, the serio ludere, the, uh, the serious play. And that's 
the key to the great work of the 20th century, Johann Hausinger's Homo Ludens, this underlying Christian Platonism is the uh, key to that uh, paradigmatic work. Um, now, obviously, Erasmus um, had deep roots in the Church Fathers, especially in Augustine and in Origen. Um, and he wrote one of the masterpieces of the Renaissance in his On Praise of Folly. It's full of wit and fantastical. And of course, the very title, the Morii Encomium, is a pun on his dear friend's uh, uh, Sir Thomas More's name. Uh, so it's a playful work. Uh, and it's linked, by the way, to his particular connection with England, so with, um, to Fisher, to Lineker, Grossin, and to, uh, to, to Moore himself, Thomas Moore. Um, and key to that element, indeed, is the platonic component. Uh, now, this work is extremely satirical, bitingly satirical, so you might think that it's just... Uh, in the mode of Lucian of Samosota, so it's just pure satire, but it isn't. It ends up with a serious theological element to it. And writing to a colleague, he says, the passage which troubles you in the Moria will be clear to you if you remember the Platonic myth about the cave and the men born in it, who wondered at the shadows of things as though they were the reality. What we apprehend with our senses does not really exist, Isidoros, uh, for it is not perpetual. Uh, for it does not take the same form. Those things alone really exist which are apprehended by the contemplation of the mind. And the uh, in praise of folly, in fact, ends up with that uh, Pauline emphasis on the distinction between the serious of men, the foolishness of God, and then is explicitly uh, tied up with a concept of madness and ecstasy. So this is the, 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 the folly that he's discussing becomes linked to the, the madness of the true ecstasy that St. Paul himself describes. Now, uh, the, the, the interesting connection here, I think, is with Rabelais. So Rabelais was deeply influenced, deeply indebted to uh, Erasmus. Um, in a letter addressed to Erasmus as his most humane father, he says, I've called you father, I would also say mother if your indulgence would allow it. So Rabelais was deeply influenced and very much in this tradition of Erasmus. And of course, I think we're later on, we're going to hear about Bachtin. So of course, there's uh, a thread uh, about the liberating power of laughter, but a serious playfulness. Okay, so uh, that's a trajectory from uh, Erasmus to Rabelais, to the, the Russians on this notion of uh, play. But what about this Dutch historian that I've mentioned who's often thought of as a cultural historian? Johann Hausinger, 1872 to 1945. Now, Homo Ludens belongs to the end of his career as a scholar and was composed in the harrowing period of European history in the 1930s when fascism and communism were in the ascendancy in Europe. So he can be seen as in that Dutch humanist tradition of Erasmus, drawing on the idea of the serio ludere. Also the German tradition of figures like Schiller, say man only plays when he's in the fullest sense a human being and is only fully a human being when he plays. So Hausinger, I would claim, is presenting a philosophical rather than a narrowly sociological or historical account of the idea of 
play. And indeed, as a historian, he emphasized an imaginative and anti-positivistic account of history. Now, in this uh, wonderful book, Housinger sees play as a fundamental character, category. He defines it in relation to seriousness, but this relation is complex, he says, and even paradoxical, resisting exact analysis. We might, he says, in a purely formal sense, call all society a game if we bear in mind that this game is the living principle of all civilization. Now, this seems to be a strikingly counterintuitive thesis. Nevertheless, it's based upon a reflection about the pivotal role of play in the emergence of civilization. He writes, play is older than culture, for culture, however inadequately defined, always presupposes human society. And animals have not waited for man to teach them their playing. So Housinger insists that his book is about the play element of culture, not the play element in culture. That is to say, play for Housinger is not an isolated aspect of human culture, but lies at its source. Play is at the source of culture, and yet we will find transcends it. Now, he doesn't give an exhaustive analysis or definition of play, but highlights certain fundamental characteristics. The first is freedom. Uh, secondly, it's stepping outside the ordinary realm of reality into a domain of make-believe, but one valued in its own right. But Housinger says, the inferiority of play is continually being offset by the corresponding superiority of its seriousness. Play turns to seriousness and seriousness to play. Play may rise to heights of beauty and sublimity that leave seriousness far behind. Play, he thinks, occurs within a particular space and time structured by arbitrary rules and nevertheless inhabits a realm beyond the constraints of necessity or material utility. Thus, play is defined as an area or domain cut off from ordinary life, spatially and temporally, and this creates a magical area, arena. This play is the playful, yes, yes. Um, a magical arena whereby a spoil sport is often considered as worse than a cheat. He says, it is an activity which proceeds within certain limits of space and time, in a visible order according to rules freely accepted and outside the sphere of necessity or material unit utility. And here's this beautiful line, the play mood is one of rapture and enthusiasm and is sacred or festive in a accordance with the occasion. A feeling of exaltation and tension accompanies the action, mirth, and relaxation follow. So uh, you can see that in this, um, L, in this theory of play, there is a interest not only in the roots of culture in play, but also paradoxically the idea that our culture culminates at its highest uh, level in play. Um, he's fascinated by uh, the Whig, for example. This is one of the paradoxes he mentioned. So he says, you know, it's ironic that we think of the great age of genius, uh, the 17th century, in terms of their Whigs. Uh, and indeed, why is it that in the courtroom, he was a great Anglophile, uh, we identify the particular seriousness of the courtroom with this ludicrous object of the wig. Um, so, um, now, as I said, uh, I've taken Housinger to be part of this Christian Platonic tradition, um, and his kinship with Plato is very evident. He, he quotes Plato a great deal. Um, and here's a striking passage from uh, Housinger. Plato turned matters around. It was not man, but God who was the artist, and he played his game with the people. Man was God's plaything. Even Luther said 
that all creatures were masks of a hidden God for whom the world is a theater. And this again is, is a Shakespearean element that comes through in Housinger repeatedly. Drama in a glittering succession, he says, ranging from Shakespeare to Calderon and Racine dominates the West. It was the fashion to liken the world to a stage on which every man plays his part. Does this mean that the play element in civilization was openly acknowledged? Not at all. On closer examination, this fashionable comparison of life to a stage proves to be little more than an echo of the Neoplatonism that was then in vogue. And indeed, that Neoplatonic element that Hausinger sees as shaping for Shakespeare, I think quite rightly, uh, is a tradition that we can find in the medieval mystics like Meister Eckhart. So here's a passage from Eckhart. Now all things are alike in God and are God himself. Here in this sameness, God finds it so pleasant that he lets his nature and his being flow in this sameness in himself. It is just as enjoyable for him as when someone lets a horse run loose on a meadow that is completely level and smooth. Such is the horse's nature that it pours itself out with all its might in jumping about the meadow. So too, God finds delights and satisfaction where he finds the sameness. He finds it a joy to pour his nature and his being completely into the sameness, for he is this sameness himself. Now, don't worry about all the identity and different stuff there that's going on in the Neoplatonic metaphysics, but the emphasis on the joy, the emphasis on play is absolutely central. And this is the tradition, I say, that Hausinger is drawing on. It's the serio ludere. It's there, of course, in Dante's Divine Comedy as much as it is in Shakespeare's Fool. It's the paradoxical nature of play as grounded in the animal nature of humans and yet the highest forms of culture, whether art, philosophy, poetry, music, as manifestations of play. So play is not just a residual aspect of the evolutionary process, but a key to the most elevated aspects of human experience. So this is the thesis of play as anterior to culture, in a certain sense also superior to it. In play, this is a quotation from Hausinger, we move below the level of the serious as the child does, but we can also move above it into the realm of the beautiful and the sacred. And I think those words are very appropriate for the extraordinary work of Rowan Williams. And I'd just like to leave you, leave you with an image and the image is that of the smiling angels at the Cathedral of Reims, which are inviting you into a glance, a glimpse of the joy of heaven. Thank you very much. a while ago that I supplied my title and the, the paper I eventually wrote has drifted a little bit from the title. So I will mention wisdom and expansion and grace, um, but if I were to rename the paper now, as you can see, I would call it Rhyming Reality, the Visual Arts and the Expansion of Grace. And I'll start with art. And this work in particular for reasons that will soon, I hope, become clear. Shirazé Hushiari's window was installed in St. Martin in the Fields in London in 2008. The discussion of this work could occupy a whole paper, but for now I want simply to point to one of the reasons I think it can be counted a success as a commission. It is an exercise in visual rhyming which is epiphanic in its effects. 
Let's begin with the central, slightly tilted oval shape that seems to have had a strange sort of impact on the center of the middle window. The oval shape is a direct echo, as you can see, of the oval in the plaster molding in the ceiling above, which is the center of a flaming golden sunburst and contains within it the tetragrammaton. Ineffability is at the heart of both ovals, the unsayable divine name in the ceiling and in the window, the unseeable divine presence. They play off one another and enhance one another's meanings in the sanctuary space. The space of the oval can be read as a reworking of the space between the wingtips of the cherubim on the Ark of the Covenant, about which Rowan has written so suggestively in his 1996 essay, Between the Cherubim, reprinted in On Christian Theology. Here, though, the ineffable fullness of that oval pulls the leaded lines of the window into a new tension, distorting their even spacings so that we discern the semiotically very particular shape of a cross. The grid which is disrupted by this subversively tilted oval is also an echo, or a rhyme, perhaps. An echo of one of the defining artistic tropes of artistic modernism in the 20th century, the grid. Think Malevich, Mondrian, Reinhardt, and many others. One of the defining moments in modernism's theorization was the establishment of the journal October. And one of the most influential essays ever printed in October was the 1979 essay, Grids, by the art critic Rosalind Krauss. Krauss acknowledged two possibilities of the grid. It could point beyond itself through the suggestion of a continued, as yet invisible, extension outwards, uncontained by the frame, or it could be read as the replication of the frame in a series of further acts of reduced containment. The frame sucked into the work itself, so to speak, mapped repetitively onto its physical surface. Life in squares, the world in boxes, a paradigm of modernity's resolute materialist immanentism. Krauss thought these two dynamics, these two possible dynamics, the expansive and the contracting, which she read as the religious and the scientific, could never be reconciled. And she chose the latter, surprisingly perhaps, as the more enlightened expression of reality. As Jonathan Anderson puts it, the grid embodied for her, quote, the domain of reason and rational verifiability. In Krauss's own words, the bottom line of the grid is a naked and determined materialism. So what Hushari's oval does is transform the grid by opening a new transcendence at its heart rather than across the perceived boundary of its edges. It is thus a profoundly Christian transcendence, fittingly presided over by the sign of the cross. So that's my overture. The vast range of Rowan's engagements with the arts in all media is both distributed across his work, as Giles indicated in his introduction, for example, in his discussion of Eastern Orthodox iconography in Lost Icons, or of George Herbert's poetry in Anglican identities and in so many other places and also concentrated in certain very significant studies, the Dostoevsky book being a prime example, as well as Grace and Necessity, which is now pretty much required reading in the gradually consolidating field of theology and the arts. He is also, I should say, from direct experience, a quite brilliant live interlocutor with artists themselves. This is a rare skill, a bit like winning the trust of wild animals. <laughs> And in the case of artists, what's needed in order to, so to speak, call the geese down out of the sky and get them to eat out of your hand involves communicating that you have really attended to their work deeply, appreciatively, not in order just to mine it for some illustrative point, but with a disposition opened to being changed by it. It is this same disposition which marks his many writings on the arts and makes them so exemplary. And this is, of course, in part because he is an artist himself. For the purposes of this paper, I want to turn, as Catherine did yesterday, to his brief discussion of the Kunghaneth form in Welsh poetry, which features in chapter five of The Edge of Words. And for the sake of time, I'm going to skip uh, over uh, what would have been a brief discussion of the visual commentary on scripture project, which Giles mentioned 
in his introduction, although if you're bored with what I'm saying, you can always visit this website and play around with it in the meantime, lots to look at. And those of you in this room who have so far written for it, and there are a good many, uh, will discern in some of my remarks towards the end of this paper just how much my debts to Rowan's patterns of thought have shaped the pattern on which the VCS is being built. In discussing Kung Hanath, Rowan says this, finding a rhyme, and ideally finding a rhyme that is not merely conventional, requires a unique moment of holding an idea in suspense while the writer looks for a way of saying it that will echo specific sounds. For the reader or hearer, the resultant echo will leave at least a trace of the sense of an unexpected connection. Language under pressure is deployed in this context, and I quote again, as a means of exploration, invoking associations which may be random in one way, yet generate a steady level of unsettling or alternative supplementary meanings. May be random in one way. We'll return to that phrase later. Although I will make distinctions between them, I'm going to give you some more artistic examples now, all of those examples that follow are cases of invention in which there is a mixture of discovery and design, but in different degrees, perhaps, or proportions. I begin with a collection of works of art in different ways which embody the iconography of melancholy, melancholia, this is, if you like, a traditioned rhyme, visual rhyme. An iconography originating in ancient Greece on funerary stele. So it's one that can be invoked readily and has been, as we see here in the Elijah icon, in Dirk Bautz's John the Baptist, top right, in Albrecht Dürer's Christ on the Cold Stone from The Small Passion, bottom right, and in Marc Chagall's depiction of a 20th century rabbi, which is itself uh, an evocation of uh, Rembrandt's painting of Jeremiah. This is a traditioned rhyme which can be invoked readily. The use of this pose to depict a range of figures may have something off the peg about, its, about it. Its risk then is cliche. But it also allows a high degree of creativity and it is expressive and supportive of shared worlds of association, thought and feeling, as well as being capable of initiating new adventures of insight and action. As Rowan himself says of the analogous case of poetry, even ritual moves, familiar to singer and hearer alike, can invite us to set aside for this listening period our assumptions about the solidity or closure of our perceptions. As traditioned, in the way I've described, this sort of rhyme can be contrasted with that echo in Hushiari's window, which I take to be more innovative, though profoundly at odds with a modern aesthetic of radical novelty inasmuch as it is a working with what has first been found in the molding on the church ceiling, and also a subversive comment on modernist norms in 20th century art and art criticism. What of El Greco? Here in his one of two paintings he made of Christ driving the traders from the temple, the rhymes are not strictly formal, in visual terms at least, but narratively based. So if you look uh, high up on the walls of this imagined temple, um, you see on, on them uh, two what, what are probably meant to be frescoes, although possibly reliefs. Um, and on the left, we see the expulsion of Adam and Eve from Eden. And on the right, Abraham raising his arm above Isaac, the Akedah. Uh, these are narratively based rhymes. Perhaps we can call them scriptural rhymes, drawing on what Susanna Ticciati calls the strong and dynamic network of signs, which is the Bible itself. Yet, in order to work, these rhymes require a moment, or again, perhaps a tradition, of visual extrapolation from the narrative. The visual shorthand, which has helped to tell the story of the expulsion of Adam and Eve from Eden and Abraham's near sacrifice of Isaac, have left deposits in the history of art in which raised arms play a central role. And that's where these, the rhymes are at work, I think, especially in this painting. Thus accrued, these deposits open the way for El Greco to combine them in a new way, one that allows his painting to become an existential challenge to a contemporary viewer. So, as you can see, the expulsion of Adam and Eve, the enactment, if you like, of judgment, 
takes place on the side in which we see the money changes in disarray. The money changes in disarray, and the raised arm of Abraham, which is, as it were, the suspension of sacrifice, the deliverance of promise, as a result of the suspension of sacrifice, is above the apostles who look on attentively. And as Christ advances straight down the middle of the painting towards our space, the butt hand of his whip pointing towards us and the table tumbling almost into our own space, we are required to position ourselves very definitely in relation to this challenge. Which side are we on as his arm, if you like, potentially invokes the possibilities of the raised arm of the expelling angel or that of the suspended arm of Abraham, suspended by the angel. The links in the history of salvation bind us too into the story and require us to position ourselves in relation to it. The artwork is not a mere reflection or illustration of the text, but as Paolo Berdini would put it, a new expansion of the text. He provokes the same question that Rowan circles around in his chapter on scripture in Being Christian. Who or where am I in this story? There you see the two details. The angel's arm is a little bit difficult to see, but I promise you it's there. David Jones pushes us into territory that is more obviously about being itself, not just the possibilities of resonant form, Hushiari's oval, not just the adaptability of conventional signs, the traditioned iconography of melancholy, not just the figural connections that can be discerned in the biblical canon and then juxtaposed, El Greco, but the ways in which non-human creatures are already intensively woven together with one another, quite apart from any human interventions, already, if you like, rhyming. Recognizing this priorness, human artifice can be a mode of profound communion in the world of signs, which are first God's sacramental gift. Here we see how the humanly made window latch um, echoes the shape of the natural curl of the tendril of one of the plants that he has depicted. A, um, a mode of profound communion in the world of signs which are first God's sacramental gift. Here we take our place as amplifiers of prevenience. Grace is made visible in our creative receipt of this rhyming reality. And finally, a rhyme that requires us to consider a rather different moment in arts, uh, or what Thomas Pfau, and actually Thomas Pfau's recent book, it's a momentous, heavy book, Incomprehensible Certainty, Metaphysics and Hermeneutics of the Image, um, I think would make an extraordinarily interesting conversation between the edge of words and that. I'd love to see that conversation happen. So anyone who feels, if you're not too exhausted <laughs> from organizing this conference, or anyone else who thought they weren't like to organize a conference, I think that would be a very fascinating one. Um, so a, a rather different moment in arts, what Pfau calls uh, arts ontological coordination of mind and world. This is the sort of connection that most discomforts old school art historians because the point of connection is not behind the work, but as Rowan following Recur might suggest, in front of it in some way. Albert Gleis was a pioneering Cubist artist, one of the very first, if possibly the first, to ever write about Cubism, along with Jean Metzinger. He was eventually received into the Roman Catholic Church in 1941, although he converted some time before, declaring a terrible thing has happened to me, I have found God. <laughs> His Christianity accompanied a newfound faith that the activity of painting was answerable to deep structures and rhythms in reality. A faith that, as in this work, Pour Contemplation, art could take the parts created by Cubism's fragmentation of our perceptions of objects and interweave them into a cadence one of his favorite words. Gleis, like his fellow Cubists, rejected one-point perspective, and in this regard, he saw Cubism as, and I quote, a return to the state of mind that had prevailed prior to the Renaissance. His visual rhythms seek to echo the patterns of Celtic carved stone, which, as you see here, he also fruitfully compared with the 13th century work of Cimabue. These are both his own drawings uh, of the originals. Rhythm, he wrote, is the goal towards which religious art aspires. Cadence is the means by which it can be approached through the senses. Although these two works, these two that you see, uh, and this is still him, although, the, although these two works are separated by very many centuries, although their external meaning has been completely changed by the events which have taken place between them, is it not stimulating to be able to put them side by side? 
Gleis felt an urgent need to address the problem of how to relate the sheer variety of individual experience to some sort of collective order. Reality, I quote again, may be open to discussion, but is in itself nonetheless sure. This outlook left him somewhat isolated as other cubists turned in new directions. The Dadaists made him a target of ridicule, yet he persisted in wanting his art to lead towards, quote, deeper, more certain, more absolute joys than a fragmented, war-wounded world seemed willing to believe possible. And now I'd like to introduce a second work made in a quite different location by a Protestant, not a Catholic, but at just the same point in history, 1942. The maker of this work, now known as the Stalingrad Madonna, uh, of which there's a copy in Coventry Cathedral, was Dr. Kurt Reuber. He combined three vocations, those of a trained artist, a Lutheran pastor, and a physician. His pre-war anti-Nazi views did not prevent his being drafted into the Wehrmacht as a military doctor, and he found himself in a bunker in Stalingrad at Christmas 1942, enduring the city's long and devastating winter siege. Four terrible words, along with the date, acknowledge the violence and horror out of which his Madonna and child emerged. Im Kessel and Festung, which means fortress, Stalingrad. Kessel means kettle in German, as in the modern verb to kettle or encircle a group of people. Its older meaning is cauldron. Yet four other words push back. At top right, we read Licht, light, and down the right-hand side, Leben, Liebe, life, love, and at left, Weihnachten, Christmas. Faced with a human violence and sin rarely surpassed in history, he brought something to birth in this artwork that he believed the cauldron would not consume. The concentric and peaceable curves of Gleiser's paintings suggest a female form whose significance may be explicated with the help of Kurt Reuber's Stalingrad Madonna. As though to deny such violence any claim to ultimacy, it has remarkable affinities with poor contemplation in being a perfect image, as Hilary Davis, the poet, has written, of the serenity, security, and care created by a mother's love for her child. Its gathering power was confirmed by the soldiers who came through a makeshift Christmas door to view it, entranced and too moved to speak, as Reuber recorded it, too moved to speak in front of the picture on the clay wall. This rhyme may, like David Jones's Flora in Calix Light, be an index of a participative reality, but it has no artistic author, except perhaps the curator or the audience of it. In this respect, this rhyme is also different from the strenuously self-imposed rhymes of the poets Rowan discusses in Edge. But the idea of curatorial rhyming requires an even more radical metaphysical affirmation than those we've, we've entertained in looking at my earlier examples. In Rowan's words, quote, to speak of an implicate order for the universe is to recognize that the whole pattern is folded into every part. That is what curatorial rhyming testifies to. In a recent book on Cezanne, If These Apples Should Fall, the preeminent and Marxist atheist British art historian T.J. Clarke quotes a letter written in 1934 by Samuel Beckett under the shock of seeing Cezanne's Montagne Sainte Victoire landscapes for the first time. What a relief, says Beckett, the Mont Sainte Victoire, after all the anthropomorphized landscape, after all the landscape promoted to the emotions of the hiker, postulated as concerned with the hiker. What an impertinence, worse than Aesop and the animals. Clark's quotation of Beckett articulates the force of what will be the inevitable objection of secular modernity to Rowan's suggestions too. The material, Beckett's word, of the landscape is, Beckett's words again, incommensurable with all human expressions whatsoever. So how can we distinguish between implicatedness and miredness, what we might call miredness, in the Beckett case, miredness in our own self-regard and sentimentality, both of which we project onto what we see. And here we return to Rowan's acknowledgement of the difficulty of associations which may be random. Random in one way, he says, though. What are the other ways in which they might not be random? This is where the language of fittingness or aptness asks to be taken seriously as it has done at a number of key points during this conference so far, in discussions of political authority as well as of matters of philosophical and theological judgment. 
One of Rowan's characteristic criteria in the realm of the arts is to identify and affirm that which, quote, extends and enlarges our perception, a dynamic of, quote, filling out. As has also been hinted at this in this conference, this risks promoting a multiplicatory dynamic without necessarily sustaining a correlative wisdom about how and what to reject or to prune. But perhaps we can begin to put an answer this way. The made connection is one that is ready to be accomplished. It awaits its making. And then we face complex judgments in rhyming reality well. Everything is related to everything else, but some relations are more pertinent, more meet and right than others. As Catherine indicated yesterday, this process may require repeated tearing down and building up. In the third from bottom line of this excerpt from Jared Manley Hopkins' poem, To What Serves Mortal Beauty, he asks the question, how meet beauty? And his answer is, merely meet it. To allow rhyme to do its work, this is probably homonymic, but who cares, that's the point, we should entertain the idea that to meet beauty in a rhyming world is not just to come upon it, but actively to gauge it, to assay it, in relation to its cornucopian context, the context of an abundant creation and a limitlessly generous divine giver. And despite his merely, Hopkins himself knows that there is nothing mere about this activity of meeting things, inasmuch as such meetings involve owning heaven's sweet gift. They entail wishing all. So it seems that an anagogical or eschatological orientation needs to be central to our aesthetic rhyming of signs some sense of the all towards which we are being summoned by those signs. This is Christological insofar as that omneity, to use the Coleridgean word, which is all things coming into right relation, is the achievement of the Christ who is wisdom. In that light, we are better positioned for a judgment of what is meat, and Rowan would not disagree with this, I'm quite certain. So let's finally return to the Gleis Räuber rhyme. Whereas mind and world met in other ways in my other examples, in this particular case, as I've said, it is curatorial rhyming or audience rhyming that is the point at which they find themselves coordinated. Mind and world meet, and we meet or judge this meeting for its transformative power with the call to holiness, the final measure of a truly meet transformation. That is what I think we encounter here. Each in their own ways, these two artworks communicate and I quote Hilary Davis again, a swirling simplicity forming a series of ovals that recall the womb. And this may in turn, and in a rhyming of rhymes, deliver us back to a new appreciation of the work with which we began, Hushari's pregnant space in St. Martin in the Fields, another womb-like space in whose viewing we are invited to listen for the name which is above every name, the name of the God who is eternally with us. to join us again. <laughs> well, so, so much to reflect on here, and thank you all enormously for these. Uh, just a, a note, perhaps not entirely random to start with, um, it's just over a week ago that I found myself doing a podcast along with the Russian poet Olga Sedlakova, whose poem on the smiling angel of Rem I translated last year for the anthology A Century of Poetry. So a little rhyme, which, <laughs> random or not, occurred in the transaction here. Um, a couple of very short reflections from an enormously inviting set of presentations. One is to note a visual rhyme which won't have escaped many of you, between the Gleis image and Rublev's Trinity. I think if you look at that, it's, it's fairly obvious. I don't know how conscious that was, whether it was part of Gleis's own background, but it seems to me to um, invite observation. I just note that. 
in passing. Um, but on those images, Ben, that you put before us, um, the St. Martin in the Fields window, which I agree in thinking a very considerable work indeed, also for me rhymes with some of those diagrammatic representations of how black holes work. The warping of space around them and lines around them invites us, it seems to me, to think of the ineffable mystery there and the tetragrammaton and the um, corresponding oval on the roof as precisely those spaces into which we disappear to reemerge, in which connection is dissolved in order to be refounded. And that, I, I suspect that's somewhere in the background of that, that design also, but I just mentioned that in passing. But to go, Lucy, to um, one of the main things that you were talking about, that sense of our liturgical presence as believers in another world in which Christ is the fundamentally active energy. And how that poses to us the question of how we frame that in the practicalities of, of worship. It seems to me that that has a lot to do with what Douglas had to say about play in the sense of gratuity, in the sense of being in a world where representation is never copy, where the life of an object is the life it gives, invites, bestows in what receives it. That's the liturgical world in which we are indeed, allowing um, a kind of curatorial rhyming to emerge in liturgical language, in hymnody, in exegesis, in preaching, and we hope also the uh, rather distinctive kind of rhyming that might emerge in our doing something about it as active disciples. And all, Douglas, that you had to say about um, play made me think, of course, of that um, provocative, unusual 20th century, not quite theologian, G.K. Chesterton, and Chesterton's repeated insistence, of course, that theological truth was something far too important to be serious about. I thought also, as he was speaking, of an essay by the late David Martin, published, I think, in the, oh, in the mid 1970s, mid to late 1970s, about liturgy as play, where he quoted his then very young daughter, Jessica, um, commenting on why liturgy made sense, because, said Jessica, apparently, um, people like singing and walking in straight lines. <laughs> and the gratuity of ritual, allowing something to, to generate pattern in itself, that, that's part of what's going on in the liturgical action. Um, it made me think also of how we return almost obsessively to the theme of how we recognize the distinctively human in the realm of paleontology and the recent discoveries that have made us think again about our Neanderthal cousins. Um, there was an article quite recently about, about this, about how Neanderthals apparently did indeed bury their dead with ritual. They, we can say, they thought of things to do with dead bodies, other than throwing them away, which is the obvious thing to do. And they thought of things to do with dead bodies, presumably because they were attending to dead bodies. And they were attending to dead bodies because they attended to live bodies. And somewhere in that connection occurs a set of playful, but profoundly serious responses, which are indeed the life, the form, of what you're dealing with allowed to become itself in what is other, to paraphrase David Jones. So again, we're right on the, the cusp, not only of thinking about liturgy, but thinking about the distinctiveness of humanity itself. And um, the role of Neanderthals as potential bearers of the divine image as well is one of those little theological rabbit holes which I would invite you to spend, to spend a bit of time in at some point. Um, Oh, and one last uh, rhyme which occurred to me, so this is very random, brackets or not. The melancholy image in um, those examples you gave us, Elijah and John in the wilderness, Christ at the stone and the modern rabbi. The other rhyme to that is Joseph in the classical Byzantine images of the nativity and how that has something to say about the echo of mourning within 
the celebration of the incarnation as part of the witness that is given to the radicality of what's going on. There is, there is loss and melancholy within that image, contained, not allowed to be central, but I wonder if that's also what's going on. But I could, I could uh, rabbit on being curatorial um, and waste the time that is needed for better, better questions. Thank you. Excellent. So we have time for uh, one or two questions, and Janet was absolutely first, so I shall get straight to you. Thank you, first of all, for three brilliant papers. So, so wonderful. What a wonderful panel. And I guess this is really to Ben, but it partly rhymes with the previous session and the question to Isidorus, which is the whole question um, as we inhabit the canon of Christian art, and we think of it as largely the Western canon, and we go back to the Caravaggios, the icons, and so on. Um, then we're aware uh, of those um, uh, for whom inhabiting the canon is not so obvious. Um, and I think particularly this has been striking with African-American artists, where um, you're just looking back at a whole canon of what, or what weren't. I mean, like the early saints obviously were from North Africa, but the way they appear in our paintings are all white men and women, and, uh, and, and what we do with that, how we use that. I mean, there's some interesting things, I'm thinking of Kahind Wiley, who, who, who will put gay black men in the postures of various saints, um, but he's not doing that religiously, as far as I know. And I wonder if you know about, this is a, a question too, about how we inhabit traditions without that tradition itself being a crimp. Thank you. Thank you, it's a, a very important and um uh, challenging question, um, and it's certainly the case that one of the, one of the unfortunate legacies of colonialism is, is also the imposition of inherited artistic iconographies on places where Christianity, you know, takes, takes on its own new life, but is sort of freighted with a, the unfortunate baggage of, of Western ways of showing the saints and so on. That can be quite, quite a problem. Um, I think one of the things, and again, I owe this entirely to, to Roe in this way of thinking, that one of, one of the forms that rhymes can take very fruitfully is precisely subversive rhymes. So parody, for example, can be a rhyme, um, but a sort of in, inverse rhyme in which you learn something both new about the original, which is being parodied, and also um, are able to claim a new insight or perspective. Um, and... Uh, and so the work that Rowan did in 2000 with Jeremy Begbie's uh, Theology Through the Arts project on James McMillan's um, opera, that, that the essay about that in Sounding the Depths is a wonderful exploration of the value of parodic rhyme, I would say. Um, and I think that might be one of the strategies that artists like Hinder Wiley are using very effectively, um, and one of the ways in which one could perhaps try to imagine other, you know, other ways of sh shedding some of the shackles of inherited iconography or letting it come to life in new ways. Great, thank you. I think, I can't quite see, but I'm told that John, John has a question. John. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you very much to all three panelists. And I wanted to ask Douglas a question, and specifically thank you, Douglas, for those um, fascinating references to the history of play in Western culture and also for accidentally connecting with my invocation of the question of the one and the all um, yesterday. And I, I'd be interested to know um, sort of later sort of how, how you see that as connecting with play and divine play and your quotation from Hegel. But I wanted to ask you more specifically about the question of play in relation to culture. Because the idea that play is prior to culture um, because we find it in animals, would seem to depend on the idea that then animals don't have culture, whereas I would argue animals do have culture, and therefore there isn't an obvious duality between play and culture. And that then connects with the usual critiques of um, Heitzinger's, uh, if that's how you pronounce it, book, um, the, the usual critiques are that after all, despite these invocation of serious play, he has too much of a duality of play and the serious. He talks about play as being Sunday, he, he's, he corrals play from the rest of culture, 
because he has a play culture and duality, so, so that he, he, he doesn't really see uh, the economic and the political as, as play. He, he sees play as something else, thereby buying into a typical modernist capitalist duality of leisure versus culture, where the whole field of leisure and play is therefore playing um, actually, you know, a sinister and justificatory um, kind of ideological role. Whereas um, the case that Rowan is invoking is a burial, the most serious possible matter, and yet it's a play as well. <laughs> and, and that's completely different. And that's genuinely uh, platonic, I, I, I would submit, in, in a way that is in Heitziger is in danger of actually not being. And so he, does he really fa face up to the question of fair play, which is the question of justice itself? Mm. Right, well, uh, <laughs> I don't think I can answer all of that but I might just make just a couple of very swift observations. One is, the context of it is, is 1938. So it is a critique of totalitarianism. I mean, it's a rather nostalgic defense of the inherited European tradition against Marxism and fascism. And what he sees is the perversion of play in the totalitarian world. And he, which of course was the dominant force in Europe at the time. Um, so it's the perversion of play, but also the, the fake seriousness that he, he, he thinks is part of that culture. So, the book ends with this furious attack on Schmidt, on Karl Schmidt. So it ends, that's why it ends with a critique of the idea that uh, friend and foe should be the key notion. He says if, that, if we accept that, then, then we really are at an end in our civilization. The other point about the relationship between play and art uh, and culture, I would see in exactly the other way around, actually, because, as I say, he insists that it's not um, the play element in culture, but the play element of culture. In fact, he wasn't allowed to, the book wasn't allowed to be translated in such, because the, the English translator thought that, that, that was, um, uh, for, for stylistic reasons, uh, 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 impossible. But, Housinger's point was precisely to emphasize, as it were, the, you might say, the uh, um, continuum between play and culture. And there have been recently uh, uh, experiments done on rats. Right? So rats apparently are great players. Uh, they love wrestling. And the big rats let the little rats win about 30% of the time because they know if they keep bashing the little rats, there's no more play. <laughs> so um, <laughs> and, and there's another figure, uh, Robert Bella, of course, his great book on uh, religion and human evolution, draws on housing, I think, in very interesting ways. So I think one can mount a defense, which, of course, one, one can't, given the limitations here, but one could mount a defense for housing on those points. Wonderful, thank you uh, very much. Um, I think the lunch hour is uh, now upon us um, and we'll be reconvening uh, at 1.30 with the panel on uh, the Russian imagination continuing uh, some of our themes. Um, but it only remains for, for me to encourage you to thank our panelists for their wonderful presentations and to Rowan for his response. <laughs>
Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Could I encourage you to take your uh, seats, take your places for the beginning of this session? Thank you. Uh, this session deals with the Russian imagination. Allow me to introduce myself to you. I'm Stephen Platt. I'm not an academic. I work in the field of Christian unity. Um, apart from being an Orthodox priest, I am the General Secretary of the Fellowship of St. Alban and St. Sergius an organization which has existed now for almost a hundred years <clears throat> to promote work and contact and fellowship between Christians of East and West and to encourage study of our respective traditions. Rowan has been an active member of the fellowship and in more recent years, one of our patrons, uh, all of his scholarly life. And so it's um, a great honor for me to be asked to uh, chair this session. And it has also been um, a great joy and a privilege for the fellowship to take its part in co-sponsoring this very important event. Our speakers in this session all specialize in the thought of the Russian emigration of the 20th century or in aspects of Russian literature and um, conceptual imagination. Ruth Coates from the University of Bristol um, specializes in 19th and early 20th century Russian intellectual history. Uh, she is mainly interested in uh, 20th century Russian religious thought, theology, culture, and the influence of these on secular Russian thought. Uh, in particular, she has worked on the philosophy of Mikhail Bakhtin. Uh, she is the author of many books and papers on this field. Carol Emerson is the A. Watson Armour III University Professor Emerita of Slavic Languages at Princeton. Her work has focused on uh, Russian literature, Pushkin, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Bakhtin, but also on Russian music, opera, and um, theater. Her most recent projects have been concerned with allegorical historical writing she is perhaps best known here, or at least in Oxford, where I am based, as the um, co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of Russian Religious Thought. And here, she is perhaps better known uh, for her work on the Cambridge Introduction to Russian Literature. Last but not least, Joshua Heath, who is, of course, one of the uh, co-organizers of this auspicious event, is based here in uh, Cambridge where he has a uh, JRF at Trinity and he is working on uh, Father Sergei Bulgakov and I believe that uh, Rowan is your uh, supervisor so this is a wonderful cross-section of um, uh, people to speak to us this afternoon let us begin first of all uh, by introducing uh, Ruth and I can't remember the name of your paper because I'd say the transnational Russian, the transnational Russian uh, imagination. Hello, good afternoon. It's an honor to be presenting at this conference. As Father Stephen just said, I'm a Russianist based in modern languages at Bristol University. And my primary research interest has hitherto been in Russian religious... Okay. 
I, I was told I wouldn't need to do this. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me at the back of the room? Okay, I'll try and speak up. <clears throat> yeah, my primary research interest has hitherto been in Russian religious thought of the late imperial period. A few years ago, I completed a project on the philosophical reception of the doctrine of deification between Russia's revolutions, in which I focused on philosopher theologians, some of whom I first encountered as a doctoral student, most substantially by reading Rowan's De Phil thesis, which he kindly lent me after an upgrade interview that had revealed my ignorance of that thought world. I'm currently developing a new project on 20th century female orthodox voices in England with connections to Russian orthodoxy and the post-revolutionary emigration. Here, the emphasis falls on the practice and dissemination of orthodox spirituality, including the hesychastic tradition of contemplative prayer, which at this early stage, I posit to be the primary contribution of women. Rowan has, of course, engaged deeply with this tradition also and played no small part in making it more widely known to the public. My original intention for this paper was to look at how Russian religious thinkers prior to the 1917 revolution conceptualized their deification projects in relationship to the then still actual Russian imperial imaginaries of Tsar and people and to compare this then with how one of my female orthodox voices drew on what you might call the practical deification project, known as prayer of the heart, to reconceptualize the relationship of faith to church and nation after the revolution in the Russian Orthodox Church's post-Constantinian epoch. This proved too ambitious, and certainly too ambitious for a 20-minute paper. So I'm afraid you will be hearing the second part only today, with apologies to those of you who would have been far keener to hear the first. And apologies to you, Rowan, as well, that I won't be engaging directly with your work, though I hope it will resonate with some aspects of your thinking. The person I'm going to be talking about today um, is Yulia de Bosobra, whose dates are 1893 to 1977. Yulia de Bosobra was a high-born Russian from St. Petersburg who fell victim to the Stalinist purges. There appears to be no evidence that she was deeply or even consciously religious before the 1920s. She had a mystical turn of mind that was likely shaped more by Russia's metaphysical symbolists than the Russian Orthodox Church. But her experience of the Soviet penal system transformed her into a committed Orthodox Christian and a practitioner of silent prayer in the hesychastic tradition. She was arrested in Moscow in 1932 within a week of her husband, the former diplomat Nikolai de Bosobra. She was kept in the Lubyanka inner prison for nine months, three of which she spent in solitary confinement under frequent interrogation. She was sentenced to five years hard labor at a lumber camp in the Chomniki forest near Sarov in St. Serafim territory, but became so ill there that she was invalided out in 1933, though without papers. Her husband was executed. She survived by selling her possessions until she was ransomed out of the Soviet Union by her former English governess. She arrived in England in the spring of 1934. This paper will analyze de Bosobra's response to the collapse of the Tsarist Empire and the eclipse of the Russian Orthodox Church as the ideological partner of autocracy and ubiquitous physical and, as it were, moral presence in the land. How did the conditions under which her Christian faith developed shape her understanding of church, state, and the relationship between them. And in the context of her experience of the Russian Orthodox Church in its diminished position relative to its imperial past, both in the USSR and later in England, how did she come to understand the purpose of the Christian life in the 20th century? 
and I'll be arguing that the key to answering these questions is the special role and status that she ascribed to prayer, particularly the Jesus prayer, or variants of it, in the condition of both internal and external exile. So first of all, her attitude to the Russian Orthodox Church. Dobosobra's faith was not obviously nurtured by the church. Growing up, her family attended church and observed the cycle of feasts and fasts, but in a formal way only. Her parents were highly secularized. As a young teenager, de Basobra experienced a religious awakening, but was put off church by the inappropriate behavior of a priest confessor during a Lenten pilgrimage to the Trinity St. Sergius Lavra, where she went with a domestic servant. It was not until the late 1930s, living in exile in London, that she developed a relationship with a parish, first St. Philip's on Buckingham Palace Road, where her confessor became Father Mikhail Polsky, himself a former camp inmate, and later in life, All Saints in Ennismore Gardens under Metropolitan Antony of Soros. When she wrote about corporate worship and the liturgical life of the church, de Basobre showed a deep understanding of what she called the liturgical discipline of participation in the daily, weekly, and yearly prayer cycle of the church and its importance in initiating worshippers into and training them in the theandric mystery, the meeting of God and man. She also acknowledged the role of corporate worship as a safeguard against what she called wrong solitude, the kind of solitude that is a weakness and not a force. At the same time, she herself sat increasingly loose to church services to the discomfort of some Orthodox. Sergei Hackel, for example, cautioned de Basobra's biographer, Constance Babington Smith, to provide a corrective to her statements on the matter as, quote, most readers will find it difficult to match them with their expectations of orthodoxy. In the care home that she lived at the end of her life, she took Anglican communion with Metropolitan Antony's consent, however. A much more important understanding of church for de Basobra was as, quote, the togetherness of the rank and file of the laity. The togetherness of the rank and file of the laity. In 1941, she wrote that the church is the laity and the laity is the church attributing this view to the Russian people as a whole. Her rider to this assertion, particularly after the revolution, explains this statement. De Basobra herself did not have the time or the opportunity to develop an identity as a churchgoer before the revolution. By contrast, she formed a very powerful bond with the Orthodox Christians whom she encountered in the Soviet penal system. In the Lubyanka, once her own interrogations had come to an end, other women were introduced to her hitherto solitary cell, of whom three were devout Christians. The most striking was Katerina, in de Basobra's words, a half-blind, super-educated mystic. Um, she held degrees in classics and higher mathematics from Moscow University. Katerina, dressed in long black clothes, discreetly crossed herself and others, prayed and spoke about the lives of the saints, including Serafim of Sarov. It's a very important figure for de Basobra. De Basobra concluded that she must be a lay sister of an unusual order. The women held prayerful vigil whenever a cellmate was taken away for interrogation. In the labor camp, there were many others like them, a hut full of nuns who practiced the Jesus prayer, a young peasant mystic called Vasya, who knew the gospels by heart, composed and performed religious songs, and carved tiny crucifixes to give in secret to others, and an elderly and in fact dying nun in the camp hospital, Mother Theodosia, who prophesied that de Basobra would make a new life overseas. These people were de Basobra's church. <clears throat> As she put it in a late article, despite the continuing, if compromised, visibility of the institutional church after the revolution, the laity sought spiritual survival by becoming unarmed and unprotected loners who could coalesce or disperse without causing serious damage to any organization, unquote. And I'll return to this idea of the church beyond the church at the end of my presentation. Turning to the state now, 
Throughout her work, de Besobre displays a clear-eyed rejection of authoritarian and totalitarian statism, including the imperial impulse, which derived from her experience of becoming a victim of the centripetal logic of violence of the Soviet regime. She considered it to be a manifestation of spiritual evil and described the Soviet penal system and the Russian imperial one that foreshadowed it as a network of hell pockets, the very surfacing of hell, which for the person who has lived there eclipses all apprehension of hell in the afterlife. She would later make several efforts to explain to herself and her English audiences how such atrocious, sadistic violence and disregard for human life could take hold and become systemic in the same land that produced Russia's cultural achievements and its saints. These efforts all tend to posit a national spiritual ideal that becomes debased in a section of society or the church. Power then becomes concentrated in the debased section. In her essay, Creative Suffering, the spiritual ideal is the integration of plurality into unity, a strong Russian philosophical theme, religious philosophical theme. Those of a mystical temper understand the path to unity as, quote, the self-sacrifice of the greater to the less, the coming down out of heaven of the greater, the transfiguring of the less, and the elevation of the whole. In other words, the pattern of kenosis, thinosis, the theandric pattern. Those of the ascetic temper, on the other hand, seek to subordinate the many to the one through violence. The Bolsheviks were ascetics, and so were the Tatars. Ivan the Terrible was both a hyper-ascetic and an anarchic despot. In another essay, Prayer and Personality, the ideal, there framed as the personality of the Russian nation, is, quote, pure theocentricity, the persistent urge towards theocracy understood as the building up of the kingdom of heaven even here and now on earth and the passionate desire to raise the passing moment to the dignity of eternity, unquote. At certain historical moments, the national personality becomes debased, again under Ivan the Terrible, who pops up in all her schemes, and now in the USSR. Referring to the latter, she asserts that, quote, extreme state control is the most debased form of theocracy and the total integration of the whole life of every citizen within the life of the state is a debased form of theocentricity, unquote. Whilst de Besobre does not offer any kind of sustained critique of Muscovite political theology and still less its modern Russian reverberations, the Russian Orthodox Church does not escape censure for the part it has played historically in creating the conditions for an overweening state authority. In persistent trends in Eastern Christianity, she draws a distinction between the kenotic strain in Russian spirituality, which is expressive of the ideal of the humiliated Christ and embodied historically in the saints of Kiev and Rus, the 16th century holy fools, and the spiritual elders of the 15th and 19th centuries, and the so-called Josephan strain, referring to Joseph of Volokolamsk, which strives for the greatest possible participation of the church in the life of the state. In her view, the triumph of the Jos Josephites over the Transvolgan elders marked a fatal change in the church, the eclipse of humility by pride. This made the phenomenon of Ivan the Terrible possible, and for her, this was the beginning of what she calls national hubris. Ivan the Terrible, in turn, became the effective cause of the time of troubles, and in the 17th century, it produced the arrogant patriarch Nikon and the grievous spiritual disaster of the schism, which in turn made possible the subjugation of the church to the state by Peter the Great. What, though, of the mystics and kenotics in de Besobre's schemes, the Christians who uphold the higher form of the national spiritual ideal. What is their fate in polities where the debased version holds the power? Here we return to de Besobre's picture of the condition of the orthodox laity 
when spiritually alienated from their secular leaders and deprived of or isolated from the leadership of the institutional church and, in the case of persecuted Soviet Christians, the opportunity for corporate worship. She consistently argues that the spiritual ideal is preserved and the debased version of it spiritually overcome through the practice of the Jesus prayer, or what she calls constant prayer. The prayer of the heart trains a person, this is her, I'm summarizing her words here, the prayer of the heart trains a person to remain in the presence of Christ, to stand continually in the presence of Christ, and to live a fully conscious life in the personal dimension, those are her words, in a wordless dialogue with God. As she states in Prayer and Personality, theocentricity is the air such a person breathes, the pattern of his life is theocratic. Constant prayer frees the practitioner to participate in God's will, to be his maker's collaborator and friend. And the work in which the contemplative collaborates is no less than the work of the crucifixion, Christ's work of redeeming evil, or as she puts it, changing tragedy into beatitude. Thus the contemplative meets the evil of the degraded state in spiritual combat, both within the state, and I haven't got time to talk about another article where she sees uh, uh, second nations as also capable of engaging um, in spiritual combat against the fascist evil. De Basobra's most powerful account of what such spiritual combat looks like is her analysis of the torture of victim relationship in her early essay, Creative Suffering, and it stems directly from her own interrogations in the Lubyanka prison. The Soviet examining officer is a sadist who exhibits diabolical cleverness in inflicting mental torture on the person he is interrogating, and de Basobra's interrogators were naturally all male. The only way to make the torture stop is to make yourself uninteresting to your interrogator by failing to react to all his provocations because your reaction is what gives him intimate delight and feeds his sadism. This demands of the prisoner a painful heightened awareness. By an intense effort of sympathetic insight into the entirety of your present situation, that's a quote, you must be present to every trivial detail of the event. You must penetrate the mind of your interrogator to the maximum possible extent. And you must integrate this data into what de Basobra calls the breadth of God's composition for this particular event on earth, which I take to, I take to mean contemplating what is happening, sub specie eternitatis. This can only safely be done, that is, without succumbing to hysteria, fear or despair in what de Basobra calls a mood of complete selflessness, which I take to mean something like apathia or detached state of the contemplative. Once this state has been achieved, she says, you realize that you have been privileged to take part in nothing less than an act of redemption. Serenity now flows, but for you, this is secondary to your direct and positive work of redeeming the deed. The power relationship between the torturer and his victim is reversed as the torturer, who is himself enduring, quote, a peculiar and sinister form of disintegration of the personality through power, becomes the object of the detached yet comprehending and sympathetic therapeutic gaze. Concluding now, uh, during the last decade of her life, de Basobra made notes and drafts towards a project called Alyosha's Way, which was intended to distill a lifetime's meditation on the past, present, and future significance of constant prayer. Like many of her generation, de Basobra read Dostoevsky as a Christian seeker and a prophet. For her, Alyosha Karamazov, the novice monk whom his elder Zosima sends into the world, became a national paradigm for the lay Orthodox Christian in Stalin's USSR, and more broadly for all Christians seeking to stand continually in the presence of God in an environment beyond the monastery walls, her expression, in which not only the monastery, 
but also the institutional church and even Christianity itself in the sense of a shared national endeavor may be compromised or even have ceased to exist. A handwritten fragment in de Basobre's archive reads, this is no underground church, no reverting to catacomb Christianity in a technological age. This is a church that flowers where it preeminently should in our post-Christian era, in the heart and mind of Christian men and women who incidentally never foregather and who seldom know each other by name, be it even by their baptismal names. They are on no church lists, either as contributors or supporters. They link minds in Christ through prayer. They give each other constant support through utter self-dedication. This, it seems to me, is a vision of a nation beyond nation and a church beyond church, inspired by de Basobre's perhaps unique experience as a Russian lay orthodox contemplative of the end of imperial orthodoxy and the life of internal and ex external exile that followed from it. Thank you very much. This is a talk about Rowan Williams, Dostoevsky, and his famous interpreter, Mikhail Bakhtin, with a few projected images and quotable prayer words to guide us along the way. In 2008, Rowan published his book on Dostoevsky. In its opening sentence, he notes his debt to Bakhtin's Problems of Dostoevsky's Poetics, 1929. My intent here is to reverse the flow, Bakhtin's debt to Rowan Williams. In what sense is this a debt? Because an archbishop on research leave was free to investigate topics that Bakhtin, an orthodox believer writing in an atheist state, was not. Thus, Rowan joins Ruth Coates, Christianity and Bakhtin, God and the Exiled Author, Cambridge University Press, 1998, in recuperating Christian subtexts to Bakhtin. But Rowan focuses on Dostoevsky, not on the critic. According to Bakhtin's editor and disciple, Sergei Batsharov, this recuperation was a very necessary thing. In 1970, Bakhtin told Batsharov that his Dostoevsky book was morally flawed I severed form from the main thing, he said. I had to dodge back and forth. I could not touch what Dostoevsky agonized about his whole life, the existence of God. Now, Rowan doesn't dispute this bit of memoir, but he does push back against its overly modern and secular sound. In the conclusion to his Dostoevsky book, Rowan repeats one of its main themes, that Dostoevsky was not really interested in the question in general terms of whether God exists. God exists. Rather, Dostoevsky's interest as a polyphonic novelist was in human behavior, how self-aware sinners, <coughs> believers, and atheists act in the presence or presumed absence of an absolute. Now, in my longer essay, I developed this thesis in detail, but for this talk, only a few highlights. So here are the highlights, and there are three of them. First, Bakhtin's toolkit for Dostoevsky. These are all words we've heard. They've been banded around for half a century. Polyphony, dialogue, idea persons, coexistence and interaction as an ideal, and how Rowan opens them up in his book, The Edge of Words. Then, Rowan and Tough Love the case against an overly rosy Bakhtin, how Rowan concentrates on the losers, Prince Mushkin in The Idiot and Nikolai Stavrogin from The Devils, rather than on the winners, like Zosima or Alyosha Karamazov. And third, the demonic versus the iconic. The devil, says Rowan, is always a disincarnating force the icon because it leads to somewhere utterly strange, 
is a connecting and incarnating force. Along the way, I mentioned some recent work on Dostoevsky and Bakhtin that both brightens and darkens Rowan's thesis. My selection was shaped by a pandemic era Zoomed reading group on personhood in which these two scholars participated along with Rowan Williams. In my longer essay, but not here, I discuss the problem of carnival, one of Bakhtin's very big ideas, and its subset in Dostoevsky, the scandal scene. Bakhtin loves those scenes, especially when icons are being violated. But Rundle doesn't, Rowan doesn't particularly care for them. And the reason he doesn't is that he says in his own book that icons are to remind us that our lives are serious. Bakhtin's carnival gives seriousness a bad name, linking it to power, violence, exploitation, monologism. And I try to straighten that out. For Bakhtin himself considered both the crucifixion and his own survival in Stalinist Russia to be carnival miracles. So now to review Bakhtin's toolkit and its pitfalls. Its big ideas are two. First, polyphony. A polyphonic novel is multi-voiced, says Bakhtin, decentered, made up of idea persons, each with fully weighted words equal in authority to the authors. Then dialogue. It too is decentered. We are all in constant verbal flux. I can talk, but I don't know who I am until you respond to me. This is a point Rowan makes eloquently in his Being Human, that we are dependent creatures. We receive before we can give. We receive from parents, from language. It's risky to receive, but we must receive that risk. Thus, the primary dialogic virtues are coexistence and interaction. But immediately questions arise. Is there a moral dimension to polyphony? Not really. In a podcast, as, as Archbishop Rowan defended the wisdom of a polyphonic worldview, saying that polyphony is a plurality, not a chaos. And the reason it's a plurality is because there's always a concealed holiness somewhere in a polyphonic text. Dostoevsky's novels need that concealed holiness because they make use of awful stuff, murder, child abuse, prostitution, as devices to set philosophical ideas in motion. Personal histories and linear plots don't matter much to Dostoevsky, so says Bakhtin. Thus, endings and resolutions are artificial. Bakhtin doesn't analyze whole novels, only snippets of talk. But what about what isn't talk? space, gesture, silence, or the workings of grace. Bakhtin's toolkit was revolutionary. We no longer had to worry about Dostoevsky's unappealing personal ideologies, Russian chauvinism, racism, anti-Catholicism, anti-Semitism. Those were all options, but the author was out of it. At most, a polyphonic author orchestrates voices, but does not dictate. The characters and the readers create their own unities. And at this point in my larger essay, I compare Bakhtin and Rowan as critics. They share a lot in common. Both are inclusive, non-judgmental, reluctant to close down a person or a text. This was touched upon this morning in Lucy's paper, and in general, it's been, I think, a theme of our gathering. These are pastors rather than prophets. But it's more than just being tolerant. They work with similar structures of the self. As Joshua Heath has pointed out in his work on Rowan's metaphysics and Russian thinkers, in this model, there is no trapped or static essence, no isolatable core of unmoving interiority. Right things change constantly, and there are multiple right things. During an interview in 1971, Bakhtin remarked that in the world of serious scholarship, there are very few mistakes. Instead, there are positions with which one can agree or disagree. When asked about Dostoevsky's basic idea, Bakhtin provided two variants. 
First, that truth could never be revealed within the bounds of an individual consciousness. And second, that Dostoevsky did not acknowledge any sort of finishedness. Those were Bakhtin's own ideals, and Rowan, I think, shares some of this ground. One reviewer has called it his widely consultative approach to the world of ideas. If something is amiss in others, then only by a bit, or because it's not quite right. It's not an outright mistake, it's only a position. The aim is not ideological purity, but environmental diversity. Neither Bakhtin nor Rowan are especially interested in having enemies. What is remarkable about both Rowan and Bakhtin on Dostoevsky, and the reviewers have called them both on this, is their conviction that diversity is a devoutly Christian idea. As does Bakhtin, Rowan takes dialogue, interchange, open-ended relation, and shapes them into a Trinitarian model. I talk to you, a third outside us, anchors us. That's our real life situation from minute to minute. How this multi-sided polyphony works in a novel, however, is tricky. At the end of his Dostoevsky book, Rowan suggests that polyphony might be seen as a type of kenosis, and I quote, the novelist attempts what is in one way an obviously impossible task, a self-emptying in respect of the characters of the fiction, a degree of powerlessness in relation to them. Still, Rowan writes, polyphony hints at what divine creation might be like. One scholar who's considered this hint is Randall Poole in his essay on the apophatic Bakhtin. That's the first of our reading group scholars. Randall Poole, in a sense, does for Bakhtin what Rowan Williams has done for Lossky, that is, looks at the apophatic not as a light darkness, knowledge, ignorance, but as a process, as a possible communion. Randall Poole examines humility in terms of being a human subject. To be a subject, says Poole, means to need the help of others. This other can be my future self, or God, or you. Such power-sharing gestures are at the heart of Bakhtin. Not pretending to control and not pretending to know guarantee our humility. We need each other's help, but exactly how to help remains a mystery, for one thing is certain. If I am made in the image and likeness of God, then you and I are unknowable. This is what Bakhtin's open-endedness or unfinalizability means. Bakhtin grounds humility then in carnival laughter, in the neediness of each of us for every other person. This isn't Rowan's root, but both would agree that we do not need to know God in order to unite with him. The goal is not intellectual mastery, union in the sense of getting control over an object, but simply an encounter. And thus to empty out our discursive mind is not to impoverish it. It's simply not to know what's coming next. So what in Bakhtin does Rowan accept, transcend, rework, or choose to ignore? Unlike Bakhtin, he reads the novel's whole. He cares intensely how plots end and focuses on images and scenes as much as on spoken words. Like Bakhtin, he embraces dialogue, interchange, the ideal of open-ended relation. To be sure, the dynamics and symbols are somewhat sacralized, as we see by the chapter titles, Christ is Truth, Devils, Exchanging Crosses, Sacrilege, and Revelation. The pivotal chapter three, Dialogue and Recognition, is the one most infused by Bakhtin. And the best backstory to chapter three came a few years later in The Edge of Words. Consider the subtitle, God and the Habits of Language. Rowan argues that language, like God, is best understood as an everyday habitual practice. Of course language is difficult to get right, so is God. But we should rejoice at this because words mean too much, not too little. When do we go to the edge of a word or to the word's edge? When we estrange it, Rowan says, when we put it under pressure, as in metaphor, poetry, irony, or when we talk of God. For Bakhtin, edges are also interpersonal boundaries. 
in his cosmos, to give value to an edge means that all vital verbal activity happens at the boundaries of concrete speech acts or concrete listening acts between concrete persons. Rowan's Dostoevsky book combines both types of edge, and extremity that estranges us, and an interpersonal boundary. But Rowan is never far from the human subject at prayer. The edge of words devotes an entire chapter to silence as an utterance. Bakhtin, however, is not good with silence. It's as if he never wants words to end. More words can always make it better. Perhaps this is the natural result of living in a society that shot so many of its poets and criminalized so much speech. But about language as such, Bakhtin's is a very trusting and rosy worldview. And with that in mind, we move on to our Dostoevsky and heroes and what I call Rowan's tough love. It is, by and large, not rosy at all. Rowan, like Bakhtin, is a strong critic. He takes what he needs, and what he needs are the negative examples. Here it's instructive to juxtapose Rowan with a more recent study, also permeated by Bakhtin, and this is my second reading group scholar, Paul Contino's Dostoevsky's incarnational realism, finding Christ among the Karamazovs. Paul would agree with Rowan's statement that faith and fiction are deeply related, not because faith is a variant of fiction in the trivial sense, but because both are gratuitous linguistic practices. Gratuitous in the sense unexpectedly encountered, dependent upon a climate of trust or a gift of grace. We might even say, or at least I would say, that Rowan focuses on faith as a practice with the same intensity as Bakhtin examines the word as a practice. However, Rowan brings faith marvelously close to what, in his view, language does best, which is to create community, nourish the imagination through metaphor, and encourage us in times of stress and despair to go on. Paul Contino's book focuses on Alyosha Karamazov, the youngest brother in a desperately dysfunctional family, and he's hardly a happy hero. But Alyosha is a winner, resilient, just, courageous, temperate, prudent. In contrast to that luminous carrier of the cardinal virtues, Rowan devotes most of his attention to two of Dostoevsky's most spectacular losers, Prince Mushkin from The Idiot and Nikolai Stavrogin from The Devils. Consider the endings of these two books on Dostoevsky. And here we have a picture of Paul Contino presenting his Dostoevsky book to Pope Francis last May. Paul ends his book by urging us to reread Dostoevsky so that his words might be made flesh in your ordinary life. Rowan Williams ends his by encouraging us to read the novels as moral and spiritual pedagogy about what the dissolution of culture means. The Dostoevsky novel, Rowan writes, is an exercise in resisting the demonic and rescuing language. Now note the darkness of this definition. The demonic cannot be ignored as mere metaphor or illusion, and language is in need of being rescued. But this is a luminous darkness, so Rowan sets out to track the demonic. What's constant is that the demonic always disincarnates. It persuades you that you don't need a body or that the one you have is worthless or paralyzed. Without a body, you lose a sense of limits. You can't get any traction. So the devil's starting point is an incurably divided and shamed ego that cannot commit to any self-defining acts. Speaking for Dostoevsky, Bakhtin calls this atheism, which he defines as an indifference toward an ultimate value that might make demands on us. This is the irresistible but totally impotent Nikolai Stavrogin, who ends his life by suicide. The indifference of the apathetic body is far worse than the witnessing of a committed body, even if that committed body hurts. Dostoevsky was an epileptic. Bakhtin suffered from a bone disease his entire adult life that resulted in the amputation of his right leg. 
These creators in pain loved life, but not the healthy, paralyzed, diabolical Stavrogin, who had come to an end. Against the diabolical is the holy icon, and this is our third and final highlight. An icon orients us with its gaze, looks out at us, pulls us into an utterly strange world, compels us with new eyes to belong to that community. Rowan and Bakhtin both agree on the diabolical in Dostoevsky, although Bakhtin, in his atheist context, calls this space the underground. However, on Prince Mushkin, the hero or anti-hero of the idiot, they do not agree. So first, Bakhtin's position. Bakhtin reads Mushkin conventionally as an icon of Christ, although an inadequate one. Mushkin, says Bakhtin, is a master of the penetrated word, a word penetrated by the Holy Spirit. Such a word can interfere in another's internal demonic dialogue and help that person find their own and truer voice. Because of this gift, Bakhtin says, Mushkin fears the finalizing effect of his utterances. He is horrified that he might speak a decisive and ultimate word about another person and close that person down. Thus, Mushkin is the dialogic principle incarnate, responsive to sinners and bestowing grace from without. But incarnation is precisely the problem. Elsewhere, Bakhtin writes that Mushkin remains on life's tangent. He lacks the necessary flesh of life that would permit him to occupy a specific place because then he would crowd other people out of that place. But still, Bakhtin insists there's a pure humanness to Mushkin a wholeness and integrity, an aura around him that is bright and almost joyful. He is in a carnival paradise. Now, Rowan sees all this clearly, and he'll have none of it. With his usual tact, he suggests that Bakhtin, and I quote, does not seem to give weight to the negative side. He is a bit sentimental about Mushkin. He ignores features that make the prince incapable of a proper Bakhtinian unfinishedness <laughs> and interdependence. And that's, I think, too gently spoken. Rowan cuts Mushkin absolutely no slack. It's not a one book thing. He's been hounding and discrediting Mushkin for decades. <laughs> in, the, in the Clark Lectures, published as Grace and Necessity in 2005, the idiot prince is singled out as an enigmatic character who, quote, is in one sense an embodiment of Christian gentleness, but it is a gentleness so deeply flawed by lack of self-knowledge, confused desire, and passivity. Mishkin will not commit himself, he won't choose, which means he doesn't wish to be seen. And Rowan insists that there can be no incarnation without the courage to risk being seen. To be visible is to be vulnerable. So visibility is a type of responsibility. Here on this question of visibility, Rowan has some fascinating interlocutors. One of them, the Dostoevsky scholar Denis Chernikleyev, there's another meaning of our reading group, has argued that Prince Mushkin is first of all an esthete, a secular artist, a calligrapher. After all, he falls in love not with an idea or an icon, but with a photograph. Mushkin is corrupted by an Augustinian lust of the eyes. He seduces others with his sentimental stories, whereas, according to Jernikleyev, the right sort of Christian love is either blind or obedient to the non-aesthetic truth of revelation. This argument recall, recalls Kierkegaard's three stages of existence, aesthetic, ethical, and religious, with the idiot prince stuck hopelessly in the first stage, immediate pleasure perdition. So where are we with the ethics of vision? Visibility, being seen, is necessary for responsibility. That's a primary premise of Rowan's book. But the act of seeing can be a trap. Rowan Williams might not go as far as the trap, but he does present Mushkin as a blocked or defective icon with one-way obsessions rather than two-way vision. Mushkin fails as Jesus did not fail. Namely, he lacks a position that has been shaped by experience and choice. In chapter nine of Rowan's Looking East in Winter, Mushkin does not even qualify as a holy fool. 
your Lord Devi Christaradi. At best, Mushkin is a holy simpleton, that is, not someone who's deliberately adopted eccentricity as an ascetical strategy, does not set out to shock or instruct. His actions and his failures to act bring not only confusion, but suffering and unredeemed disaster. Now, this might not be quite as tough a love as Zhernikleev's, but it's tough enough. Rowan's critique has been consistent over several decades. Is it fair? That's hard to say. In my reading of him, Rowan Williams has always cared deeply about a disciplined and precise Christology. The incarnation is not about omnipotence, guarantees, or feeling good. It is about being in a body, and being in a body always brings limits and surprises. Or as Rowan later illustrates this point, Christ is not a set of stories, but a narrative of vulnerability accepted. Now vulnerability and visibility are a good place to end, if only because these conditions leave us tragically exposed and neither solve any problems. But they do lead us to good questions and they open up a great deal in Bakhtin, such as the visible body must have a refuge. In his book on icons, one of his several, Rowan writes that the holy was not a refuge. It was a transition a transitional place, a borderland, something that required trust to cross over that boundary. But its vulnerability cannot be total. So second question, is there a safe refuge for bodies and for the embodied word? Are Dostoevsky's novels idealist? That is, do they hold out hope for universal harmony or are they centerless, nihilist, or something else? I end my larger essay on the question of tragedy, specifically absolute tragedy as the literary critic George Steiner defines it. And it's a good place to segue into our final paper of this panel by Joshua Heath on the Russian tragic imagination, specifically Sergei Bulgakov's. Of all Western literary genres, Steiner writes, tragic drama is the most rare and the least separable from religion. In chapter four of his book, The Tragic Imagination, Rowan, courteously as always, takes Steiner to task for his list of dramas that qualify as absolute. Steiner's error is one that an experienced practicing playwright like Rowan would see right away. These so-called absolute tragedies that Steiner identifies are all dramas, and yet Steiner treats each of them as if it were a text rather than a shared event. A text permits single consciousness analysis. It's the academic alone over our page proofs. Whereas dramas are unstoppable, multi-voiced performance encounters. If an event can be shared in words, if there's more than one actor, and if there's another person out there listening, it cannot be absolute tragedy. It's an encounter. And for this encounter, the persons of the Trinity are probably the most reliable, but in a pinch, you and I will do for each other. It's unstoppable and it goes on. Thank you very much. Uh, while I try and get my PowerPoint up, which I'm not quite sure I understand how I'm supposed to do. Um, I would, I'll use some of my minutes, my first minute, just to acknowledge two further debts other than the debt to Rowan. First is to repeat the debt of this conference to the fellowship, the mouse isn't working, uh, the fellowship of St. Alban and St. Sergius, um, who, without whose funding this conference would have been possible. And um, third is a personal debt, not just to Rowan, but to the other person who introduced me to Russian religious thought, Irina Kirilova, whose presence at this conference has meant so much to me. It was as a second year undergraduate wanting, thank you, to write a dissertation on um, Mikhail, names in Mikhail Bulgakov's novels that I first met Irina, who put me on to Metropolitan Antony of Soros's work. And Metropolitan Antony is a name who hasn't come up at this conference, but could have been in any one of the panels today so far, particularly as an advert, his recently published T.S. Eliot lectures on beauty and, and ugliness, I think with an introduction by Rowan Williams. Um, but so I'm not going to talk about um, Metropolitan Antony today. I'm going to talk about the Russian tragic imagination, in particular the case of Sergei Bulgakov. Much has been said about tragedy, 
funnily enough. Fortunately, not much has been said, at least in English, about the place of tragedy in Russian religious thought in the late 19th and 20th centuries. Yet a concern with the tragic unifies the group of thinkers that make up the so-called Russian religious renaissance. I therefore hope to bring together in this short paper two abiding themes in Rowan's corpus, the tragic imagination and Russian religious thought, with the focus, as I've said, on Sergei Bulgakov. The tragic is a cardinal feature of Bulgakov's spiritual and intellectual landscape. He asserts that the Christian worldview is necessarily tragic throughout his career and wonders in his autobiographical notes whether his tragic eros or tragic eroticism is excessive. Today, I can only unsatisfactorily address three questions that Bulgakov's tragic worldview poses. First and most obvious, how does Bulgakov understand tragedy? Second, what place does tragedy have, if any, in speaking of the Trinity? And finally, three, what difference does it make to think of human history as tragic? In considering these questions, I hope to situate Bulgakov's thinking on tragedy alongside Rowan's own. Both see tragedy as compelling the abandonment of seemingly fundamental assumptions about ourselves, our communities, the world, and God. I suspect, and this will come in my third section, that Bulgakov has a view of what can be retained from those assumptions, what can be retained in the midst of tragedy, particularly about the nation and its destiny, and this ties into what Ruth was saying, that would trouble Rowan. But both ultimately converge in seeing the tragic imagination as indispensable to a right attitude towards the future. So how does Bulgakov understand tragedy? Tragedy on stage is no longer enough for me. I shall transport it into my life, wrote Artaud in the Theatre of Cruelty. And Bulgakov, too, transports tragedy everywhere, into thinking as such, into biography and history. It is even a shadow within the divine life. What is it about tragedy that makes it so ubiquitous? A repeated, sorry, this image is from the production or the stage adaptation of um, Biesi, um, Demons, um, at the Moscow Art Theatre that Bulgakov saw and that provoked his essay, the Russian, um, the Russian Tragedy. But so what is it about tragedy that makes it so ubiquitous? A repeated element in Bulgakov's reflections on tragedy is the notion of fate. Bulgakov is explicit about the importance of fate in his 1914 article, The Russian Tragedy, written in response to that stage adaptation of Dostoevsky's Demons. In its inner meaning, the course and development of tragedy is determined not by the human being with their personal drama, but by a superhuman law, a certain divine fatum, which carries out its sentence with inexorable power. This divine law is the true hero of tragedy. Now, Rowan resists, as you'll see, um, no, I've gone too far forward. There it is. Um, Rowan resists, with Hegel's blessing, the reduction of tragedy to the confrontation between human beings and external necessity or fate. And it does not appear from the quotation from the Russian tragedy that Rowan has an ally in Bulgakov here. However, despite what the language of fate initially suggests, I do not think that Bulgakov ultimately endorses such a view of tragedy. Consider Bulgakov's reflections on another play, Pushkin's Mozart and Salieri, which was, and there was a production of it in 1915 at the Moscow Art Theater. Bulgakov writes that Pushkin's play is a true tragedy in which the furthest elements of the human spirit are laid bare. In particular, Mozart and Salieri is a tragedy about friendship. And then Bulgakov goes on to define friendship, a la Pavel Florensky, in Pillar and Ground of the Truth, as an ecstasy out of oneself into another, the friend, and the acquisition of oneself in them, a certain actualization of by hypostaticity. There's always these debates about how to translate hypostasinist, and I think we've actually, we, whatever. Um, <laughs> that's how I've done it. And therefore, the overcoming of limitation by self-denial. Mozart and Salieri is a tragedy because it shows the corruption of friendship by envy and its, self -destruct and its destructive consequences. Just as Judas' betrayal of Jesus is also a death sentence for Judas himself by his own hand, so is Salieri's envy not only deprived him of Mozart, but also of himself. In Bulgakov's words, he commits spiritual suicide. There is no invocation of a divine fatum in this essay. Instead, the tragedy arises from a demonic corruption of the movement of love toward the other, into a movement of self-love that reinforces rather than abolishes limitation. The demonic, in fact, appears in nearly all Bulgakov's discussions of the tragic, as opposed to a divinely imposed fate. But tragedy arises in the demonic turning of the modes of communion, love, beauty, the body, etc., into modes of self-assertion. And here we can see a parallel with this idea of the demonic as disincarnating, because this self-assertion is the denial of those edges of, of the self that Carol was talking about. And so tragedy here operates on two levels. There is the irony that the turn away from the other towards the self 
leads to the loss of the self. And there is the further irony that this turn to and loss of the self is accomplished through what is a, a corrupted love, but is nonetheless a love, a love turned against itself. And something like fate does begin to come into view here, insofar as human subjects in a fallen world, acting out of love, nonetheless find themselves trapped in this tragic isolation. Bulgakov's paradigm, Bulgakov's Judas, the paradigm of tragedy illustrates the point. For Bulgakov, it was not lowly avarice, but a love for Jesus as the one who would restore Israel that compels his betrayal and the help this would accelerate the restoration of the kingdom. As well as again, as in Mozart and Salieri, and as Carol was saying, jealousy, envy towards the beloved disciple. And those are quotes below there. So instead of a confrontation between human subjects with external fate, tragedy seems to be the almost invariable corruption of loving action in a hostile environment. There is something of a resonance here with McKinnon's insistence that the most purely intentional acts regularly produce lethal damage, and that's Rowan's paraphrase from the tragic imagination. But I don't think that this needs to trigger a Milbankian concern with the dissolution of the very possibility of plot as such. For the plot of creation abides, and here's the quote from Bulgakov at the bottom, both the path of a good without sin and the path of a sinful departure from good, coupled with sin's eventual overcoming, turn out, despite their differences, to be equivalent. So the fundamental end of temporal pro process, the plot of creation, that God will be all in all, remains unimpeded by global tragedy. And this is because, for all that Bulgakov will elsewhere describe tragedy as the confrontation between good and evil as, quote, primordial forces, as we have seen, this confrontation between good and evil remains the confrontation of love and, albeit corrupted, love. So it is with Salieri, Judas, and even Lucifer, whose hatred is, Bulgakov asserts, a form of love. As such, tragic estrangement and isolation are recuperated by Bulgakov's scheme within the movement of divine love towards unification and identity in the other. This is how we can understand Bulgakov's assertion that tragedy, the tragic relation to the world and life, cannot be eliminated from the religion of the cross. The cross is, on the one hand, the extremity of Christ's isolation from his disciples, from his people, and his father. It is the tragic estrangement of the world, whose foundation and end is love, from its own fulfillment at a maximal intensity. In this, the cross is the paradigmatic tragic event. But Christ's extremity of isolation is the inverse mirror of Lucifer's extremity of isolation. Lucifer's extremity of isolation is born of self-assertion. Christ is born not of self-assertion, but of identification with the other, the other of fallen humanity and the other of the Father. Christ's isolation is the isolation of a willing sacrifice. And through this notion of sacrifice, Bulgakov converts this tragic isolation into one extremity in the movement of love, self-renunciation, self as we saw in the quote about friendship, for the other, whereby one finds oneself in the other. This logic is what informs Bulgakov's retrojection of the tragedy of the cross into the tragedy of the generation of the son by the father, and the quotes up there. The mutual relation of the father and the son in its immediacy is the tragic side of love. In unsurprisingly von, Balthasar, von Balthasarian fashion, because as has been established, von Balthasar, well, he himself has footnotes to Bulgakov in the Paschal Mystery, but he took Bulgakov's cruciform approach to the Trinity seriously, so it's not surprising that we find these resonances. But the distance between father and son upon the cross is, in kind of to use a Rowanish phrase, held within the distance between the father and the son in the Trinity, a distance that is covered by the mutual recognition of father and son in the procession of the spirit. This converts tragic distance into the intensity, the extent of loving identification with the other. And this is that final quote from the comforter. Being tragic, love is also the overcoming of tragedy. And in this consists the power of love. It is a concrete antinomy, sacrifice and the attainment of oneself through sacrifice. And this blessedness of love in the Holy Trinity, the comfort of the comforter, is the Holy Spirit. So reading tragedy via the cross into the Trinity does not assert impossible knowledge of the Godhead, I don't think. Instead, it asserts that in a fallen world, we have access to the fullness of personality, loving personality, through its seeming destruction. And this opens the way to an interpretive stance towards one's own life and the life of the world that profoundly unsettles habitual evaluations of success, 
progress, and so on. This is the kind of hermen the tragic hermeneutic principle that Bulgakov articulates in his essay on Judas. The deeper the death, the more pitch dark the night, the more hopeless the death, the brighter the light will light up in it. If it is true that only good, only love is substantial, that evil is not a primordial force in opposition to God, then Bulgakov seems to argue we must be able to look into evil with confidence, that we will be able to discern some way in which divine purpose will not merely accommodate itself with evil, but work itself out through it. And I can't help but think of that phrase from de Beausor of the transformation of tragedy into beatitude. So tragedy is always, for Bulgakov, an instance of divine speech, not merely in the sense of a content from on high that must be humbly accepted, but as the father's speaking of the son, the eruption of the life of God into the life of fallen creation. The death of Bulgakov's son is an instance of divine utterance. The Bolshevik revolution and ensuing civil war likewise such an utterance. And the task that faces the human subject in such tragic moments is to work to hear what is being said in what appears to be unspeakable. And those are those two quotes in the middle there. He says of the death of his son, in that moment I learnt how God speaks. I understood what the phrase God has spoken means. And as his figure of the refugee urges in his dialogue beneath the walls of Herson, when confronted with the crisis of a Russia riven by revolution and civil war, quote, we must attend to the divine voice. We must be attentive to the wisdom of events and discern in them the judgments of God. Indeed, in his Beneath the Walls of Herson, Bulgakov's refugee clarifies in terms redolent of Rowan's own discussion of tragedy that what tragedy teaches is the contingency and deceptiveness of apparently certain knowledge of the self, the nation, the church. And that's the penultimate quote on this slide. I have paid for my words, i.e. his declaration that Russia must leave orthodoxy in this, after the revolution in this instance. I have paid for my words with sufferings that you cannot imagine. For it is not easy to recognize the marks of the temporary and the transitory in what one believed was universal and eternal. It is not easy to take leave of oneself. And to complete this, this like Bulgakov's tragic hermeneutics, if the tragic is an, insist, is an instance of divine utterance, then Bulgakov correspondingly insists that even if tragedy entails a dissolution of our apparent self-knowledge, it never entails the impossibility of action. The Trinitarian recuperation of tragic diremption into the movement of loving union for Bulgakov means that there is always an opportunity for action within tragedy. And so Bulgakov calls a tragic worldview the most energetic of worldviews. However, there had to be a however at some point, it is not clear to me that this tragic hermeneutics necessarily secures this work of renouncing what we thought we knew in the face of extreme undoing. After all, why does such an interpretive procedure not simply result in an affirmation of what we thought we previously knew? If the intensity of apparent failure is made an index of actually real transcendent success, then cannot every encounter with resistance to our seemingly inviolable and sacred purposes simply reinforce rather than challenge the perceived inviolability of those purposes? If my life is going wrong, maybe that's a sign that everything, I'm actually doing everything right, seems to be where we might end up with Bulgakov's um, tragic um, interpretive mode. And indeed, this again recalls McKinnon's demonstration of how the ironies of the Johannine narrative become, become grounds for an unironic anti-Semitism. The convertibility here of darkness and light can lead as much to self-questioning as to a reinforcement of unexamined certainties, since what appears to be negation and challenge is in fact affirmation and encouragement. It seems to me that such a danger is realized in Bulgakov's approach to the tragedy of the Bolshevik Revolution. Alan Smith writes tellingly that Bulgakov holds tenaciously in his text on Judas and the Revolution onto the apostolic vocation of his own. And that's telling, holds tenaciously onto this um, belief in that apostolic vocation. And in Bulgakov's own words, it was the betrayal of Judas that brought it about that Christ was sacrificed on the cross as a new Paschal lamb at the Paschal feast. And the murder of Christ in hearts and souls in Russia hides Christ's resurrection. I wonder whether Bulgakov's position here muddies the waters between affirming that the ultimate reality of love will invariably express itself even in the atrocities of revolution and civil war, and affirming that the fulfillment of divine purpose must look like this. And one consequence of this, it seems to me, is an apparent failure to reckon with the particularity of tragic circumstance, a common charge against tragic 
um, approaches. For what is really going on in Russia is that Christ is being resurrected. So, you know, it's, all, it's gonna be okay, really. Um, and it leaves unscathed the fundamental assumption of Russia's singular apostolic vocation. And on this abiding insistence on Russia's distinctive apostolic vocation, it is not clear to me whether Bulgakov's grappling with the tragedy of the Bolshevik Revolution really entailed what Rowan describes as rethinking what it means to take up a position as such. And again, I was struck by parallels with the paper on Yulia de Beausobre, in particular that very detailed practice of attention in the interrogation room, as opposed to this kind of sublating everything into you know, a triumphant narrative. And also this idea of the nation beyond the nation is what happens to this belief in the nation in the midst of tragedy, rather than just saying, yeah, no, Russia, Russia's still you know, a senior apostle because it's less innocent than the others because it, it, it wielded the knife, is what Bulgakov seems to be saying. So arguably then, Bulgakov's future the future for Russia, the, the, you know, the future for the world, is a lot thicker than the future that emerges for Williams when passed through the crucible of tragedy. One feature of the tragic imagination in other works by Rowan is what I consider a sort of transcendental or regulative form of argumentation, which elucidates the implicit or assumed conditions of a given habit or mode of action, in this case, tragic representation. So tragedy for Williams, by its very nature as representation, speaks against the notion of a suffering so extreme that it cannot in some way be shared. Likewise, tragedy is understood by McKinnon, must, Rowan argues, admit of a future. Quote, if acts and events are uncontrollable in their effect, we are affirming in that acknowledgement that anguish and atrocity do not make a future impossible. They may shape a future that is profoundly, perhaps incurably damaged for at least some, but they do not stop things happening. The future affirmed by tragedy, it seems to me, is as, as, as Rowan at least elucidates it, is thus almost a formal future. Um, and in this respect, I don't think that Williams would necessarily concur with the more contentful or programmatic future that Bulgakov sees affirmed for the church or indeed for the nation state by a tragic worldview. But Rowan might tell me I'm wrong on that. It is on this question of the future that I would like to end. A good theology is a theology able to look with honesty at the failure and guilt and pain of the world we are in and yet say we are still called. We are still in the hands of a creator. We have a future. This is uh, Rowan speaking in the, at the end of his first paddock lecture in 2019. If I have understood the stakes of Rowan's insistence of the, on the value of the tragic imagination, then he seems to be saying that both actions in this proposition, to look and to say, are impossible without such a tragic imagination. An insistence on absolute tragedy is all looking at horror and no saying. A theology that does not take the tragic seriously risks becoming all saying and no looking. But to continue to paraphrase Rowan, the future that such a confident theology would affirm is all the weaker for not having looked seriously at the tragic, at what threatens the imagined future. To confront what tragedy insists we see is to step into the future on a surer footing even if the future that emerges from that crucible is a lot more meager than we would like it to be. But in this, I do believe that Bulgakov and Rowan's tragic imaginations share a fundamental affinity, despite the hesitations I've expressed. For as Bulgakov repeatedly reminds us, the goal of his work is that the church might pray with hope toward the future, even so, come Lord Jesus. In this respect, both Rowan and Bulgakov's work are admittedly by Rowan's own definition, good theology. I'm not sure if you're allowed to do that, but... <laughs> Indeed, both Rowan and Bulgakov's work are thoroughly good theology on that definition, and I will end by saying I suspect that we already knew that. Thank you. Allow me to thank, on behalf of all of us, our three presenters for their uh, papers which have opened up to us the depths of these figures who are essentially, like Rowan, their commentator, uh, theologians. The fourth century writer Evagrius Ponticus reminds us that the true theologian is the one who prays. And each of the figures of whom we have heard together with Rowan, I feel, are those whose thought is always filtered through 
the uh, medium of prayer, of contemplation, and of hopeful expectation of transformation through uh, the presence of God. And perhaps it is all the more important in these days that we have such things to look at, especially those of us coming from within the Russian Orthodox tradition. Mention was made by Joshua of Metropolitan Antony of Suroj. Uh, for those of us, myself included, who were formed and trained by Metropolitan Antony, and indeed many others here, the kind of ideas which we have heard expressed were completely normative. This was what drew us and attracted us towards the spirituality and tradition of the Orthodox Church as expressed in the tradition of Russian Orthodoxy. And when we hear your papers, it gives us hope that there might yet be the possibility to see this again as something central to our own church's understanding of what it is itself. So I thank you very much. I'm sure Rowan will want to make his comments on the presentations. Another amazingly rich assortment of reflections. And once again, my most heartfelt thanks for this. And um, Stephen, if I may, thanks personally to the Fellowship for their support for this event. Many years ago, I speculated on the possibility of somebody, probably not myself, writing a short story in which the characters in Thomas Hardy's novels put in an application to be transferred to another novelist <laughs> <laughs> on the grounds of generally unfair treatment. <laughs> on, the, on the basis of that kind of um, class action, I feel I'm sort of waiting for the uh, defamation case from Prince Mishkin's lawyers, <laughs> as Carol put it. But I have a couple of basic questions and just one um, nugget of reflection. One question arises, Ruth, from the way in which you talked a little bit about the theocratic in relation to Yulia de Basobre. Salviot, of course, speaks of free theocracy as the goal of um, the Christian vision and the Christian enterprise. And I just wondered whether you had any thoughts on how de Bosobre's reflections on theocracy and the sense she gives are both generated by and responding to something like Salviot's free theocracy, which is a, a puzzling term as it stands, one which uh, I think has baffled quite a lot of interpreters. I, I remember some lengthy discussions on this with another um, of my research students, Michael Miller, who was working on both Solovyov and Bulgakov. So that's just, just a, a question for possible further thought. Second question is really to ask whether Carol and Josh might engage a little bit on um, the, the overlap or the tension, or at least the sort of Venn diagram coincidence, between Calvary as carnival in the Bakhtinian sense, and Calvary as the tragic in Bulgakov's world. But that's just thinking of how the words struck me this afternoon. And a thought um, somewhere in the background of all of these um, wonderfully stimulating papers. Somebody said to me earlier today that one of the singular absentees from the discussion so far has been Simone Weil, um, a writer on whom I've had some things to say from time to time. And, of course, Simon Weil is one of the great analysts of and diagnosticians of power and suffering and the toxic interweaving of power and suffering. And I recall when I first read Yulia de Basobra's creative suffering essay, the way in which she very sen sensitively, very skillfully, draws out some of the seductions of a rhetoric which brings suffering and power together in a corrupt way. Um, because I suffer for you, I have power over you. Mm. She presents that as one of, one of the, the most tempting diabolical distortions of the gospel in respect of suffering. And it's just a reminder, I suppose, that um, 
mutuality. Well, I think it was Graham, wasn't it? Graham's paper, which said yesterday, there is a communication in the service of sin. There is a mutuality which can be, which can be toxic. And thinking about how mutuality works for healing, for life rather than for death, I think would make us look very hard at um, how Yulia de Bolsobre encourages us and enables us to do some diagnosis in that area. Um, so I just put that in as a, as a perspective, which, as I say, runs through a number of the writers, the situations, the, um, the ideas that have, that have surfaced here. And just a last very brief comment. Um, Sorry, I'm just checking my notes here. That phrase about the dissolution of culture, which, uh, Carol, you picked up from the Dostoevsky book, and the idea that we read Dostoevsky to help us cope with the dissolution of culture, um, connecting that with what Josh reminded us of in terms of the first generation of Russian emigres looking at uh, the dissolution of culture in a really rather strong sense, you might say. Um, I suppose that part of what I was driving at there with um, that way of characterizing how we might read Dostoevsky was something like this, that we read Dostoevsky to see something of what, what it looks like when communication and mutuality, given all their ambiguities, break down in utterly destructive, utterly competitive, or sometimes utterly indif mutually indifferent forms. That's how culture collapses. That's the way the world ends. Um, not with a bang, but with a sort of big bang which infinitely distances speaker from speaker, subject from subject. And Dostoevsky, as I've read him, as I think many read him, and Bartin reads him, pushes us back towards the sense of what it is we we cannot but owe one another. And that, I suppose, is why de Beausobre, Maria Skopcova, and so many others insistently bring us back to what is it that we inexorably owe one another? Because only that is what turns the dissolution of culture, threat, and reality on its head. Um. Now we're asked for a response from both Ruth and then from Carol and Joshua together. Ruth, would you like to? I don't know what, how it does. Can you hear me? <clears throat> yes. Um, actually, Solovyov was one of the few figures from the Russian religious philosophical tradition that de Brasobra wrote about. But in review articles for um, Time and Tide, I think, or um, a, a sort of periodical publication, not in any serious scholarly way. She was not a scholar. <laughs> um, she, had, um, she had a huge admiration for Solovyov. I think she saw him as she, at one point, she was going to dedicate a chapter of her book, Alyosha's Way, to Solovyov, as presumably, uh, and, and um, uh, Babington Smith's correspondence just have to speculate here, as presumably a figure who she felt in some way pursued that way himself in his own person. But she was quite critical, uh, to the extent that she wrote about him, she was quite critical of his theocratic project of the 1880s. Um, and uh, there's a little note in, I mean, I have to tell you that a lot of this late work of de Besobas, it's just handwritten notes, really. Um, there's a little note um, uh, indicating that Solovyov's weak point was monarchy. So um, uh, that's all I have to go on, really, but um, and he also that she would have disagreed with Solovyov. She, um, one of her closest friends states that she would have disagreed with Solovyov. 
um, on the need to um, reconcile the Catholic and the um, Orthodox churches on the institutional level, um, she felt that such a, a coming together could only happen on the charismatic level, on, on the level of prayer. So um, uh, to that extent, I, I think that's consistent with what she says in her published articles about a true theocracy being a, a coming of the kingdom um, in one's person. Um, what else could I say to that? Um, no, that's that's it really. Uh, I mean, I, I think that, no, no, I won't go on. There's, um, there's a connection, I think, to the symbolists, but uh, there's no need to make it here. I'll pick up I'll pick up on only one question, actually three words of Rowan's, how mutuality works. He makes a wonderful distinction in discussing types of sin, what types of sin are not diabolical. And he refers again to these scandal scenes where you have Russian thugs and looters breaking into churches and de defacing icons and selling them on the market. But as long as they know that they are violating a belief system into which they were born and which they endorsed, they were self-conscious criminals. This was a situation that permitted some sort of redemption. They are honest sinners. Whereas the diabolical, which is reserved for Stavrogan, there is no community to which he would wish to belong. And then I would like to say one thing in terms of carnival, which we skirted but did not really engage. All of <coughs> Bakhtin's carnival behavior, naughtiness and taking off and playing hooky and not turning up for work. And again, his carnival is not about sexual license, doesn't care all about that. It's all about having enough food to eat and having enough people around to replace the ones that have just been shot. I mean, it's a very Stalinist scenario, a very starving Stalinist scenario. So it's a certain type of plenitude that is absolutely not pleasure-seeking in the sense that the profligate West tends to think it is. All of those so-called sinners that behave in irregular ways, they're honest sinners because as Bakhtin points out, every carnival square, which was every marketplace, always had a church on the corner. Everything happened in view of a church and it was present there and it was after carnival time returned to with gratitude and veneration. That's how mutuality works. Uh, I'll just, this question of whether or not, um, what, what Bulgakov might, would be, Bulgakov be able to hold together Calvary as, as carnival and Calvary as tragedy. Uh, with, with Carol's more insightful view of carnival, the answer is maybe, but I, I think I actually, my, my, my somewhat often quite harsh reading on Bulgakov is that I think Bulgakov can be quite, a bit like Losev on Bakhtin, kind of, you know, very, very damning of his kind of flippancy. I think there's a certain prudishness to Bulgakov, actually. I mean, when he says that Picasso's cubism was demonic, um, you know, and that Picasso was possessed. I mean, when you listen to, um, to ben, Ben's presentation earlier, I mean, it's just crazy. And in the same way, I, I think that Bulgakov, you know, he wasn't very good at dealing with kind of ambivalence, things were either terrible or they were good. And it's one thing that I found in his reading his spiritual diaries. He very rarely holds two feelings together at once. He feels intensely one way one day and then feels very intensely one way the other. But um, I think for him, and I think you see it in, in the Lamb of God and some of the dis descriptions of the, you know, the, that cruciform shape of the Trinitarian life, he really does dwell on kind of just this absolute abjection. Um, conversely, um, you know, I, I was thinking when I was, about when I was writing this paper on his, again, real shrillness when discussing the idea of whether or not Christ could ever have been ugly. And he says, of course not. What a heretical thing to say. Christ must have been beautiful. Everyone looking at him must have thought this is the most beautiful man I've ever seen. And so I think that that's another indication of where I think he actually deals quite, for someone who meant, whose, whose mode of thinking is advocates being able to hold contradictory positions together, I think Calvary is, is tragic straightforwardly tragic, and, and I think he would struggle with Carnival in the same way that Christ just had to have been beautiful. Um, yeah, that would be... Not, not a grotesque body. No, no, I, no, I don't think he can cope with those. And now we must ask instructions as to how sacrosanct tea is. Um, 
we can take some questions. Yeah. I think if we have one, one um, five minutes or so. Um, Irina. I don't know how many are still alive who actually met Julia de Beausabre, but I do remember her. <laughs> I was very young, um, but she came when I was talking to Metropolitan Anthony. He wasn't Metropolitan then yet. But uh, what I do remember very, very clearly, and which motivated my desire to get up and make this very small, um, but I hope not unimportant contribution, is the extraordinary uh, luminosity that emanated from a person whom I don't remember very, very well. After all, it was actually about 75 years ago, so uh, my memory is... But no, it, does, it isn't the years. It's the fact that the uh, luminosity of her awareness of love, of prayer, of Christ, finally triumphing over what, um, and here I have to um, bring in the, uh, what Metropolitan Antony told me afterwards um, when we spoke repeatedly about Julia de Bosabr and her creative suffering. Uh, she concentrated on the darkness, the evil of the Bolshevik persecution, particularly of anyone who had faith, who had belief of the church. Um, it, it was a wholesale destruction of that aspect of uh, Russia. And Yulia de Bosabr felt it very, very deeply. And what I do remember far more clearly, I think, than her uh, presence, that of um, a very elderly, um, fairly nondescript woman. Um, there were quite a lot of Russian emigres of that sort around uh, at that time. But what I do remember very, very clearly is her memory of the darkness, the evil, um, aspects of which Dostoevsky does touch on in his work. But it was that darkness and that evil that were particularly important to Julia de Bosabr and where she spoke of the love and the prayer that alone and the awareness of Christ um, and all he did for us uh, that we have to bear in mind. One word about the Sievsky, Professor Emerson, thank you very much, <laughs> because I spent many, many years uh, working on uh, Dostoevsky, um, I, I never took it far enough, as I should have done, but Dostoevsky was always very concerned, it seems to me, to, um, and that was the effect of his early um, enthusiasm, and that is he wanted to see a kingdom uh, of God on earth. Um, he was absolutely wonderful in um, really um, divining and, well, as a psychologist, shall we say. Um, uh, yes, he, he, at one point, um, he's got one of his characters saying, yet, Janie Psycholog. But he was very much a psycholog. He knew about people. He knew particularly about their... Um, uh, their contrariness, uh, how they could be both good and very, very evil. And um, uh, that haunted uh, Dostoevsky. And he wanted, uh, even when he had found Christ, he had found the church, he still hankered after a kingdom of heaven on this earth. He never actually, he died perhaps too quickly for it, but he never actually told us, or maybe it just wasn't possible, how this could be achieved. It remains a mystery and a miracle. 
And that was something that worried Dostoevsky right to the very end. And that probably is why Mushkin, for all his virtues, for all his goodness, for all his attempts to be good, was such an unmitigated disaster. <laughs> he failed. Thank you. <laughs> you don't need to make a response. I think... <laughs> Do we have time for one more question? Do we have any more questions? In that case, okay. let us thank our speakers once again.
Well, welcome to the final panel, panel eight, which is on, and just think of this as a range of topics. We've already had an extraordinary range, but ancient philosophy, early Christianity, and contemporary theology. So, um, and uh, <coughs> just two introductory thoughts to that. Uh, one is that as I look at that, I just think of, I think, the piece of theology that I circulated to most students in the, par in the course of my teaching career was the postscript to Arius uh, of, of Rowan. So that, and it was such a, a wonderful way of really uniting all these. Um, and thank you very much, and very short as well. <laughs> but, and uh, it, it, was a, it was a great introduction to this whole area. Um, but the, the second thought is the um, is about Donald McKinnon. Uh, David Ferguson opened with a reference to Donald McKinnon. Uh, I think, Rowan, probably you and I both sat in lectures in this very room uh, <coughs> when Donald would be eating his pencils and so forth and, 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 and really you know, doing those extraordinary, extraordinary lectures that, 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 that he gave here, which sort of acted out the, the wrestle with the darkness of reality and, 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 and of course, with, with, with tragedy as well. <clears throat> and, um, the, and David also mentioned the, uh, the Women Are Up To Something, that uh, remarkable book about those four Oxford philosophers, in which there is one male hero, and it is Donald McKinnon. I mean, an extraordinary thing. And Donald, Donald was my supervisor, and I also remember the, the long supervisions in this building as well <laughs> that he would give. Um, but the relevance to this session is that is, is a question that Donald raised, which was, what would have been the case if, instead of Greek philosophy being the conversation partner for Christian theology, Greek tragedy had been? And that really relates to our previous session as well. It's an absolutely fascinating question, it seems to me. Um, I'm a classicist by training, and just to try to imagine what Aeschylus, Sophocles, and Euripides would have done uh, in relation to the whole of Christian theology, century after century, had we done it. But in many ways, Rowan, you have actually uh, uh, done both and in, in that as well. Um, so let me introduce now our... Uh, our, our speakers. Mark Edwards is Professor of Early Christian Studies in uh, Oxford University and uh, a fellow and tutor in Christ Church. Um, and he ranges through New Testament, patristics, Neoplatonism, Gnosticism, and more. Uh, <coughs> and he, um, his most recent book is The Problem of Evil in, uh, the, in the Ancient World. Um, and he also is to be congratulated on joining Rowan as a fellow of the British Academy uh, this year. Congratulations. <laughs> Moena Ludlow is professor of Christian history and theology in Exeter University and is an Anglican priest and canon theologian in Exeter Cathedral and is best known for her work on the Cappadocians. But there's a new angle on fourth century Christianity in her recent book, Art, Craft and Theology in Fourth Century Christian Authors, about the relationship of texts to paintings and sculptures in, in, in that period. Um, and Catherine Rowett is Emeritus Professor of Philosophy in the University of East Anglia with a specialty in Greek philosophy, and she's written on Plato's relationship to Socrates and was also a member of the European Parliament for the Green Party. Um, but her earlier work is elusive in the sense that she wrote it under a different name. Uh, Catherine Osborne is what you search for. If you want her books very relevant to our session, Rethinking Early Greek Philosophy and Eros Unveiled. So that's our speakers, and I'll invite Mark to begin. Hello, is that audible? Good. Well, it seems that without design on anyone's part, we've almost come full circle because I'm addressing the topic on which David Bentley Hart spoke so eloquently yesterday. 
and I have no intention of quarrelling with what either he or Rowan have written on the question of whether what computers do is really thinking. Um, probably it isn't, but I would, I would say that from the point of view of modern society, it probably doesn't matter very much whether it is or not. The question that artificial intelligence always asks, of course, is can a computer pass the Turing test? In other words, can a computer interact with the human being in such a way that the said human being does not know that he or she is interacting with a computer? Can we hand over to computers the things which humans at the moment are the, uh, are the only agents who can do? Can we hand them over to computers and see the computers do them at least as well as human beings can do them? And it's obvious that we are approaching that point if we haven't already reached that point in many walks of life. Um, it'll be perhaps five years before all university lectures are given by chatbots, um, which will surely be an improvement. Uh, about ten years before the undergraduates themselves are replaced by chatbots, and then <laughs> no, nobody will turn up to a tutorial without an essay anymore. So there's a lot to look forward to from an institutional point of view. But the question I want to raise is, in the meantime, as we wait uh, for, you know, to be put out to pasture, um, you know, what has a theologian got to be worried about in all this? Is there anything to be worried about? And I'd like to avail myself of the very useful distinction uh, that David Bentley Hart made yesterday between the old-fashioned physicalism of the 20th century, the very reductive physicalism that said that human beings are mere machines, and what's actually now being said by the proponents of artificial intelligence, which has nothing to do with mere machines, because mere machines aren't mere machines anymore. Now, machines are becoming human and on the way to becoming superhuman. There are two different issues involved, although perfectly possible um, for the same person to you know, hold um, both positions. Um, and this complementarity, the complementarity between what we might call reductivism and, on the other hand, an aggrandizement of the properties of the material, it goes all the way back, I think, at least you know, to the controversies that were initiated by Hobbes and Locke. Hobbes is very much the reductivist. Human beings are machines. And at least in the minds of the proponents of Hobbes, and I think Hobbes himself, that meant, for example, that such things as free will are really just illusory. The things we value about human beings, whether we're Christians or not, uh, the power to reason our way to true conclusions, the power to form our own objectives, disappear if we are merely uh, a, con a con contraption of pulleys and levers and wheels, which after all in Hobbes' day was all a machine could be. On the other hand, there was that terrifying thought that John Locke dropped into the essay on human understanding, book four, chapter three, maybe matter could think, or at least maybe God could endow matter with the capacity for thought, as Locke actually says. But what if matter, qua matter, were capable of thinking? The worry that arises from that, I think, is that if matter's capable of thinking, you don't need God. Because at least a standard apologetic said, that matter is inert, it needs something to move it before there can be a creation, before there can be a world. So, so long as matter is safely inert, then there's got to be a God. And in response to Hobbes and Locke, Christian theology seemed to work for a couple of centuries, still arguably philosophy of religion sometimes does work with a very old-fashioned quasi-Platonic or quasi-Cartesian model of inert matter on the one hand, uh, and on the other hand, the realm of the incorporeal, which includes both mind and God, and the incorporeal somehow or other acts upon the corporeal in order to make it move, and otherwise there just wouldn't be anything. Now that strict dichotomy between the material and the immaterial um, became hard to sustain, I think, at a fairly early point. There were already people in the 18th century, like Boscovich, who thought that atoms were better understood as fields of force than as tiny little particles. And by the time that you've got electricity and other forces being discovered in the 19th century and becoming part of the irreducible vocabulary of physics, um, then really a straightforward corporeal and corporeal distinction is hard to maintain. Well, along comes the 20th century, of course, with the theory of relativity, uh, with quantum theory, with chaos theory. Um, and we can't think of atoms as tiny little balls anymore or even little solar systems. Uh, we can only think of them really in mathematical equations, at least if we have enough mathematics to understand those equations and the uh, beautiful waves uh, that they generate. 
Um, and once you're thinking mathematically, then you know, the question of uh, whether this is mind or matter, as it were, um, starts to become just rather meaningless. I mean, obviously, in a sense, there is something mindful, as it were, about any mathematical equation. It just it has a meaning simply by virtue of being a mathematical equation. It's not just inert. Um, now, even beyond this revolution, there are some who would argue that we've gone one step further with the advance of information technology. There are two fields in which this has become, of course, extremely important. One is the biological field. Um, human beings, uh, as we know, are controlled to a greater or lesser degree, some would like to say determined, by their DNA. And a genome is defined, apparently, as the sum of all the DNA destructions, uh, instructions in a living organism. So we are ourselves, apparently, bundles of information. And then, of course, there are computers. And computers are all about information. That's what we mean by information technology. You talk about computers in terms of the exchange and synthesis of information. Now, if it's true that a human being is basically a bundle of information, um, some of which can perhaps be usefully uh, modified to create better human beings, um, then why not use that other bundle of information, a computer, uh, to create human beings where there were no human beings before? In other words, to actually manufacture human beings. Uh, it all seems perfectly plausible. Um, but the proponents or the uh, idolaters of information technology, one might say, some of them at least want to go even further than that. There's a whole metaphysic attached to this. Rather than talk in old-fashioned physical terms um, about matter, energy, whatever, why not talk about the entire universe? Why not talk about the whole of reality in terms of the exchange of information? And there are books like the one by John Gribben, which I mentioned on the handout, which would argue that there are certain phenomena which can only be understood, your real phenomena discovered by telescopes, definitely true, um, which can only be understood in terms of information technology rather than in more old-fashioned terms, even Einsteinian terms. And so computers, which themselves are the product of the quantum revolution and chaos theory, um, are also now able to shape our metaphysics, or at least so some people claim. And the, of the theological implications of this, of course, um, hardly need to be spelt out. ...which I haven't read and am never going to read, but I doubt that any of it is as theologically ambitious or informed as the book by Frank Tipler, which I mentioned uh, on the handout, uh, The Physics of Immortality. Now, Tipler was a distinguished physicist, a professor at Harvard University, made a number of contributions to the subject. Uh, in the eyes of his fellow physicists, this book was definitely not one of them. Um, this book had the same reception from physicists as Teilhard de Chardin's work had from professional biologists, and that's not a gratuitous comparison because Tipler himself is very interested in Teilhard de Chardin and trying to do uh, properly uh, with mathematics, pages and pages of mathematics, what in his view Teilhard did very badly. And whereas Tayar seems to argue that concentration of matter is what basically produces consciousness, what Tipler says is we start off with a definition of a person as a certain organization of information. And on Tipler's view, um, the purpose of life is to colonize the universe quickly enough to ensure that the exchange of information becomes so dense that entropy is arrested, and instead of f um, falling into a collapse, um, as, as he imagines the universe would do otherwise, um, we reach the omega point. And he says uh, he uses Chardin's uh, um, terminology. Uh, the omega point for him uh, is God, um, and God is, as it were, the supreme person, the person who comprehends all other persons, the maximal organization of information. And all people, including people who've existed in all the alternative universes, as well as people who've existed in our own universe, all will eventually be saved. It's a total universalism. They will be saved as what they really are, uh, which is organizations of data. Um, now, you know, Tipler's quite happy that the effective, the emotional side of our personality should disappear. And obviously, we won't be embodied except in some extremely tenuous sense. Um, it, it, just in the space-time manifold, whatever exactly that is. We will be able to enjoy the contemplation of God. He has, without, I think, quoting Gregory of Nyssa, he does think that we'll be able to move on from one stage of uh, uh, enjoyment of God to another. Uh, as he also thinks, without quoting Charles Hartshorn, that the perfection of God consists of occupying successive states of perfection and not simply one. 
Um, and there are, although he doesn't cite either Hartshorn or Gregory of Nyssa, he does cite, for example, Bart and Tillich and a number of church fathers. I mean, for a physicist you know, who is not a Christian, uh, Tipler is extraordinarily well read in theology, much better read in, the in theology than most theologians, including me, are in physics. And he believes that this should be a welcome eschatology, something which Christians can applaud as the only viable uh, interpretation of the apocatastasis. I think he does actually, he's actually aware of the term apocatastasis uh, even in 1995. Now, as I said, um, no physicist takes this um, eschatology seriously, and there's no reason why we would do so uh, as you know, a, a matter of fact. Uh, but my question is, you know, what would a theologian respond to? Uh, how would a theologian appraise it? Would a theologian like it to be true? Uh, or is it the kind of thing which we really wouldn't like uh, to be true? Um, now, I think the obvious response of 21st theologians, and I have to admit my knowledge of 21st century theology is extremely tenuous, um, but the obvious response of uh, 21st century theologians, as far as I understand them, would be to emphasize the irreducibly embodied character of being human. And to treat our being embodied not as a kind of accident or a tragedy or something that we would wish away, but something which is absolutely fundamental to our humanity. And they would say that Tipler does not do justice to our embodiedness, doesn't do justice to the essentially emotional and affective character of human existence. And this seems to be emphasized increasingly, in, at least in modern Anglophone theology. Now, it's not surprising, of course, that it would be. Um, I mean, we live, after all, in a world which is entirely geared to the gratification of bodily desire. The world's become just one huge commissariat for the indulgence of our appetites and our emotions. For the first time ever, it's possible, it seems, for everybody to have everything they could want. And you know, we not only are being bad citizens if we're not constantly upgrading our mobile phones, uh, but there's also a valorization of feeling itself and of emotion itself, which is characteristic of our society at large. It's just good to feel. It's good to feel love, uh, but it's also good to feel joy and to express it. It's good to feel pride, even good to feel hatred. Um, we don't want stoical, unfeeling characters anymore. Um, now, the church, of course, can't possibly embrace all of this. It can't embrace the capitalist ethos of um, constantly um, escalating desire, um, but it does, I think, on the whole, share this very high valorization of the emotions, which is characteristic of the late 20th and the 21st century. So long as the emotions are wholesome, so long as they are directed towards a wholesome object, uh, then really it's very good to feel them intensely. Obviously, the emotion which Christians talk about above all, and sometimes exclusively, is that of love. And it's good to feel love intensely. It's good to feel pain. It's good to feel vulnerable. It's good to feel abandoned. Um, it's not good that love should simply be a kind of 18th century benevolence. And this is not only applied to human beings are sitting in this room, it's also applied to the ideal human being, to Jesus Christ himself. It's tremendously important that Jesus Christ should have felt suffering. If not actually the physical suffering of the cross, then certainly the suffering of bereavement in some way or other, the suffering of kenosis, the suffering of having become human, having been abandoned in Gethsemane and on the cross. And there are, of course, theologians who even want to apply this to God himself. Um, in his divine nature and not only in his human nature, uh, that God himself must be capable of suffering because otherwise we just couldn't relate to him. It's not enough that God should be able to dispense everything to us that we want, as Umberto Eco imagines in Canton the Platypus, that God could be some kind of giant internet uh, just answering our prayers. Uh, no, God actually has to feel what we feel, suffer what we suffer. Um, why this should be when we ourselves are so averse to physical pain and so quick to reach for tranquilizers and placebos, I don't know, but we're certainly determined to inflict suffering on God. What would the church fathers have thought of this debate? Whose side would they be on? Well, it's no secret, of course, that they were not keen on the passibility of God. One thing they are united on is that God, qua God, is impassible. God as man is passable, at least if you're not Theodore Mox Westier anyway, God as man is passable, although explaining exactly how as man he is passable, uh, well, as Cyril of Alexandria says, that's a great mystery. Um, but certainly God as God is not, because if God, is, God were passable, 
which have no guarantee of God's omnipotence, of his power to overcome all possible forces that are arrayed against him, we'd have no guarantee, really, that God was capable of keeping his promises unless God were absolutely immune to the agency of any other being. Nor are the fathers particularly worried about the suffering of Christ, it seems to me, as a human being. They do, of course, use the word suffering because pathos is simply the, ob the opposite of action. Uh, Christ made himself an object of action as opposed to being what he always would be as God, namely the initiator of action. But they've got little to say really about the pain of being on the cross. They tend to explain away uh, the prayer in Gethsemane. Um, Clement of Alexandria can argue he didn't really feel hunger in the wilderness. Uh, Hilary of Poitiers can doubt whether even his human soul was passable. Um, the word docetism, which is so common among modern theologians, is hardly ever found in the early church. And if it is found, it just means denying that Christ had a body. But if Christ did have a body, then of course it would be a body of a higher condition than ours. It wouldn't be the corrupt and weak and constantly decadent body that we have. Uh, after all, we won't feel hung un hunger in heaven, will we? So does it matter if Christ didn't feel hunger in the wilderness? Ultimately, we're all supposed to have incorruptible, indestructible bodies, which necessarily must differ in some form from the bodies that we now have. Now, there is, of course, a great debate in the early church as to how much the resurrection body is going to differ in physical texture uh, from the body that we now have. And those who thought it would differ radically, like Origen or the Gnostics, were often thought of as heretics. But even those who thought it would be, physically speaking, the same, would have to admit that it would lose a lot of the characteristics that the physical body has now, uh, because uh, the, you know, uh, it wouldn't need to be fed, presumably, uh, just as angels don't need to be fed, according to the book of Tobit. Uh, there wouldn't be any danger of you, know, you dying when you were run over by a truck, I suppose. You know, that have to, the, the more you think about it, the harder it is to imagine how a body like ours could, in fact, be imperishable, uh, unless you know, some miraculous transformation took place. The body that we have is called by St. Paul a body of death, Romans 7.24. And, as we all know, one corollary of this belief that there's something badly wrong with the body that we now inhabit is asceticism in the early church. Um, now, to some degree, this is forced upon everybody in the ancient world because of the sheer scarcity of resources. You can have a prophylactic kind of asceticism like that of the Stoics, where basically you extinguish desire because you know that desires won't be fulfilled anyway. You can have a platonic kind of asceticism where your desires are reorientated towards a higher goal of the kind that we find in Augustine. Or you can have the really full-blown Christian kind of asceticism which goes even further than the pagan form in extinguishing the passions, not simply for the sake of keeping yourself free from pain, but for the sake of making yourself an instrument of perfect love or agape, as, for example, Evagrius does. And here, of course, we certainly differ from Tipler. Agape is not part of Tipler's cosmology. On the other hand, I think... Evagrius would not want to insist necessarily upon the affective side of love. Of course, love means that you'd be prepared to do anything for the good of your neighbor, including die, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you would put a high value upon intensity of feeling. My suspicion is that when intensity of feeling is commended, it's usually love for God rather than love for neighbor that's in question. So I think the church fathers would find, they certainly wouldn't agree with Tipler on everything, uh, by any means, so they'd find him too much of a process theologian, definitely. Um, but then, you know, Tipler's just a pagan and they would do what they did with other pagans, you know, to take what you, can, what you find useful, leave behind the rest. I think they'd be a lot more disquieted by some of Tipler's um, Christian detractors because they would look like heretics. Um, they would look like people who had forgotten that our destiny lies outside this world because they'd forgotten where we came from in the first place. They're people who were so much in love with the current condition of the body um, that they'd not only forgotten their own obligations, but were even in danger of redesigning God in the image of man. Uh, so I suspect that on the whole, the church fathers would want very little to do with either side of this debate, but if anything, they'd feel a little safer in the company of Tipler, just as Basil uh, the Great, I think, felt safer writing to Libanius than he did writing to Apollinarius of Laodicea. Thank you. Can I close the computer lid without that causing a problem? Is that okay? Thank you. Thank you. 
I'm tempted to say good luck because this is completely different. So if you're striving to make connections. What is it to be called a theologian in gratitude to Rowan Williams? What does it mean to be called a theologian, ho theologos, in the ancient world? And why might that matter to us? In this paper, I'm going to examine how Gregory of Nazianzus, famously called Gregory the Theologian, sets out his authorial persona as a poet, seer, or prophet of Vartes, someone who can see into the deep roots of things. I will then draw some lines of connection between that idea and the use of the title theologian for poets like Homer, Hesiod, and Orpheus, biblical authors like Moses and John, and the philosopher Plato. I'll argue that in late antiquity, the title Hothia Logos denoted not just the content and sources, but also the mode of doing theology, the mode of speaking about God, a mode which was understood as poetic in a broad sense. In a nutshell, Gregory is appropriately called the theologian, not despite of being, but because he was a poet. As is well known, in addition to his orations, Gregory of Nazianzus wrote a large number of poems. A set of these, sometimes known as the Poemita Arcana, form a coherent group which articulates the orthodox Christian doctrine of the Trinity. They are, if you like, the poetic doublet to Gregory's more famous theological orations, which Lewis mentioned yesterday. This group of poems begins with a prelude in which Gregory presents himself as a poet, priest, prophet, grappling with the immensity of his task. He describes his hesitation, his awareness that his attempt to speak about God is akin to setting sail on a flimsy raft or trying to fly to heaven on frail wings. And yet he is emboldened to make God apparent. He will break into daring speech because he believes that God will accept the offering of a humble and loving giver. His daring extends to declaring emphatically that his speech is for those who are pure, implying perhaps that he believes he is of those, their number, and that this gives him authority to dismiss those who are not, warning that the uninitiated are in danger of severe punishment. This preface closes with an invocation of the Holy Spirit, delivered in solemn and majestic tone. Spirit of God, in your truthfulness, come rouse my mind and stir my tongue to be a loud sounding trumpet that all who are fused with the fullness of Godhead may heartily rejoice. With these words, Gregory imitates a long line of Greek poets who gave weight to their words by constructing a prophetic and priestly persona. Much of this tradition harks back to formulations um, based on the Orphic writings, particularly a phrase by which the author established his authority to speak of the divine and banished those who may not hear. I will speak to those for whom it is permitted. Close the doors, you who are uninitiated. Gregory inserts himself into this tradition using some of the same vocabulary, and like Callimachus and others before him, adapting the ideas of the poet, priest, prophet to his own context. In his case, of course, purification comes from Christian philosophy and rites, and Gregory move, is moved to proclaim the God who is one in three and who is incarnate in Jesus Christ. But he also, I think, places himself in continuity with the tradition of the Vartes, the poet as prophet and seer and master of the truth. This isn't the only poetic tradition which he emulates. The beginnings of the second and third poems, we shall sing first of the sun, sing also the praise of the spirit, evoke not only the opening of the Iliad, sing goddess of the wrath of Achilles, but also the opening invocations of the Homeric hymns, muse, sing of Artemis, and the opening of Hesiod's Theogony. So Gregory, therefore, seems quite deliberately to be placing himself in the tradition of inspired prophetic prophets and poets who dared to speak of the great mysteries of the world and of the divine. He echoes the words and diction of Hesiod and the collections which were transmitted in the ancient world under the name of Homer and Orpheus. 
It is precisely these poets who were described in the ancient world as theologians. So it's tempting, therefore, to infer that this is why Gregory was given that title. Perhaps it reflected his defense of the orthodox doctrine of the Trinity in his poetry, not his prose. There are two problems here, though. The first is that there were others in the ancient world who were termed theologians, but who wrote in prose, and I'll return to that issue in a moment. But the second is that my suggestion that Gregory constructs himself as a Vartic poetic theologian lies somewhat in contrast to an important recent discussion of Gregory's title by Oliver Langworthy. So I'll deal with that issue first. I have nothing to add to Langworthy's excellent argument that the first attribution of the title theologian to Gregory, and here I'm quoting, was in the Greek text of Theodoret's address to Marcion, appended to the Acts of the Council of Chalcedon in November 451, after the close of the Council. As to the reason for Theodoret's application of the title to Gregory, Langworthy argues it lies in Theodoret's conception of theology. Theodoret recognized the theology of Greeks as theology, although one based in his words on old and miserable myths. The problem was this hadn't died. So, Langworthy argues, Theodoret sought to construct a true theology presented by Christian authors that could be contrasted with the theology and theologians of wider pagan culture. Consequently, Theodoret constructs a list of true theologians, including Moses, John the Evangelist, and Gregory of Nazianzus, to set against such theologians as Orpheus, Hesiod, Homer, and Plato. Moses and John had each already been described as hotheologos in the Christian tradition. Theodoret's innovation was applying the term to Gregory. This all seems to me to be extremely persuasive. I'm also persuaded that besides sharing the same broad theological project, both Theodoret and Gregory of Nazianzus shared, in Langworthy's words, an understanding of theology as not merely abstract speculation about the divine or a species of philosophy, but instead as specific revelations of the first things in written works. Theology is thus an essentially literary as well as an intellectual category in this particular context. However, I'm less persuaded by another aspect of Langworthy's account, which sets Theodoret's view of Gregory against Gregory's own view of himself. So for Langworthy, Theodoret's Gregory is a creative theologian, speaking directly of the first things and the nature of the divine. Langworthy argues that Gregory himself, on the other hand, sees himself as an exegete of the text, elucidating that which was there to be known. In essence, my argument is first that there's less of a difference between the creative theologian and the exegete than Langworthy thinks, and second, to raise questions about whether it would have been quite so odd as I think Langworthy thinks to place oneself in a line of theologians stemming from Moses and John. So in order to do this, in the second half of this paper, I'm going to look again at what Gregory seemed to think it meant to call or be called a theologian. And I'm going to briefly sketch three ways in which that concept cross, cuts across distinctions that might often be um, usually held to uh, be the case. So crossing boundaries, and my first boundary is that between a seer and an interpreter. As I've just um, argued, Langworthy's argument depends on a distinction between a creative theologian and an exegete. Theodoret acclaims Gregory as the former, while Gregory only sees himself as the latter. Following Robert Lamberton's analysis of Homer the theologian, Langworthy suggests that the term theologos was applied to those authors whose works are the source of new myths, new ways of thinking about the divine. This explains, amongst other things, why Plato was seen as a theologian. For strikingly, he did not interpret existing texts and stories, but generated his own myths. Similarly, Moses and John could be seen as theologians in the sense that they are inspired creators. In particular, Genesis 1 to 3 and John 1 could be seen as inspired moments of myth-making. 
sublime narratives about the divine which Christians could claim surpassed those of classical Greece. Now, in that light, I can see that it might seem odd for Gregory to place himself alongside Moses and John. So this is why I think Langworthy argues that Gregory saw himself as an interpreter, a theologian in a secondary or derivative sense, setting himself alongside those who, like him, who were not, in Langworthy's words, creators of theology, but interpreters whose quality is marked by their sources, their character, and their discernment. The problem is that I don't think this distinction between theological creator and interpreter is clear in the ancient world. Indeed, Robert Lamberton himself writes that the distinction between theologizing by writing poetry, in which information about the gods was presented in a more or less veiled form, and theologizing by interpreting the poetry of the ancients in such a way as to bring out these meanings, is one, in fact, that seems often to have been blurred in antiquity. And Lamberton hints that perhaps this distinction might be more due to the modern reader than to the ancient mind. I would argue, I would argue that the contrast between creative and interpretive theologian is frequently elided in early Christian texts. For example, Origen, of course a profound influence on Nazianzen, repeatedly argued that the exegete of scripture, as much as its human authors, required spiritual discipline and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. As John McGuckin has shown, Origen saw that the quarrel between poetry and philosophy, I'm quoting here, is implicitly resolved when the poet is himself the philosopher. It was, to quote again, years of disciplined study and mental training which provided the necessary purification required for an inspired and accurate interpreter. According to McGuckin, Gregory of Nazianzus developed Origen's idea of the priest philosopher poet one stage further. He wishes merely, not merely to comment on inspired literature, but more to the point to produce it. Crucially, the point of the Vartic voice, assuming that poet-priest voice, is to stress, I think, that any attempt to speak of the divine is daring. Any attempt involves an act of interpretation. Even the so-called myth-makers constantly foregrounded the idea that their theology did not ultimately come from them. Hence, both creative theology and exegesis were held to require divine inspiration. Indeed, there was a continuity between both activities. They were both described as theology, and their agents were called theologians. So even if I persuaded you that that distinction between theology as creative and theology as exegetical is not clear-cut, you might want to ask, well, is that Vartes' voice not just heard only in Nazianzen's poetry? What about his prose? And here we need to think briefly about that distinction that we make so easily. Poetry in the ancient world was, of course, distinguished by its use of metre. And broadly speaking, specific metres pointed the audience to expect certain kinds of content. But conventions were very complex. So hexameter could be used for both epic and didactic. Philosophy could be expressed in poetry as well as in prose. Conversely, some prose forms could be self-consciously poetic. This is especially evident in the rhetoric of the second to fourth centuries. In addition, literary theories of style identified three moods or sensibilities, the slender, the pleasant, and the sublime. And these spanned poetry and prose, allowing for the possibility of creating resonances between compositions in different forms. As I've shown elsewhere, in ancient literary theory, style and content were closely related. Style should be appropriate, appropriateness again, to subject matter. On the other hand, one could more elusively denote certain themes or a certain poetic voice by using a particular style. The sublime style was appropriate to matters such as the gods or natural philosophy. Longinus writes that Moses achieved sublimity in Genesis 1, and Christian writers describe the eloquence of Moses and John, amongst others, as sublime. So bearing these points in mind, I think one can see profound continuities between Gregory's poetry and prose. 
Firstly, when writing about the poet prophet seer, Gregory consistently uses language and images which evoke the sublime. He's telling us that he's writing theology. Secondly, the figure of the inspired prophet and seer populates both his poetry and his prose. For example, he prays at the beginning of his second oration. Let the most blessed David begin my speech, or rather let him who spoke in David, and even now yet speaks through him. For indeed, the very best way of beginning every speech and action is to begin from God and to end in God. Besides the references to the Old Testament, Gregory's words seem to echo the beginning of Theocritus, Idyll 17. Let us begin from Zeus, and muses bring your song to an end in Zeus. Gregory begins other orations by invoking the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in ways which very much echo his poetic invocation of the Spirit in the Poemata Arcana. And thirdly, in his prose as well as his poetry, Gregory emphasizes that the speaker must begin the process of receiving God's word with purification. In the theological orations, the figure of Moses exemplifies this process. At the beginning of the second oration, again, Gregory addresses his audience as friends and initiates and fellow lovers of the truth. He says that, I was running to lay hold on God and went up the mountain where he was permitted to see God's back. Gregory thus asserts for himself the role of the true theologian, Toth Theologon, who ought to be, as far as may be, pure, in order that light may be apprehended by light. He warns others to stay back. In this way, I think the Orphic imagery used in the poems is here used in relation to the story of Moses. In sum, I think he consistently constructs for him this particular Vartic poetic voice in continuity both with Homer and Co and with Moses. Patristic scholars have tended to light on Moses, classicists on Homer, but the literary voice that is being created, I think, is one and the same. Nevertheless, you might still want to ask me, well, isn't it an act of hubris to place oneself in line with Homer let alone Moses and John. Here, I think, it's helpful to look at how Gregory applies the term theologos to his near contemporaries. So he uses that term in relation to his father, Gregory the Elder, to Athanasius and to Basil when he writes memorial orations for them. Each of these is a man, he says, of comprehensive moral virtue, so that, as Gregory says of his father, he can act as an example, like a spiritual statue, polished into the beauty of all excellent conduct. Secondly, each man was immersed in scripture, applying himself to it so as to gain wisdom or deep understanding. Third, they were all enabled through their virtue, scriptural wisdom and God's grace to defend orthodoxy. And finally, they all are deemed to have a kind of eloquence which is not just technical, but which derives from all the other factors. As Gregory says of Basil, he has a theologian's eloquence. I think these ideas echo the idea of the prophet seer, who's purified through virtue and granted not only wisdom, but the eloquence to express the mysteries. The obverse of this portrait of the poet prophet seer, of course, is found in Gregory's devastatingly sarcastic portrait of Eunomius. Lofty thou art, he says, even beyond the lofty, even above the clouds, if thou wilt, a spectator of things invisible, a hearer of things unspeakable, he intones in mock sublime style. Eunomius is a false seer, a cheapskate artisan, who attempts in the course of just one day to mould his followers into saints and ordain them theologians and, as it were, breathe into them instruction. Eunomius's attempt to write in a sublime Vartic voice is, quite literally, an epic fail. So in a world where education was dominated by the emulation of one's teachers, setting oneself in the line of Homer and Orpheus or Moses and John, can be seen as setting down a marker as to one's loyalties and commitments. 
It is also to make some claims about virtue, which indeed Gregory praises in his friends. When it comes to his own poetic voice and the question of hubris, we perhaps need to take a little more seriously what he says about hesitation in the preface to the poemita Arcana, which I quoted earlier. After all, in his other poetry, Gregory is notoriously and often comically transparent about his own failings. The hesitation to speak about God is formulaic, but that does not mean it is an empty pose. So to conclude, you might still be wondering, well, Moina, why does this all matter? Gregory wrote, it is true, in a poetic language which is alien to many of us. Yet the poetic voice he constructs using the poet-priest-prophet figure still has the power, I think, to make us probe what it is to be called a theologian. He challenges the boundary between constructive and exegetical work, because for him, all theology is an act of interpretation in front of divine mystery. He foregrounds the role of divine agency and raises insistent questions about virtue and prayer as costly preparation for speaking about God. His mode of writing also, and we need to be aware of this, raises questions about the attribution of authorial voice. For whom is it appropriate to assume the Vartic voice? Who gets to choose? And who gets to choose the line of our poet, prophet, priest, forebears? We are right, I think, to find aspects of Gregory's stance here a bit uncomfortable. But finally, because the task of theology is also fundamentally literary for Gregory, it means that theology is therefore poetic in the broad sense. It demands a certain kind of communicative eloquence. The theologian is one who chooses his words carefully because the word has chosen him. And this, as Rowan Williams has so often reminded us in his own practice, is something from which we still have much to learn. Thank you very much. Flattered to be last. Uh, I think of myself as the uh, wayward child who, at various points, key points, uh, has refused to become a theologian um, and uh, ran away to be a Swansea Wittgensteinian and, um, as a result, uh, still count somehow as a Welsh philosopher. Um, uh, and, and that's fine, though I now don't actually know what it is to be a theologian. Um, but I am on this occasion uh, coming home uh, to where I ought to be, and um, it will be a theology paper, I think. I'm not going to try to explain the unspeakable what, it, what this paper owes to Rowan. I hope that will emerge. <clears throat> uh, sorry, I should get the computer up. I begin with chapter 9 of Ambrose's homily on the sixth day of creation in his Examaron. The extracts I'll display hardly do justice to Ambrose's amazing celebration of the powers and beauty of the human body, but I'm focusing on the bits about the body's power for communicating and for engaging in sacramental action. The first is about kissing. Kissing with the mouth is an expression of love for the other person. Although it's not encoding words, it can be true or false. Like some other kinds of bodily communication, a kiss can tell a lie. In my second extract, Ambrose reflects on Judas, whose betrayal kiss was a lie. These observations about how we use the mouth uh, for nonverbal communication are part of Ambrose's account of the beauty and wonder of the human anatomy 
that is the creator's achievement on day six. Working from the top down, Ambrose explains each part of the body and why it is good. He explains why we don't have eyes on top of our heads like crabs and everything else, including why it is jolly good that our faces are placed well away from our bottoms. <laughs> Kissing is not the only form of bodily communication without words. When he reaches the legs, chapter 9, uh, section 74, sorry, I don't think I've got that one on the, on the, phrase, on the thing, I'll go back to the, the kissing. Um, <clears throat> when he reaches the legs, chapter 9, se section 74, Ambrose mentions kneeling to express humility. But much earlier, here we are, near the top of the head, he explained that the forehead provides a direct window to the mind along with the eyebrows. I thought I should mention the eyebrows. <clears throat> I doubt Ambrose had seen eyebrows such as we see. But anyway, <clears throat> the eyebrows which lift when we smile or are amused. Unlike the kiss, Ambrose takes the forehead to be incapable of telling a lie. Interesting, I thought. Human beings thus use the body itself for communication. Only the tongue does this by means of words and language. In most cases, it seems, the mental content conveyed is not linguistic either. Our inner thoughts include emotions, feelings, attitudes of loyalty, devotion, service and affection conveyed directly through corporeal behavior, not encoded in words. Where did Ambrose get it from? A mystery tour. In sections two to four of the long paper, I compare what Ambrose is doing here in chapter nine with the ideas found in his Cappadocian predecessors. For most of his Examaron, Ambrose presents what amounts to a personalized paraphrase in Latin of Basil's nine extant homilies on the Hexameron. But Basil's homilies end abruptly at the very beginning of the creation of mankind, so his text includes none of the stuff that we find in Ambrose's chapter 9. The way Basil's homily breaks off early leaves us with a curious enigma. Basil's own contemporaries and followers evidently took it to be incomplete, and two texts exist that are clearly intended to be completions. One, known as De Opificio Hominis, is by Gregory of Nyssa, who explicitly says he is reconstructing the content of Basil's uh, um, missing tenth homily. The other text, oops, what's happened here? Here we go. Uh, um, I want this one. Yeah. That one. That's the one. Um, uh, the other text, a pair of two homilies attributed in the tradition to either Basil or Gregory and entitled De Creazione Hominis, is sometimes listed as homilies 10 and 11 of Basil's Heximerum. A third relevant text is Basil's own homily 319, Attende Tibi Ipsi, which some argue might be the original 10th homily or might be a source from which both the extant reconstructions drew material inspiration. Uh, I'm not going to try to contribute to these theories. My interest here is in how powerfully Ambrose's chapter 9 contrasts with the three Cappadocian texts just mentioned that are roughly conveying what Basil might have said and also in the contrast between Ambrose's chapter 9 and his earlier work where he was copying Basil. Whereas the Cappadocians typically dismiss the body and its functions as beastly, a distraction, an obstruction, and a hindrance to the incorporeal soul, chapter 9 seeks to show the opposite. And whereas the Cappadocians insist that only the inner man is made in the image of God, whether the tripartite soul is that inner man or even just the intellect, Ambrose, by contrast, sees the human body as expressive of the divine and even part of the way that God works in the world. Uh, sorry, I've 
run, uh, gone, got behind. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, for the world is the work of God's hands, and the sacraments are the works of our hands. So here we have the um, comments on the arms, um, and uh, the hand is that which administers food to the mouth, the hand is that which shines forth in deeds of glory, which is brought to the sacred altars as the mediator of divine grace. It is that whereby we offer and receive the heavenly sacrament. Uh, and the hand by whose name even the Son of God was not ashamed to be announced when David says the right hand of the Lord has the preeminence. The hand is that which made all things, as the Almighty God says, hath not my hand made all these things. Ambrose's more generous view of the advantages of embodiment and the ease with which the inner mind is seen on the surface of our corporeal outer selves is strikingly unlike what we find in the Cappadocians, I suggest. And in sections two to five of the paper, of the longer paper, I reflect on some parallels and contrasts between these texts. I don't have time to talk about those now. Um, so moving on to uh, section uh, five, effectively, of the paper. Ambrose's Exameron is one link in a chain running from Clement and Origen through the Capitation Fathers to Augustine. Augustine's perennial concern with the interpretation of Genesis issued in several works, many of which focus on offering a literal interpretation. By a literal interpretation, Augustine means one in which the actual corporeal bodies made by God in the six days of creation and the reported events in the rest of Genesis have real significance and aren't given figurative meanings. A literal reading of Genesis sees the earth, the sky, the waters, the lights in the sky as components of God's handiwork. Augustine had probably heard Ambrose deliver his homilies orally in about 387, and as we saw, Ambrose's immediate inspiration was Basil. But the tradition goes further back to Alexandria, to Clement and Origen, and their encounter with the Philonic tradition. Unfortunately, much of Clement's exegetical work on Genesis is lost, but we can infer from Photius that Clement's Hippotiposes included extensive commentary on the early parts of Genesis and was probably partly inspired by Philo. For Origen, too, some key works are lost. His treatise De Principiis II, a philosophical work on theological issues concerning creation, survives only in Rufinus's free Latin translation. But shortly before writing De Principis, Origen had composed 13 books of philosophical commentary on Genesis, of which only one extract from Book 3 is preserved in the Philokalia. It is to this text that I now turn. Origen is commenting on Genesis 1.14, where on day 4, God makes the stars to be signs for times and for days and for years. This cannot mean that things and events on earth are determined by the stars or that horoscopes determine our fate, says Origen. That would imply that human affairs are necessitated, rendering personal piety, faith, and prayer redundant. Origen explores various problems that follow from astrological determinism, one of which is the problem of evil. He then rejects the Gnostic idea that the creator is not the supreme god, which also leads to various dilemmas to which the Gnostics have no satisfactory reply. In section four of the extract, which you've got on the screen, Origen musters evidence to prove that God has foreknowledge and can predict everything that happens. And in section five, oh, it's not there, um, <clears throat> he explains why foreknowledge does not entail predestination, predetermined outcomes, or causal determinism. It is perfectly possible that the stars can tell us what will happen, but they don't make it, make it happen. Rather, they are signifiers. Neither they nor God himself determine in advance the things of which they give signs. Origen is here addressing philosophical problems about the difference between fate and foreknowledge, and his treatment is, I think, exemplary. Origen doesn't appeal to allegorical or non-literal meanings. Instead, like Basil, Ambrose, and Augustine after him, he agrees that the behavior of actual corporeal stars carries meaning. 
As the text says, God literally put the stars there for signs, for times, for days, and for years. And important for my immediate purpose, Origen concludes that these bodies deliver their message not in language, but by performing actions. The works of God speak of their creator in actions and gestures that we comprehend with our minds. Their messages are transmitted in intrinsically corporeal and performative ways. As Ambrose also saw, bodies can do things that are meaningful. I suggested above that Basil and Gregory tend to suggest that the only relevant self is the mind which struggles to communicate when in a body because the body conceals rather than reveals the mind. The mind uses language to traverse an otherwise difficult barrier caused by the fact that minds are invisible to each other. So the Cappadocian thinkers seem to conceive of the mind as somewhat private, clothed in an alien body. They seem to relish a strand of skepticism about the contents and accessibility of other minds. In the most extreme version of other minds skepticism, the philosopher doubts even that there are any other minds. In a less extreme version, one assumes that other minds exist, but doubts that we can know what anyone else's inner experience is like. Both forms lead to highly problematic conclusions, many of them widespread in our current society, with risks that are not confined to the study. It remains hugely important to expose and eliminate these models, which above all tend to grip the supposedly educated classes in the developed world where models of individualism have made the absence of empathy and sympathy endemic or even obligatory. It seems to me that these problematic notions of mental privacy tend to arise when we forget or deny our embodied ways of communicating, when we forget how to see and read embodied experience and meaning properly. Understanding each other doesn't require us to access hidden content in hidden minds. The mind is not obstructed by the corporeality of our lives. On the contrary, it is through the corporeal that we understand each other, other animals, and our shared world, including grasping its significance for each other and for the collective life of all the species for whom it is home. We generally blame René Descartes for these other minds' problems and for the separation of mind from a bodily substance conceived as inert and mechanical. But we've found glimpses of something like it already in Basil and Gregory and in the parts of Ambrose that depend upon Basil. Do we also find it in Augustine too? One proof text often used to suggest that Augustine held a view of that kind is a sentence from his De Trinitate. That's not quite fitting the screen, but um, anyway, uh, it says um, eight, six, nine at the top, I think. Uh, it's possible that Descartes and Berkeley um, read that sentence in the way it's often read today, as if Augustine was denying that any kind of corporeal communication is possible, denying that meaning or thought can be visible in bodily gestures. But we mustn't take the sentence out of context, I think. It's part of Augustine's discussion of the fact that we do know what other people are thinking, and indeed the fact that even the animals know that other animals have minds. The fact that Augustine is sure that animals can recognize and understand other minds shows, he argues, that this ability isn't confined to the rational soul. <clears throat> it's not an intellectual deduction. We don't reason our way to inferring the minds of others. No, we, like, anim like other animals, perceive or feel that we are encountering another embodied mind. Here, Augustine is arguing that we don't just feel or perceive the presence of soul and mind, rather we know it's there. And we know it not by inference from our own perceptions or feelings, but by recognizing in another creature the same source of motion that's familiar in our own case. This kind of recognition of kinship and similarity is not peculiarly human, but is shared by non-human animals. Granted, in De Trinitate, Augustine seeks to isolate the mind from certain bodily attachments that he thinks it tends to confuse with itself. He also argues that the mind is not embodied in the sense of actually being a body or being identified with the body through which it expresses itself. This may explain his suggestion that the mind is invisible 
and his reference to the body as that hunk in the um, one you've got on the screen at the moment. He does deliberately portray the body as a hunk of inanimate flesh inhabited by the ghost in the machine, as though the soul's presence must be teased out by guesswork. Such expressions teeter on the brink of the dualism that people have found here. Yet despite all that, Augustine doesn't imply that the body hides the soul or makes it harder to see or understand what others mean. On the contrary, the body and its actions are what enable souls to recognize and communicate their kinship to each other. It's through the body that we convey our meaning and our intentions. Even if our disorderly love for the body and bodily things can leave us confused about the nature of our own and other minds, it doesn't follow that the body is any kind of impediment to perceiving what others mean, quite the reverse. Augustine implies that we perceive that the other is a soul and understand what they mean through seeing their intentions expressed in the body. Even in text 15, this one uh, is, uh, Augustine is saying that the mind is perceived, not inferred from introspection or by an analogy. I think I've sort of said that already. So this is not uh, a, the place for a full investigation of Augustine's position on other minds. I simply note that he too, like Ambrose, insists that we read and understand the intentions and mindedness of others in their actions and gestures. So also we recognize the hand and mind of the creator in the created world around us and its very movements can serve as signs. We see the creator's mind in the works of nature in the same way that we see another person's mind in their actions and bodily expressions. When we bend a knee or hold one another in a silent embrace, the body is what communicates and it doesn't do it in words. It, it does it not in words, but with no less an effect than if it were in words, in fact, perhaps, with rather more effect. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> many, many thanks to our three contributors. And now, Rowan, it's over to you for the last time. <laughs> Yet again, thank you for a real feast of suggestive and fresh perspectives on the relation between patristic and modern issues. And as last time, what I'd like to do is offer just a couple of um, half-formed thoughts sparked by this and one slight, uh, perhaps slightly more coherent query or discussion opener. Um, and simply to link this to the preceding session, Mark, your description of Tipler on um, the physics of immortality reminded me of nothing so much as Nikolai Fyodorov's philosophy in 19th century Russia, that the purpose of human life is the resurrection of the dead. Not wholly unlike, I think, what uh, Tipler is talking about here. Just a little footnote on that and what, that, what on earth that might mean. I think Fyodorov would have been rather fascinated by the idea that physics was at last catching up with his with his insights. Um, and another stray question in the wake of um, what you were saying, Mark, and that is the paradox in our contemporary cultural environment of all this emphasis on feeling, desire, gratification, etc., and also the, the new, um, newly fashionable status of what people think is stoicism in the modern intellectual world. Neo-Stoicism is often um, talked about these days as a sort of coming philosophy. And as a result of that, people like Aristotle and Plato are rather <coughs> assimilated to a Stoic agenda for the purposes of some kinds of modern uh, retrievals of classical moral philosophy. And uh, I'd be fascinated to hear any reflections you've got on the paradox that, that's implied here, or confusion to be a little less <laughs> charitable about it. But that's all a bit by the way. Um, one other specific question, more when this time, um, is that that self-presentation of the theologian as vates, as theologos in a very specific sense. Of course, that reminded me quite a bit of, um, going back to my earlier days, Arius' self-description in the Thalia, where he makes a great deal of being theodidactos, um, God-taught and seems to me to be making in what we've got of the Thalia 
a very strong claim of a rather Nazianzen-ish kind. And that's, that's itself an interesting thing, push, pushing back that self-identification into the Alexandrian tradition itself, raising questions about how Origen, Origen saw his, his role. And that takes me to my final and rather more um, possibly substantive reflection, which is about what has come through very clearly, I think, especially in your remarks more when I and what Catherine says. That is the, um, the Origenian hinterland of a great deal of what we're talking about. Because if I read Origen correctly, of course, one of the things that his cosmology says is that the material world is there, to put it very simply, as a kind of trampoline for the muscles of the soul. Creation is made to improve the, the tone and tenor of noetic life. We have bodies so that our minds and souls may be exercised in bringing those bodies into rational submission, bringing them into order, and thus making them precisely, Catherine, your point, precisely more um, effective and coherent communications of that noetic structure which exists within and beyond them. And I'd love to hear Owena and Catherine particularly talk, talking about how that, um, that Origenian element is coming through in, um, in what we're reflecting on more generally as a function of Origen's own cosmology. And whether that, that is part of the, if you like, the energy, the motivation that is pushing an Ambrose in that kind of direction. Oh, and a footnote, really, a uh, question to Catherine. Um, point taken about the way in which the Cappadocians primarily locate the image in noose rather than body. At the same time, you have that strange phrase in Gregory of Nyssa, I think, I can't remember exactly where now, that the body is um, a kind of katoptru katoptron, a mirror of a mirror. The body is not just a sort of um, random addition bolted on like some um, modernistic addition to a classical Cambridge college, um, <laughs> having no intrinsic or organic or aesthetic connection <laughs> with anything else around what could I be talking about. Um, it, it, is, it is what it is because of its connect, some sort of connection with that pre-existing katoptron, which is the mirror of the noose in respect of eternal logos. Just a few thoughts there. Thank you very much, Ruan. There are some colleges that do it better than others. <laughs> Let's face it. The, uh, <coughs> uh, over to our panel to begin. If, uh, Mark, would you like to respond <laughs> first? Well, <clears throat> so, with regard to the what you called neo-stoicism, I mean, I, I'm aware that there are books around how to be a stoic and an increasing uh, quantity of quotations from Marcus Aurelius and, on, on the internet and so on. Um, I don't know how many people are involved in a project of you know, radical renunciation of the kind that appears at least in the hagiography of the Desert Fathers, if not in the reality. But then one could say that that was true of the ancient Stoics as well, of course. I mean, Marcus Aurelius carries on being an emperor. He doesn't do what a Buddhist or Jain emperor would do and retire uh, to his cell. Uh, and Seneca, as we know, was an extremely rich man um, living on the taxes of extremely poor people without apparently any compunction. Um, so, and Epictetus didn't choose to be a slave, although he made the best of it. So, I mean, even in the ancient world, you know, we might wonder how stoic the Stoics really were. You know, the cynics you know, always present themselves as the, the true Stoics in that respect. Um, but even then, you have Herodes Atticus. Um, so, I mean, there's always been that ambivalence. Um, there is, of course, a certain prudential uh, renunciation that's now being enjoined upon us uh, as a way of avoiding climate change. Um, but, I mean, even assuming that you know, that's all well-founded and everything, um, it's obviously being done in quite a different spirit uh, from the idea that the body is something that needs to be disciplined um, in order that it can be made fit for the next world. Thank you. And Morwenna? Thank you very much. Um, and, yes, thank you in particular for that um, reminder about Arius's self-description. And I think... Um, it's interesting to see that 
pushed back earlier, but also um, th there is in late antiquity a certain Christian caution at points about theology done in the poetic mode. And sometimes that's attributed to people like Arius. Um, so it's, I, I think there is this sort of simultaneous he hesitation and nevertheless decision to adopt that, that persona, which is why Gregory is so, so interesting. But he himself portrays it as risky and shows Eunomius failing. So uh, I, what, what interests me really um, about the adoption of this persona is the, the sort of tightrope um, riskiness of it. Um, and as for the Origenean hinterland and creation as a, a trampoline for the soul, thank you. <laughs> um, and of course, natural philosophy was um, in the ancient world an, an entirely appropriate um, subject matter for hexameter verse and therefore the sublime mode. So that would fit absolutely perfectly. Thank you. And Catherine? Yeah, I also enjoyed the uh, um, the trampoline model, and and I, I guess that um, uh, I, I should look more closely and and uh, try some of these ideas out to see uh, how far we can we can get to making sense of the um, the this um, tradition uh, of of why the body is important and useful when you've also got a, a, a valorization of the uh, disembodied soul. Um, uh, as for the for the Gregory of Nyssa stuff, I, I mean, I have to confess, I I, I didn't read all the texts <laughs> in order to uh, write this paper. So the the, the Gregory of Nyssa thing, the, the body is the mirror of a mirror. So it does seem to me that that's um, uh, giving us the idea that um, the the soul is the is the first mirror, and then you've got a second remove from reality, as it were. Um, and uh, that thought um, uh, would be fine, it seems to me, if we can, uh, if we can put it into uh, a model of knowledge that is sort of iconic, where you um, can read from a mirror to a mirror to, to the reality, and th that this is not a degrading of the, the um, lowest rung which of course is what I was trying to defend uh, as what Plato meant in, in my recent book on uh, uh, knowledge and truth in Plato. And it would be nice to see that coming through, um, uh, not the negative attitude to being a shadow or being a, an image, but the positive attitude to, towards it, um, which I think is what I'm sort of locating in, in the coming out in Ambrose and, and Augustine to some extent. So, so maybe it's there all the way through and we, we could find it. I, I, I don't know. Mm. Good. There is a question before I've even asked for one. <coughs> yes. Thank you. Uh, Mark Edwards, your work on origin and space exploration and the remanufacturing <coughs> of the cosmos is hugely important and of great importance for the future. What I want to ask is, you had said at one point that it's possible in principle to remanufacture all of reality using computers. And I believe this is absolutely correct because computers of their essence are a way of calculating the transformation of matter. And with the accumulation of energy and computational power, there's no theoretical limit to how much we can remanufacture the cosmos. But um, can we rethink of divine transcendence as a result of this? So as you know, in the ancient world, there's many ways in which people speak about transcendence. There's beyond being, beyond the heavens, beyond the world. And it seems as though when Origen speaks about the new worlds that are yet to come, he doesn't make a firm distinction between being beyond being and as we're being beyond the earth. And this suggests that we can think of the spiritual bodies that we are meant to assume in the next life as in principle being beyond the world, beyond the solar system, beyond the galaxy. And so suggests that there's a kind of future destiny for humanity in outer space that is suggested by Origen's eschatology. And if that's the case, I just wanted to briefly mention, I think Rowan may have alluded to this, that I learned recently that Talhard Deschardins had read Vladimir Vernotsky, and there may be a genealogy to be found between the um, revival of patristic studies in the 19th century, the Russian cosmists, and Talhard Deschardins, and then Frank Tipler. And it seems like your work is drawing upon that. Yeah, well, I mean, Origen seems you know, extremely ambivalent about the soul's relation to space, one might say. Um, yeah, um, unless Rufinus had just invented the whole thing, which seems very unlikely. Um, you know, in the De Principis, we have the soul going to somewhere that Origen calls the earthly paradise, and then ascending through the spheres. 
and these are obviously physical localities. So somehow or other, the soul, presumably carrying what Origen calls the ADOS of the body, is able to be located and therefore must have some kind of you know, spatial properties of its own. Um, and what happens to it you know, after it's gone beyond the highest of the planetary spheres, um, eventually God will become all in all. Um, is it in space anymore? It, it's, it's got to have a body of some kind, according to repeated statements in origin, and not only in Latin. Um, you know, it does seem that he insists that some kind of body is necessary for individuation, for being other than God. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, some Platonists who talk about bodies you know, will accept that even a geometric figure can be a body, you know, anything at all that has some kind of discreteness. Um, and Tertullian arguably uses the word corpus just to mean a discrete entity when he says that everybody knows that God is a corpus. So, I mean, the use of the word body in the ancient world by Origen and others, you know, seems to encompass a whole spectrum of things, you know, from the extremely tenuous, you know, to the extremely solid, um, but somehow or other offering a, a basis of differentiation. Um, I mean, I, I, I just don't know how far Origen wants to commit himself you know, uh, on questions like above being versus being. Um, this is argued about now a great deal with regard to Plotinus. Um, Plotinus follows Origen, uh, at least in the sense that he chronologically follows Origen, in adapting Plato's statement that the good is beyond being to beyond thought and being. Uh, Origen's the first person that we know of who actually uses that phrase, epikane and nukai usias, and not just usias. But a lot of what Origen says suggests that God actually in his mind is an entity, or, or, at, the, or at least, you know, that being is something you would predicate of God for Origen. Um, I don't think I really see anywhere else in Origen where, you know, I'd think God was beyond being, um, if we mean by being, you know, the very category of existence. It's arguably an ambivalence that all Christian philosophy, including Dionysius, suffers from, you know, that uh, you've got Exodus 3.14, you've got God saying, I am what I am, which means you can't exempt God from being altogether, you know, God is, whereas it's not clear whether the Platinian one or good can actually be said to exist. Uh, I mean, I, I don't think it can. Lloyd Gerson thinks it can. Um, but, you know, the Christian God has to be the subject, you know, has to exist. He, he definitely exists because he says he exists in Exodus 3.14. So that any Christian who's moving in, in what we'd call a Platinian direction, um, which, of course, would be anachronistic for origin, is still hampered, you know, by Exodus 3.14. And I think that creates problems for the ontology of quite a lot of early Christian philosophers, uh, not just origin himself. Thank you. And Sarah Coakley, um, does, this, does this mic work? Thank you. Um, just a little postscript to the exchange between Catherine and Rowan on Gregory of Nyssa. Um, I think the, the, the De Anima, De Resurrectione, would be very important here um, because it's framed with, and that's often missed, in fact, this point was missed entirely by Christopher Steed's rendition of this text. Um, it's framed with a discussion of the importance of 1 Corinthians 15 for understanding our selfhood. And since this text is very closely allied with um, the Life of Macrina text, where Gregory sees in the dying Macrina already an anticipation in this physical body of her risen status. Um, I think that that would help quite a lot in, in, in seeing a, a more of a continuity out of origins through Gregory of Nyssa into, into Ambrose. Could I also just ask a question of, of Morwenna, if I may? Twice in this conference, um, uh, a quotation has been made by one of the conveners of the famous text in Evagrius about the theologian is the one who rightly prays. And of course, this is not you know, many years different from the text you've been considering. Do you think Evagrius is kicking back against uh, what other people would have said a theologian is in saying that? Well, of course, Evagrius and Gregory would have agreed on the prayer. Mm, yeah. um, I suppose it's uh, how else Gregory of Nazianzus is framing it. Mm -hmm. And... Um, 
what's crucial for Gregory Nazianzus here is the textuality mm -hmm. of the communication, um, which I, I don't know enough about Vagrius's um, sense of himself as an author to know what, where the difference would lie, but it, it, it's a very literary presentation, um, and we might want to push back against that, but, but historically I think that is what he's saying. I, well, and therefore I would be rather inclined, it'd be interesting to know what Rowan thinks of this, to see Evagrius as in a contrapuntal, making a contrapuntal point here, given his great interest in pure prayer. Um, would you like a very last word on that, Rowan, because we need to oh, close. Just to say that I found that a very, very sympathetic observation. I suspect that the, the very fact of Agrius uses the word theologos in, there in that connection um, means he must have other uses in mind and wants to make it clear, is this not that? So it may be that he's pushing back against his patron, just a, a tad there. Yeah, and, and to focus on practice, yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mark, Moena, and Catherine, and let us express our appreciation. <laughs>
Can we please ask you to take your seats? Can we please ask everybody to sit down for the final part of the conference? Oh, this, yes. yes. Wonderful. So, Ron, you've been hearing us talking for two days. Now it's time for us to hear you speak. So the floor is yours, please. Conventionally, I begin with, where do I start? And, of course, part of the answer to where I start is this room. David Ferguson, in his introduction, remarked on what it meant to be in this particular place, what was lecture room for in the old days of the Divinity School. And John Milbank evoked very vividly for us the sensation of um, a monk after the dissolution of the monasteries haunting the ruins. Well, it's not exactly ruins around here, but it certainly has changed quite a bit. And I thought that I might start with three particular memories of, that I might start with three particular memories of Lecture Room 4, which might, um, in some ways, open out onto some reflection on what I think theologians might be doing, or at least what I thought I was doing as a theologian. The shade of Donald McKinnon has been invoked more than once, and of course, a good many of us will remember sitting in this hall listening to Donald lecturing on Kant, or on Plato's Republic, or on theology and logic, all of which mysteriously seemed to fold into much the same lecture course sooner or later, which was Donald thinking out loud and the rest of us desperately trying to keep up. But there's one particular memory of Donald in this room, which I think goes back to 1970, either 69 or 70, but it was at the time when um, the then government was trying to expel from the UK a radical German student named Rudi Duczka, who had taken refuge here after a very unhappy episode on the continent where he had been shot and his life was in danger. He spent some time over here and uh, the government of the day was determined to send him back to Germany. And there was a, a meeting here in the Divinity School to protest about that. And Donald was invited to say a few words. Now, those of you who remember Donald McKinnon will know that the phrase, Donald was invited to say a few words, <laughs> is one of those strictly non-predictive utterances. Um, what Donald did, in fact, was to speak at um, substantial length on the entire history of German radicalism and German Marxism, with several excursuses into talking about Rosa Luxemburg and um, Georg Lukács, and, and so on, and so on. And the assembly of well-meaning, radically-minded students gathered in lecture room four um, were clearly struggling more and more to keep up with this. But it remains, as you see, a vivid memory. A memory of Donald as a theologian trying as best he could to engage with an issue of some real and, you might say, non-academic interest to quite a lot of people, and certainly not at all a matter of academic interest to Rudi Duczka himself. Second is a memory from some years later on when I was back here teaching at Westcott House, and we were entertaining the then Patriarch of Alexandria, Shenouda III, the Coptic Patriarch. Some may remember that occasion also. And Patriarch Shenouda had been invited to give a lecture here in Lecture Room 4 once again. And the lecture was going to be introduced by someone whose name has already been mentioned, Christopher Steed. Um, that great and sometimes rather maddening patristic scholar whose work both inspired, frustrated, provoked many of us, to whom I had the pleasure of dedicating my book on Arius, which he disliked intensely. <laughs> Christopher decided that the best way to introduce the Patriarch of Alexandria was to begin with introducing the whole history of relations between Cambridge and the Alexandrian tradition. <laughs> this wasn't as long as Donald's excursus on Rosa Luxemburg and Georg Lukács, but it was fairly substantial. And 
The memory is after Christopher had finished of the patriarch standing up and saying, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. I am very happy to continue the lecture you have just heard. <laughs> <laughs> but apart from certain aspects of that exchange, which I'll come back to in a moment, of course, it's um, not just a random fact that we were able to listen to the successor of Athanasius in this room, and my subsequent theological writing has a little bit to do with, with that. It also has a little bit to do with um, that embarrassing fact, which our attention was drawn to yesterday in one of the questions, of the way in which um, Western theologians, like Westerners in general, tend to assume that they're, they're licensed by some divine authority to speak on behalf of anybody and everybody else who might be around. And a theology which never worries about its right to speak on other people's behalf is not, I think, a theology that is, that is doing its work terribly well. The third memory is much more recent, when Lecture Room 4 had definitively stopped being Lecture Room 4 and had attained its present um, transformed condition. And that was rather more than a year ago when I was in here rehearsing the St. John Passion with the choir of Magdalen College and an orchestra drawn from various musical groups around this, this city. And I'll say no more about that at the moment, except that rehearsing the St. John Passion in Lecture Room 4 <laughs> did bring to mind something of what Lecture Room 4 was actually ultimately about in the old days. Where do we start? Well, I've started with this place and with memories of this place. But you'll perhaps see the connections I want to make when I speak, I hope, very briefly about some of the dimensions of doing theology that those memories crystallize and hold for me across the years. One is something to do with that first one of Donald addressing the assembled and baffled would-be radical students. And that is that theology always returns to anthropological issues, that is, issues about what, what the human is. In the second century, Theophilus of Antioch famously said, show me your anthropos and I will show you my God. Now he probably didn't mean it exactly in the sense in which it's sometimes been taken in modern theology. But it has been interpreted, not entirely wrongheadedly, as saying, I'm only going to understand what you mean by God when you give me some indications of what you mean by humanity. And if you are acting, speaking in ways which are deeply problematic around what you mean by humanity, don't expect me to take what you say about God with any great enthusiasm or credulity. Show me your anthropos and I will show you my theos. To speak about God is always, certainly indirectly and in complex ways, to speak about the human. And to speak about the human in a way that is manifestly good news. Jesus of Nazareth doesn't speak very much about God in the sense of telling us anything about the nature of God as such. What Jesus of Nazareth does is to tell a great many stories which illustrate what kind of anthropos he has in mind. And out of that, all sorts of things emerge, including the Nicene Creed. And I think that many of the interests that have nourished and stimulated me and kept me working over the years, patristic theology, the problems of Christology, and what you might broadly call the cultural frontier of theology, all converge somewhere around this anthropos theos set of issues and the challenge of showing what I mean by God by talking about humanity. And of course the converse, which is well, understanding what humanity might mean by talking about God and that constant circling 
of theological discourse is, I suppose, part of what I've been trying to engage in over the decades. The second thing that comes to mind here really has to do with a phrase which Martin Laird in his paper, which sadly he wasn't able to give in person, quoted from the other course, which is about the need to keep the mind from fantasy. So I suppose that if there's a second area I'd want to talk about in terms of theology, it's the iconoclastic nature of theology. Theology, when it's doing its job, is a breaker of idols. Idols of God, idols of ourselves, of our culture, our race, our presuppositions, etc., etc. So that theology has in part the job of reminding us who the God is that we mustn't believe in, and indeed what the humanity is that we mustn't believe in. There was a fine book some years ago by the American theologian Charles Marsh on a grammar of unbelief, which set out a whole Christian dogmatics on the basis of what we absolutely mustn't say about God or Christ or humanity or the church or whatever, and I thought that was really rather a, a good way in, in some ways. I won't be the only person in this hall exercising a ministry in the church who is aware that part of the role of preaching in the church is likewise iconoclastic from time to time, and that sometimes the real missionary effort is not so much to persuade people to believe in God as to persuade them to stop believing the God they think believe, they believe in, because that God is killing them. And to try and push back against a God who kills you is maybe another of the tasks of theology and part of the properly emancipatory role of theology, which I don't want to be sentimental about, but it's emphatically there. Olivier Clément was mentioned earlier today, that great French-born Russian Orthodox disciple of Vladimir Lossky and others. And Clément wrote an article back in the, I think, the late 60s, under the title Purification by Atheism, which spoke about really, how to get away from gods who kill you. And speaking earlier with um, Carol about Simone Weil, we were uh, talking about a little piece I wrote on Simone Weil some years ago called The Necessary Non-Existence of God. Part of Simone Weil's concern is to find out who the god is you think you understand and grasp that that god is not there because the God you can successfully confect out of your own resources is just not going to be the God who will change you. And to keep in focus the anthropological issue, to keep in focus the iconoclastic role of theology, has something to do with um, a theme which has come back again and again in many of the presentations, which Lucy beautifully laid out for us this morning with the help of Hans Urs von Balthasar, and that is the place of theology in both looking to and looking in the figure of Jesus. And I'm talking here, of course, about the doing of Christian theology. And possibly one of the, the partners absent from the conversation in the last couple of days has been everything represented by the interfaith dialogue. And I don't make that as a point of criticism, I just note it as something which needs noting. Because the tension between this radically Christological or Christocentric focus, which I would emphatically adopt and which has been taken for granted, I think, in a lot of what we've exchanged, that obviously stands in a real and significant tension with some aspects of interfaith dialogue. And what I would want to say most about that on the basis of a certain amount of experience of interfaith dialogue is really don't panic. That to say this is how we have received the vision of reality, this is how that works as we think it through, is not to try and score a winning hand, a winning move in some game competing with other systems. It is to speak what we feel, not what we ought to say, perhaps to say something about where we stand.
because without standing somewhere, there is nothing to say. How we negotiate that in the complexity of interfaith dialogue is not an agonizing, knuckle-gnawing problem so much as, to use the word again, which I've used in response to some of the speakers, an invitation. An invitation which I have been very grateful and privileged to try to respond to from time to time over the decades. So, back to the St. John Passion. The text of Bach's St. John Passion is, I, I mean a musical as well as a, a verbal text, is a text which, like all musical scores, has to go on being re-performed. And again, remembering words I've heard in this hall and elsewhere, thinking back to the very precious memory of our dear friend Nicholas Lash, and also to friendship over many years with Francis Young, both of whom made performance a very significant element in their thinking about theology. I would say there has to be a very deep and significant sense in which the performance of the text of the passion is another way of saying what theology is. Performing the text of the passion is not reading an inheritance from the distant past, certainly not recreating something in a fictitious present. Thanks Isidoros for all the clarifications there. But it is to recognize that every performance of that text is one which is made possible by the performances that have gone before, that there are certain things which you perfectly, properly never do for the first time. And that's fine. And the performance is both, therefore, deeply traditioned, if I can coin that phrase, and always new, always fresh. And above all, a cooperative venture. Above all, a venture in which every voice has its own place and the respect for the diversity of voices and skills and all the rest of it is crucial. Standing next, as I did in this room, to uh, a slightly short-tempered cellist um, who is clearly finding some difficulty keeping up or with or adjusting to the uh, idiosyncrasies of both soloists and chorus in the John Passion I was aware that this was a cellist who simply wanted to be the best cellist he could be in the St. John Passion rather than a cello soloist. But to do that, we all needed, as soloists and chorus, to be listening to him as a cellist in a way which we weren't being very good at at the early stages of the rehearsal. Well, I won't labor the analogy, but that recreation of a text in cooperation, in patience, and indeed in penitence, because it also matters when somebody says to you in a musical performance, actually that's wrong. <laughs> not in the sense of that is a great individual stain on your character, but that is actually not going to be part of a performance of the St. John Passion. <laughs> that's also a theological task, I would say. And calling one another to account in that way for the sake, not of an identitarian separatism, but for the sake of a better and fuller realization of what, what we're doing. I think that's, that's why the, the image, the musical image is so powerful for me. And as many of you will know, I tend to reach for musical images when in trouble intellectually <laughs> talking about theology, and I don't really feel too sorry about that. So, those three pictures to start with, those dimensions arising from them of the anthropological question and all that converges upon it, the keeping the mind from fantasy and what that means, the constant recreation of a life-giving text in cooperation and not thinking of it simply as something that has to be presented as 
better than anything else, but just as the reality you are inhabiting. And who wants to have a theoretical argument about whether uh, the St. John Passion is better than the Missa Solemnis? But you know, you want, you want to know how to perform the John Passion. And certainly for some of us, performing the John Passion is an insight into what is not relative or transitory or accidental about being Christian and why it might be a, a way into reality. Well, you are fed up to the gills with words about all this and I confess that 48 hours of listening to words partly about oneself is a profoundly strange and disorienting experience. So the question I began with, where do I start, was not entirely a, a rhetorical move. I felt at times in the last couple of days very much at odds, very much at sea about who exactly I was and where I was and how I related to this um, curious character of Williams who kept on being cited, um, occasionally apparently saying things that I had completely forgotten saying, regretted saying, <laughs> had no idea what I meant by saying. <laughs> and I must pay tribute to the immense hermeneutic generosity of everyone who's spoken, who has addressed things that I've written in the charitable spirit of imagining that they might after all make sense in spite of appearances and have produced some extraordinary and wonderful gifts from that encounter. Catherine reminded us that she went off to be a Swansea Wittgensteinian for some years and she will remember our beloved late friend Dewey Phillips as the presiding genius of the philosophy department in Swansea. And that very simple, very obvious statement by Dewey, which I've quoted so often, um, when I say, I can't tell you how grateful I am, I'm telling you how grateful I am. <laughs> I turn to Dewey for help in framing exactly what I want to say at this point. Um, I can't tell you how grateful I am. <laughs> I can't tell you how grateful I am to Josh, Isidoros, and Puy, to the administrative staff who've supported them and made this possible in practical terms, to the college which has made this historic room available, to those who've given generous sponsorship to the event, and to all of you, dear friends, old and new, to revisit so many decades of love and friendship has been to me, and I think to Jane as well, a massive gift and a massive delight. I'm particularly pleased that those of you who were my research students over the years have reined in your edible impulses so very <laughs> impressively. <laughs> and I hope that the rich contributions we've had from these two days will in turn be fertile and creative in the theology of decades to come. And it would be quite nice to think that in another 20 or 30 years, for some people, the memory of these two days in what I still think of as lecture room four might feature in some future theological reflections as my memories feature in mine. Thank you, bless you. I mean, Rowan, what can I say, since you already gave the thanksgiving that I had planned to give? Um, so perhaps just let me very briefly name the people, you know, the institutions and the people who have made that actually happen, namely the Fellowship of St. Sergius and St. Albans, which generously opened up the way to all the funding that uh, uh, came and made this possible, especially 
the Faculty of Divinity of this university, which actually made the event financially possible, and particularly the Regius Professor David Ferguson for being our voice in the faculty committees. Some of the most prestigious Cambridge colleges, namely St. John's, Trinity, and Maudlin, for their incredible support in so many ways, including hosting us in this venerable Old Divinity School, and the Anglican and Easter Churches Association for gracefully filling in the final gaps. We also owe a heartfelt thanks to our conference assistants, Michael Allen, Pavlina Kasparova, Matt Collins, our audiovisual technician who has been running the live stream, last but not least, to everyone who has been involved in one or another way in various stages of this project over the years. Now, as a penultimate act of this conference, I want to announce that everyone is invited for a drink at the Maple. There is a, a tap behind the bar. And as our ultimate act of uh, this conference, an act of thanksgiving that we would like, I would like, we would like, the, the committee would like to invite you all to give um, an applause to the two people we are celebrating here today, namely Ron Williams for being the man we all love and admire, and to Jane Williams for being chiefly responsible that Rowan is the man that we all love and admire. <laughs> to Rowan and Jane. <laughs> 